Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Gell. I'm the president of the honour of being the president, I think the 74th president, Mike, of the Royal Society, something like that, of the Royal Society Victoria. Uh, and I do say I'm the first president of the Royal Society who's not a notable scientist, uh, but that doesn't matter. We need to do different things in uh, in the new millennium. Uh, and I think today is a good example of the things that I think that the Royal Society of Victoria uh, needs to do. If you've not been here before, please take some time during the day to have a look around. There's a rogues gallery in the downstairs corridor. Our first, pre well, the president of the Philosophical Society, a guy called Redmond Barry, the bloke who hung Ned Kelly. He was the first president of the Philosophical Society. The first president of the Society was uh, Baron Ferdinand von Mueller, uh, who gave us the RBG uh, and ultimately Wilson's Promontory and a number of things like that. So the, the Society has a... a a very, very interesting history. Uh, the Ellery Theatre, Robert Ellery, was uh, Victoria's astronomer. Uh, there, there's some very, really good science history. And we're about the promotion and advancement of science as a society, not an academy. Uh, so we talk about, you know, STEM for mums and dads and things like that. And it's a really important uh, place where we have the sort of conversations that we're having today. Uh, may I acknowledge that we're on Wurundjeri country, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the Woiwurrung language group, and we acknowledge that the land's never been ceded, uh, and we pay our respects to them, and we say sometimes uh, that those uh, this continent's first scientists, uh, we're hoping that Uncle Dave Wanden will be with us uh, later today or soon uh, to provide you with an official welcome to his country. Uh, but in the meantime, in the meantime, I want to introduce Ian Rutherford, uh, who's been a longtime colleague of mine, uh, another another geographer. Uh, and Ian uh, heads up the Alluvium Foundation, and it was the Alluvium Foundation's inspiration for today. So, Ian, say a few words. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, and welcome to the 150 or so people who are online at the moment as well. Uh, so, Go to the next slide. So on the 23rd of May uh, of this year, the, the then Premier of Victoria announced that native timber harvesting in Victoria State Forest would end on the 1st of January 2024. Now, this was a, fair to say a surprise to many. It was about six years ahead of schedule. This is the area of forest that we're talking about today. This is the, uh, uh, the, the area in black is the ash forest. This is the state forest, the mixed species, uh, 1.8 million hectares of forest, which is the subject of this symposium over the next day and a half. Next one. So the Premier's announcement focused on the future of the timber industry, if you read closely the uh, announcement. There was little mention of the future of the actual forest itself. And so the uh, many of us were discussing, well, what's going to happen with the forest? It seemed like an appropriate thing to discuss. And so we've, um, I'll introduce the Alluvium Foundation in a moment that had just begun. And this symposium will consider some of the challenges and opportunities for our forests. The first day is focused on the science in particular, the second day really on the values of these forests. The um, many people were uh, invited to this from policy, but the policy is still in, in flux, it's fair to say. And so there's some reluctance from ministers, from uh, from government agencies to be um, to be talking about that too much. But we've got a very good program for you. Next slide, please. Just to introduce the Alluvium Foundation, who is sponsoring the event over the, the two days. This is a, um, a new organisation. Next one. 
This is um, its intent is to advance international and national debate on complex issues that impact impact on our society and environment, and forest, the forest of Victoria is a good example of that, aren't they? And the next one, the final one, is a platform to bring together national and international leaders to discuss and debate key issues, influence policy planning and practice. And so, I'd just like to introduce the Alluvium Foundation to you, and uh, here's the, the the website if you'd know more information. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Sam. Just as by way of introduction to the discussion today, the, the topic of native forests, as Ian's introduced it, um, is beyond doubt uh, one of the most conflict-ridden uh, fields of science uh, and part of our socio-political discourse in Victoria, at least, and elsewhere in the country. Uh, and in bringing today's symposium together, we're very aware of that. Um, there are people in this room that I met in forest campaigns 40 years ago, uh, and many of those issues haven't been resolved. So we've actually, in the preparation for this, and I must acknowledge uh, Ian and our CEO, Royal Society, the guy there with the headphones, Mike Flatley, have been working incredibly hard uh, over the last uh, two months. And I think we've, um, well, uh, in, in, encountered the fact that there are people in this sort of space who can't even be in the same room as each other, let alone do what we're doing today. Uh, despite the fact of having never met, never physically met. So there are, there are tensions that go beyond uh, having had any discourse at all. It's a very emotional matter for many people. Uh, there are whole communities and industries affected by the changes that uh, Ian's introduced. Um, the conservation movement, uh, so the, the, the NGOs and others, have a quite different position uh, and, and different actions to what we're going to take on today. Scientists, and uh, as, as much as they wish to be, are not exempt from uh, those sort of distressing experiences and conflicts, nor are our first peoples. And we're trying to bring all of that together today. So it's not, and hasn't been for Mike and Ian, a very easy discussion to convene at all. Uh, so credit to them for bringing to, to, to what it is today. Uh, but it is important that we establish some basic ground rules for today um, so that we meet some of the objectives of yourselves and, of course, of the society. Uh, we must not diminish each other or abuse each other today. We're all here because we really care deeply about our forests and their future, uh, despite often having very different perspectives and, in all cases, gaps in our knowledge base. Even accomplished scholars can't know everything, but we can all commit to growing our collective knowledge uh, by listening respectfully to each other. So please listen actively. I will be. Respect others when they're talking and provide space for others to respond. Um, we do encourage our speakers and audience members to challenge one another, though, by asking curly questions. That's the real objective of today. But again, please refrain from personal attacks. Focus on the ideas, the methods, the conclusions and the science. Um, our objective here is not to necessarily find an agreement or to win an argument. This, we, we really want to have scholars presenting science for us to think about and un understand all of the issues going on around in this space. So have an open mind uh, and be courteous, I guess. So I'm certainly looking forward to an excellent journey. I know some of the speakers we have today. There's many that I don't know, but I'm, one, I'm really interested to see how they're all going to fit together. And I hope we have a wonderful symposium over today and tomorrow morning. Uh, in particular, I'm delighted that one of our Royal Society of Victoria trustees, Professor Tim Entwistle, has agreed to be our Master of Ceremonies for today. And it's great to see you, Tim, in semi-retirement. Uh, let me tell you a little about him. One of... One of uh, one of Victoria, if not Australia's best known botanist, un until recently the Director and Chief Executive of the Royal Botanic Gardens, uh, and before this the Director of Conservation, Living Collections and Estates for the Kew Gardens in London, and earlier still the Executive Director of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney. As a scientist, uh, Tim's research is chiefly concerned with the field of, of phycology, the study of algae, which are lots smaller than what we're talking about today, uh, generally. Uh, but he's received the, the signal of having the whole genus of algae named after him in Whistler. Is that correct? In, in Whistler? Please make Tim very welcome.
Thank you, Rob. I'm I'm sure they're going to be algae in these forests, so don't don't worry too much about that. In fact, I've spent a bit of time. In fact, most of my time in the forest has been in the creeks, looking for algae. Some beautiful uh, freshwater red algae. I'm not going to talk about those today, though. Today is about uh, very important issues. First of all, a, a big welcome and thank you for the invitation to be part of this. I've just returned from ten days in China, actually, where. And it's funny when you come back from a place like China too, you appreciate the the beauty and importance of our natural world here in Victoria and in Australia, uh, and also of good coffee in Melbourne <laughs> as well. But it it does, um, you know, I think this is a fantastic uh, idea and concept to have, and I really thank the Royal Society for their hosting of this here, plus the other other partners. Uh, and it is a chance, and Rob, I won't repeat everything you said, but a chance to talk and to listen with respect. And I think it's, it, it, I might talk about this at the end today when I'm summing up, but there's, we're kind of at a point where this is a really big, important thing that's happening in Victoria and we need to get it right. And actually it, it makes sense to spend some time thinking about it and not jumping into policy immediately. And I think that's important too, that there are opportunities for, us to better understand the situation, particularly those who are not working actively in the field and those of you or us who are making decisions or influencing decisions in this area. So these kind of sessions are really important and um, well done to everyone who's, who's organised this. Now, before we begin the formal presentations today, we've got a little treat for you. The um, Jury Jury Dancers, um, led by Mandy, who I last um, saw uh, oddly at the anesthetists conference where I was speaking and I can tell you later why I was speaking at anesthetists conference but anyway um, that was only a couple of weeks ago and I, it's always a delight to have Mandy and her group here uh, she will I'm sure introduce herself and a little bit about the dancers but um, just as a, a bit of background they they teach leadership and skills in song and dance and particularly for young dancers and singers in of the Wurundjeri and they're the only Wurundjeri women's dance group and the only female group who sing in the Wurundjeri language so I'd like to make them welcome with a little knock on the door we expect them to emerge thank you Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for putting on a wonderful sunny day for us today. <laughs> um, I hope you all got here safely because it was a little bit of a hassle for us to get um, up the dreaded Monash this morning. But I just wanted to firstly say thank you for you guys for being here for such an important cause because, as you know, First Nations people have fought forever to stop logging and especially of the old growth forest. And uh, we've been up, I know there's familiar faces here that have taken us up to the bush and to the coops and we've seen the destruction with our own eyes and we've felt that heaviness and silence. There's no animal noises, nothing. And it really takes a hold of you when you actually visit a coop after they, they bomb it with their fire as well because it takes it away so much from the cultural practices of taking care of country, like the cool burning, the cultural burning and things like that, and manicuring the environment. And it hasn't happened for so long. We still do it. We still do the cultural burnings here and there, but not on the scale that they used to be. But the little patches of land, the little patches of native grass that we still have preserved are still maintained by the traditional custodians of, of that area. And it's something that really, um, just hang on one sec. Uh, yeah, it was always about uh, connecting to country and being on country, listening to country, feeling country. And one day we had a project that was all about, it actually was a project that someone approached me about, about me. I'm like, hey, I don't do things about me. I'm always kind of in the background. I don't like the spotlight, things like that. And they did this little film and there was no sound, no voice, no speaking in it. I went for about five minutes or so. And we went up to Talangi and it was a day similar to today, but they wanted to film before the sun came up. 
And I thought, oh, cool, I'll get up and um, don't really get up that early, but I'll do it. And I got up there and it was the most beautiful, intriguing, interesting, stunning morning that I've ever experienced in my life because when we went up, it was just me in the morning and then the rest came and the trees were dripping. It wasn't raining. It was, it was just dripping from the trees, the big mountain ash, and I could hear all these birds singing. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. I'm here by myself and usually see these wonderful things happen when you're by yourself and it's meant to be uh, for you in that moment. And I, I was feeling really good. And then I could hear the dun-dun, the parrot. I could hear the young guy, the black cockies. I could hear the, um, oh, what else could I hear? The gamayil, the corella. I could hear all these beautiful birds singing. And then I clicked. The sound wasn't coming from the trees. It was coming from the ground. So it was the lie birds. The lie birds were singing to each other. And it was just one of those pivotal points in my life that I will always remember because where I was was under the Babandarang, the mother trees. So as we know, you, you guys are all got your head around, you know, people coming into the mountains and chopping these beautiful straight trees down. Luckily that these bunch of trees had a little, a few defaults on them and maybe some lumps and bumps or maybe a bit hollow that they were left. And it's really only just that pocket that's easily accessible that we can get to. And I was there. I was under those trees when I could hear those bulumbul and singing. And it really takes you to another realm when you're around those trees. They have this spirit within them that, if you've got any worries that day or going on in your life, you just forget them. And what that did for me that day was inspired me to write a song that will do um, when I finish speaking. And it's all about the Babandarang. And it's about this big old bia, like a red gum tree that has grown for hundreds of years. And it's seen people living in harmony with the environment, the environment working in harmony with itself and with people, everything working really well. Water was clear, the animals were healthy, there was an abundance of everything. And another part of the reason I wrote this song as well is that there's a the big church down near Flinders Street the, with the big spire. Next to it's like a little car park area. And in the, I won't say old records of Melbourne, the black and white drawings of Melbourne, and when you compare time, it's just a, a drop in the ocean there was a sketch or some writings about this bial, this red gum tree, and they noted it down as a prayer tree. I was like, right, I'm going to reclaim that tree. And I put all my thoughts together about this tree and I thought of, thought of it in a physical way, a spiritual way, and in a time way. So cylindrical time, no beginning, no end, and the knowledge that this mother tree holds. And the song is all about growing strong into this mother tree, seeing all this stuff happen, Inv invasion happened and she was cut down. So what was left was the trunk. But lucky over those years of growing and learning and knowing that her roots had grown so deep that it kept that trunk alive and that those roots are language. The trunk is the elders and the shoots coming out of the, the leaders that are around now, the not quite elders. And then the time that she lived, she left, uh, she had enough time to drop hundreds, even thousands of seeds. And some of those came up, were guided and embraced by the mother tree. And then they eventually became the mother tree. So it's kind of like comparing it to our culture as well and the waterways and the forests and all of that stuff being so beautiful, and pristine, and then it was chopped off. And we've had to do that with our culture. We've had to bring language culture generally, uh, ceremony, especially women's ceremony, back from the brink. One way that we do that is through dance and song. So I'm very lucky to be able to say that I had opportunities to learn how to grab a hold of my language and how to pronounce the words, put the words together in grammar and be able to share it with my community. And we love to share it with the wider community as well and with people such as yourselves. Um, and also we we never really take this off, the little lead beater's possum, because where the mother trees are is where this little fella lives and there's not many places that he can live in safety, especially worrying about which tree's going to go next. 
So I can't believe that the government and powers that be, because it's all about voices speaking and pushing to stop logging from happening. Is it six years um, early? That's ama- Do you ever hear of that? I don't think for the positive for the environment, I never hear things like that. So it's a very exciting time. And when that announcement was made um, a couple of years ago, whenever it was, um, I thought, no, this is going to fall through. I didn't have hope. So you guys are gathered here today to focus on what now, after the logging stops, what now? How can we work together? How can we put First Nation perspectives within all this planning of how to revitalise the environment and uh, really almost go back to before that tree was chopped down? So I have uh, beautiful memories and connections of going out on country and with you two fellas in the front as well and really just being able to have a space for our young ones to go and still have those big trees. I was worried that that wasn't going to be around anymore for the next generations coming up, but happily now it will take a long time for those trees to get that big again, but they will, and, and that's hope because hope was almost gone. Uh, but I just wanted to say um, that when we do a women's ceremony called Murum Turukruk, coming of age ceremony, uh, one of the senior elders gifted me the honour to do welcomes. And what I like to do is not just this is our boundaries here and there and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. If you do that yourselves, change it up, make it unique to yourself. Say maybe that you work on Wadanjeri country or you live on Bunwuran country, things like that. Make it your own. And what I like to do is talk a little bit about different layers of country. So there's six layers. So Bikult is the below country where we get the ochre from, but also when you think deeper about the roots of the plants and all the animals and everything working in unison to help each other, uh, that's a whole other discussion, which you probably will talk about today. And then we've got Bikdui, which is on country. So on country is where we all are right now, but we balance our spiritual lives, our cultural lives over here and our everyday lives here and making sure that they do remain in balance and healthy. Then we've got Banyabik, which is water country. So water is part of everything that's living, as we know. Uh, and we also used to gift water when we'd welcome people, but we can't do that anymore. It's not the waterways aren't healthy. Then we've got Murunwutbik, which is uh, wind country. So wind blows the smoke from our welcoming fires, but also carries our ngulu, our voice, up to Banjul and absorbs into everything around as well, like the smoke does. Then we have Wudu Wudu Bik, which is sky country. So sky country is where we see Bundral in his physical form, uh, watching and guiding us. And then the final one is Darangolk Bik, or star country. So our word for tree is Darang. Our word for stick is Golk, and Bik is country. So that's our story written in the stars. And everyone has a different story connected to even the similar stars. They may have a different connection to it. But there's a star called Altair, part of the Aquila constellation, is which means eagle, in the northern Milky Way. And for the life of me, I could never find that star. I looked and looked, but it's hard to find when you're flooded with artificial lights. And I finally found him. I tell, I took a photo of the Milky Way. I was camping, took a photo. Didn't realise when I got home that I actually took a photo of Bundral. So present at the time, I'm like, oh, where is it? Where is it? Couldn't find it, but it's in my photo. So I know I know where to look now. And it was when I was camping in the desert. So uh, I just wanted to touch on all of those different things because I like to tell everybody who I am, where I'm at, how culture's remaining strong, even though it was hindered for a long time and how we do that through our women's uh, cer- ceremony and dance. We've actually got a ceremony coming up on the Melbourne Cup weekend. And um, we've had about 60 girls go through that ceremony since 2015 and 2015 was the year that it happened for the first time after 185 years. Again, it relates back to that Babandarang, that mother tree. So Biladu Nyan Wangat Nadanik Mandi, Wadanjeri Wilamik, Wadanjeri Balakut, Mundanai Murup Galada Birang, Mundanai Kirapik, Mundanai Bupup Nakwarenik, Balalal Bagugung Nugulik, Babikut, Big Dui, Banyi Bik, Murunmut Bik, Wuruwuru Bik, Badarangok Bik, Babundalal, Willamu. And doesn't it feel great to have language in such a colonial building? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
So we're going to do our Womanji Kenyarika now, a welcome dance, and it's all about being loud and proud of who we are and our identity because it was suppressed for so long. And you'll hear Ngagaji, um, which means hear us. Wuranjere! 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 Warranted <laughs> Nagaja, <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to have a quick sip of water. So now we're going to do um, our Bikinyarika, our country dance that I've already explained. So some of the moves uh, represent giving our murup, our spirit, back to Mother Earth. Another one is we're thanking Bunjil for our culture. Um, we're tying our dance belts and we're focusing on the hips because it's a women's dance. We we all often talk about leaving a path with our feet, walking with our feet, but the driver is our hips and we hold our babies. We do all of that kind of thing. So that's the action that represents tying up our dance belts. Another one is we're putting ochre on. Another one is we're collecting water for the family. So it's all about... Um, making sure that we can share the knowledge of country with people like yourselves because we don't ever want it to fall asleep again. Uh, yes. So this is our big nyarka, our country dance. Waranjere, waranjere, al narapo, 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 waranjere, waranjere, al narapo, 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 narapo. Paranga, paranga, pek, kunjalal, kunjalal, velamo, velamo. Velamo, velamo, taranga, taranga, pek, kunjala, kunjala, velamo, 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 velamo. Woro, 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 pek, kunjua, kunjua, anga, 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 anga. Woro, 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 pek, kunjua, kunjua, anga, 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 anga. Mot <laughs> Banya <laughs> Big <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it is all about the Babandarang, the mother tree. 
And it's also about the vibrations of voice and how the vibrations of country, voice, self, uh, your bloodstream, how you can hear your blood in your body, all those vibrations have healing properties. Um, if you've ever had um, like a yidiki, uh, you've heard a yidiki being played, when babies are in the tummy of their mums, the dads play the yidiki into the belly and the baby instantly calms down. I, I had that when I was pregnant with my daughter. It was such a beautiful thing knowing that we already knew that vibrations are healing. And uh, it's, yeah, always something that I try to talk about as well because we get stuck in this crazy world, but we need to shut out all that crazy day-to-day -day sound of the city and life and focus and tune into the quiet things, the things like the birds chirping, uh, like things that can be moving 100 miles an hour, but I can always hear that little bird in the far distance. So we've just got to tune out of all of that stuff. So this one has like a little bit of a chant at the start and at the end with those vibrations, so absorb that. Baba! Baba. Baba. Mulago Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, uh, Jury Jury Dancers and, and Mandy for um, sharing wisdom, words and language with us today. Just a fantastic way to start off and let's uh, thank them all once again. Thank you. I don't think we have Uncle David with us yet. We'll we'll continue on. We I just want to make a, a general comment too at the start too. We've got other wonderful First Nations um, performers and speakers who will be participating in the symposium over the next couple of days, and we're very grateful for their contributions throughout. And we encourage everyone participating to reflect on and to acknowledge the need for First Nations leadership in this conversation we're having, uh, and also the importance of self-determination as well. Our conveners want to acknowledge that we don't have a full representation of all the traditional owners from across the 1.8 million hectares of forests. Um, some people weren't able to come, unfortunately, and participate in the event. But we do want to highlight some of the uh, existing work that's out there as well. And I think, Mike, we're going to show a, a couple of slides for you to follow up if you uh, would like to afterwards, uh, after the event, some information that's publicly online, and we encourage you to review these resources uh, in considering plans for the future of our forest. So we'll, if you want more information about this, please um, check with Mike later if you haven't got time to jot, jot down those 
websites, which are rather lengthy there, Mike, but that's <laughs> um, certainly you, you can see the um, the various groups involved here and so just just some examples of uh, traditional owner groups involved across the uh, that huge area we're talking about. So it is a, a very diverse uh, and rich culture, of course, across that area. And the four convening organisations would like to formally note their respect for the existing work and to emphasise the shared commitment for the future stewardship of forests across Australia led by traditional custodians through established and evolving cultural practices. Thanks, Mike. Right, um, now it's time to get down to the presentations uh, with our first session, past, present and future. And we're going to hear from uh, three wonderful speakers in this session. And after they've spoken, we'll have a panel session and you'll have an opportunity both online and those in the room to ask questions and have a discussion about some of the issues raised here today. Now, just a technical aspect, we are on a fairly tight schedule today to get through the presentations and our speakers have been asked to keep to time as you always are, but I know you'll be very good and do that. But just in case, we have uh, a timekeeper with us today. So Alana Mountain from the Victorian Forest Alliance is here with a bell. Sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, and you have a, a little bell, which will sound like, just, just ring that once again. Now that's going to ring five minutes before the end of your talk. So don't panic a lot, panic a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and you'll then get a second bell, which means you, it's time for you to, to finish. So this is to help you. And thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, again, I just reiterate, uh, listen, uh, think about what's being discuss today and provide provocative and questions with uh, with a great deal of respect as well. Now, our first speaking of provocative, our first speaker today uh, is going to provide the, the morning's keynote, the inimitable Professor David Lindemar, a uh, distinguished scholar in forest ecology and resource management, conservation science and biodiversity conservation, based at the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University. He currently runs five large-scale long-term research programs in southeastern Australia, primarily, primarily associated with developing ways to conserve biodiversity on farmland, wood production forests, plantations and reserves. He's maintained some of the largest long-term research programs in Australia, and don't we need more of those, with some, exce some exceeding 39 years in duration. Today, Dave is going to talk about the future of Victorian native forests, a major restoration challenge and opportunity, uh, and we're delighted to have you with us here today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I've spent much of my career on Tanarong, Gunakurnai and Wurundjeri country, and towards the end of the talk, we'll be uh, focusing a little bit on Onawal and Wiradjuri country. Um, so really, this is about thinking about the state of the forest and the recovery challenge. And really, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that this was a very brave decision. As Sir Humphrey might have said, uh, yeah. yes, Prime Minister, it was a, a very courageous decision. But I think it also at the, t the same time creates huge opportunities economically and environmentally in this space and it's an opportunity to shift our forest to a better place and think about what protection entails and I think it's really important in this space that decision makers are well informed so part of this talk is a little bit provocative because it's about some myth busting and there's certainly been a lot of myths that's gone on in the forest space for the last four decades so the state of the forest, then the restoration challenge and some of the opportunities that are associated with that. So my own background goes back to July 1983 and we've had a, uh, nearly four decades of intensive research in that space with a lot of peer-reviewed papers, a lot of scientific measurements that are still going literally to this day. And what we see from that is that 
the wood production forests are in a pretty rough state. They are heavily overcut. We've actually looked through environmental and uh, economic accounting at the state of the forest in terms of what's there. And there is evidence of significant overcutting that actually goes back a long way, back to the 1930s. You can see it in historical documents. The forest is extensively fragmented. Some work that was led by Chris Taylor essentially, essentially shows that. Um, we see that there's very substantial declines in very large trees, something that I know is, is very difficult for people like Mandy and, and Wurundjeri people to deal with. There's been strong associated losses of biodiversity linked with that. There's actually a process and a pattern. And we also see that forests are very flammable. And we're gonna come back to that in a moment. The evidence is overwhelming now in that space. And there's no doubt from an economic perspective that the native forest logging industry was a major loss maker for the state. So let's let's dig into this a little bit more. This is not an unusual scene from uh, particular vantage points across many parts of the Central Highlands area where much of the logging was focused, particularly in the last 10 to 20 years, about 70% of logging operations in this area. And you can see where the, the boundaries of the logging coops are relative to uh, the ages that they were cut. And here's an ANU long-term site here. And the landscape's changed repeatedly over time. It's called a time-varying covariate in these environments. And here's another image of another landscape in the background. And Chris's work on the extent of fragmentation indicates that in the wood production forest, you only had to walk 71 metres from a randomly selected point to a disturbance boundary, which is a logging coop or a, a logging road. So on top of that, when we look at statewide, what's happened, we've seen a nearly 80% decline in old growth forests since 1995. And in part, that was actually associated previous to that with deliberate policies, state government policies to liquidate old growth forests. The word liquidate was actually used in historical documents. And we've seen widespread regeneration failure. And this is something that we're working on at the moment uh, with satellite data and with drone technology. But regeneration failure is very widespread, not only due to recurrent fire, but also post-logging, as, as we can see in these kinds of places. So you can see some of the places where there are trees and large areas where there are not trees. What we also see is that one of the most iconic parts of our forest these very large old trees. And this one is a Firmiston tree, and you can see the entire village of Fernshaw around uh, that individual tree. Large trees don't move very much, and you can mark them. And this is the, the late Dave Blair measuring some of these trees. And this is our longest running project, dating right back to July 1983. And we can document how quickly they're falling over and how quickly they're being recruited. And what we see is this. This is the precipitous decline of large old trees as a keystone component of these forests. What we also see is that in these kinds of forests that are very species rich, some species are declining very quickly, like the greater glider. And our latest work is actually through structured, structured equation modeling, being able to show that there's a strong link between declines of species and declines in the structure of the forest, particularly these large old trees. So there's a clear pattern and a process that underlines the pattern based on last four decades of work. What we also see is that the forest really is a lot more flammable. Now, there's no doubt that this is strongly associated with changes in climate. For example, since I've been on the planet, just a bit over 60 years, the number of high forest fire danger index days is 10 times what it was in 1960. But logging is also making these forests more flammable. And as Phil Zilstra may or may not talk about, but he's done some fantastic work in this space, there is also uh, a risk of increased flammability due to hazard reduction burning. And it's based on an understanding of how forests work. So what we know is that the size and prevalence of fire is increasing and the uniformity of fire is also changing. So we're seeing much larger fires over 
much larger areas more frequently and they're much more uniform. And this is some work that we published earlier this year, looking at the frequency of fire and uh, the extent of fire across across uh, northeastern Victoria and through to central Victoria. So some other work is indicating that some places that should burn only once every 75 to 150 years are now burning three or four times in the last 25. And if we look at it globally, and this is some work that will be published in the next few weeks, Australia is actually doing very, very badly in this space. So we've analysed uh, the frequency of high severity fire in the last two decades, and we can see, for example, the burn trend is Australia in bright red and other places uh, likewise. What we see is that the area of forest, particularly wood production forest that's being lost to fire is increasing quite dramatically. In fact, Australia does worse than anywhere else in the world bar one, and that's Portugal. So this is really important because it means that the extent of very high severity fire means that it's almost impossible to maintain an industry based on saw logs with that frequency of fire. We also see when we look at the footprint of the black summer fires, two key things. So um, the summary of that reanalysis of those data indicates that log forests nearly always burn at higher severity and log forests burning under moderate fire conditions still burn more severely than intact forests burning under extreme conditions. So just have a think about what, what's happening there in terms of the elevated fire severity risk. And some other work led by Jeff Carey, um, a modeler at the ANU, indicates that there's a less than 20% chance that trees growing will grow through to an 80 year period to be of saw log age in these systems. So that's the fire side of things. The economic side is pretty grim. So if you look at, for example, Vic Forest's own corporate and business plans, they've known for a long time that logging operations are actually not commercial in significant parts of their estate. So this is for East Gippsland, timber harvesting in its current form in East Gippsland, that's the largest forest management area in Victoria, is not commercial. So this was not just recently, This is 2014, 2013, so this is a decade old. Okay, so that's the basis for what's going, going on. If you look in detail, as we've had a forensic accountant do, Vic Forest is actually insolvent. This is not a commercial enterprise to be able to do native forest logging in this state. And I would suggest that probably the science had very little to do with the government's decision. It was more that uh, it was uneconomic. The state was hemorrhaging large amounts of money in this space. And when you do economic and environmental accounting, as Heather Keith had done in 19, uh, sorry, in 2017 and published the work in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, you can see that the scale of the native forest logging industry is actually very small relative to some of the other values of the forest. Okay, so in essence, what's really happening here is that native forest logging was value subtracting from the, the natural values of the system rather than adding. So it wasn't a value added proposition. So now we have a restoration challenge. We have to try to significantly regrow the old growth estate. We're gonna to have to put forest back where it should be, but re restoration uh, is gonna be needed because regeneration has failed. We're gonna to have, to re to have to restore the natural fire regime, which means largely an absence of fire from tall wet forests. And Chris Taylor is gonna talk more about that later. And we've got to think about hazard reduction burning. I need to probably reshape that given what Phil Zilstra has just been finding. And we're going to have to recover iconic species. So there's been a lot of discussion about the nature repair market in this space and bringing extra finance in to help us with these restoration challenges. When you look at what actually is happening in the private sector, this is a paper published just a couple of weeks ago, what is happening is that most of the restoration programs supported through uh, finance in the private sector are actually greenwashed. There is actually no credible monitoring to tell you how you're performing in that space. That's a very important paper to think about in this context. And I think so what that tells us is that our restoration programs are going to need to be very carefully monitored 
and are going to have to have very important guardrails around them so that we can actually monitor the restoration invention interventions. We're going to have to collect data properly to be able to understand whether or not restoration is really working. And we're going to have to, to look for the biodiversity dividend associated with that intervention. And for example, compare it against the baseline, for, uh, for instance, over the last 40 years of key data in this space. And those data are going to need to be transparent to all the stakeholders. And the monitoring itself will have to be independent from who's benefiting in a nature repair market. Otherwise, it'll be gained as it has been for the last 20 years, according to that paper by Lamont. And if we're going to, to think about this, the reality is that biodiversity is an important cost in this space. And it's about monitoring is about 10% of your program cost. And if we're going to have investors involved, then we have to create metrics to show real progress in this space. So in the restoration challenge, we're going to have to we're going to have to reverse that 100-year impact of liquidating old-growth forests. You can go back to the historical do documents. Chris Taylor's dug them out, Forest Commission of Victoria 1928, get rid of old-growth forest. Go right through to the Ferguson Inquiry in 1985, get rid of old-growth forest. It's, it's there. So we really do have to stop logging. And we have to do that to stem the financial losses that goes with logging. It's a non-commercial enterprise it loses a lot of money we've got to move away from salvage logging because it's the most damaging form of logging of all uh, and that includes after wind throw it's still very damaging we have to move away from commercial thinning because a it doesn't make any money and as we'll see later it actually has other problems and we've got to be very smart about our fire management and think deeply about the alternative employment opportunities so we know that Nearly 40% of wood production landscapes have failed regeneration. The log landings, the sneak tracks, and, and areas such as in the background here that simply haven't regenerated at all. So that's a big issue to get trees back in the landscape. And it's going to be an intensive exercise to put those trees back. We also know that we have a lot of these things. Uh, I saw one yesterday in the temperate woodlands of, of uh, Western New South Wales on farms. There are millions of samba deer, red deer, rooster deer and others. And what we see is that often their impacts are concentrated where there's been logging in the past or recent fire. That's where the tastiest plants are. So it's really important to think about when we're doing natural regeneration to tackle some of the other drivers of the problem, which include these feral herbivores. But there's an opportunity for an industry there with uh, wild caught venison. And then we've got some iconic species that are really in a lot of trouble. And so we've thought deeply about how we can bring this iconic animal back because it's declining in many parts of its distribution, including in, in some of these forests, and thinking deeply about the kinds of nest boxes that, and artificial hollows that you would need to put back in the system for animals like this that are actually very heat sensitive. These animals don't deal with high overnight temperatures, but they're very important sentinel animals. They don't respond well to logging or fire or land clearing or climate change and combinations of all of those. So we've had nest boxes in our temperature control rooms at ANU, looking at what kinds of paints we can use, looking at what kinds of paints we use to also make these nest boxes more um, resistant to, to fire. And we need to think about where these animals used to occur in the landscape with these long-term data sets, where the landscape is coolest given its heat sensitivity and where we would start to focus uh, these kinds of recovery programs using the best available science to take us to a better place. And we know that prescribed burns can have significant effects on wildlife. Phil Zilstra has done some really elegant work on the related Western ringtail possum in this space. So we still have this challenge about what are we going to do with these highly flammable forests that we've created from the last 100 years uh, in, this, in this space. So one of the questions that we've often been, been asked is, will thinning help us solve this problem? So our response to that is to look at the data. What does the science show? And so we've looked at this after two fires, 2009 and the Black Summer fires, and the answer is generally thinning doesn't help. And in some cases, it actually has a perverse outcome. 
So this is really important to, to engage with this kind of stuff and look at it. And this is not a small study. I've heard people say this is a small study. The, there are many, many hundreds of sites in this with um, some of the, the most robust statistical analysis that you can apply in this space to look at this issue. I think it's really important to dispel some myths around thinning. You know, I've had an, an hour long discussion on a telephone with someone telling me that some of these forests don't self thin. That's called Brandolini's law or the bullshit asymmetry principle. The fact is that Mark Westerby's work shows that these forests do thin and there are power laws that, dis that indicate what the number of stems should be over time. There are some kinds of, of forests that don't thin naturally, like colitis, but even here over prolonged periods of time they do. And that's work by Ian Lunt and others. But also remember that the understory of forests is a critical part of how forests function. It fixes nitrogen for some of the, the overstory trees, it's habitat for many species, and it has a whole series of other roles that are critical parts of how forests function. And then we've got to think about this, this thorny issue of hazard reduction burning. You know, there are a lot of places that have got targets for hazard reduction burning, and that leads to what's called Goodhart's Law, where you actually do the burning in places where it might matter the least, and you might create other problems, which Phil just has looked at. And sometimes it doesn't work. You know, the, the problem in Marysville, a place that I'd lived in in the past and had friends that died in 2009, Marysville, you couldn't see in front of your face a couple of months before it burnt down because of the, the smoke created by hazard reduction burning. So when people say, if only we'd done more hazard reduction burning, we wouldn't have had these problems, you need to engage with what the science is actually saying in this space. And we get these kinds of, of very sad kinds of situations. This is Marysville uh, that we all know took the brunt of the Black Summer fires in 2000 and uh, the Black Saturday fires in 2009. There is a role for cultural burning. This is on, on a wall country um, outside of Canberra, not Ngunnawal, but on a wall country. And this is First Nations led work applying First Nations cultural burning to temperate woodland environments and native grasslands. And the, the, the general psyche here is the right fire for the right country. And I would argue that tall, wet forests is not the right country for this kind of fire. And most of the First Nations elders that we've talked to have, have discussed that. There are others much more qualified to speak about that than I am. I think we're going to need to think about new technologies, given the, the extent of flammability in some of these environments. And we've thought a lot about this at ANU, working across a whole series of disciplines, be it law, be it uh, mathematical modelling around lightning strikes, be it engineers, thinking about what sorts of technologies can be applied in this space, thinking about um, risk reduction, thinking about lightning strikes, where are they most likely to occur? Where are those strikes most likely to, to lead to ignitions? How can we detect those ignitions quickly? And how can we suppress those ignitions very quickly as well with new technologies and, and new thinking? We are in a new space where we have so many more uh, high risk days uh, with temperatures so much higher than we've seen previously. You know, the world at the moment is tracking at 1.2 degrees higher relative to, to our target at 1.5. Australia is 1.47. So we're actually leading the world in terms of uh, getting fastest to the 1.5 level. Just have a think about what that means. So I also think that in recasting a new vision for our forests, we need to think about some of the things that work. So one of the most uh, economically lucrative parts of operations for Sustainable Timbers Tasmania is actually this. It's the Tarhoon Walkway. You, you have to do a lot of work to get there. You have, to, you have to go to Hobart and then you have to hire a car and then you have to drive a fair way. But that has rejuvenated uh, many local areas, including places like Jeeveston. And we see the same in Western Australia, in the Valley of the Giants near Walpole. I know both places, Jeeveston and Walpole. Uh, in a previous life, I cycled around both areas, Southwest WA and, uh, and Tasmania. And this kind of infrastructure revolutionises rejuvenates the economies of some of these areas 
and really does make a difference uh, to to uh, to local communities. And so we've been thinking a lot about this in the context of the Great Forest, which is the Central Highlands wet forests, and what that might entail. And I think there needs to be new models around how we manage those areas that involves co-management. And this is not Victoria, it's not New South Wales, it's Jarvis Bay Territory, and this is Buttery National Park. And it has a very strong co-management approach with um, the Rec Bay community. And on the other side of the bay are the, the Geringer people and their co-management with the Beekwoft weapon, Weapons Range. So there are good models for co-management. Will Peter Pound is another one. I'm sorry, but I can't pronounce the name of, of, of that in First Nations language. I apologize for that. I'm not going to butcher it, so I'm not going to, to enter into that space. But they're successful co-management models that have good economic outcomes. They have good employment outcomes for some of the most disadvantaged people to be able to work on country doing things and meaningful work in that space. So a map that was created for the Central Highlands area in consultation with First Nations people, I think is really important to, to then think about the kinds of activities that are going to be relevant to, to managing these areas. And that connection with First Nations people we've already seen this morning in, in a very important spiritual context, but also a true connection to country in, in, this, in these areas. You can see Mandy there and the jury jury is doing a sorry dance on log country in Tulangi. So just uh, coming to the last slide, last second last slide is that I think there are very important and exciting opportunities in this space including for regional and for First Nations people's employment, for meaningful work on country, particularly in the first instance in revegetation programs. There are huge areas of forest that don't grow at the moment where they should be. So there's, a, there's an important space in there. Carbon storage values potentially could be very important, particularly also if there is a value on carbon, there's gonna to need to be regular carbon assessment and measurement and remeasurement. One of the myths is that if it burns, we lose all the carbon. We measured it before and after fire. Most of the carbon is still in the landscape, particularly when you've got older forests. There's, I think, a huge opportunity in, in feral animal control. We actually really do have to do something in that space. The impacts of, of feral animals like deer are enormous. We've seen it, we've measured it. Other people have done some fantastic work in that space. It's a serious problem that affects uh, natural regeneration and it will affect revegetation efforts if we don't deal with that. And I think that offers opportunities again for things like wild caught venison. I was talking to a landowner yesterday who's got a problem with samba deer on his place, close to, to Wagga. A adult samba deer shot in the right place will fetch $1,000 as a dressed carcass. That's not my price. That's his for what he sale, sends it um, for. He thinks that he can shoot about 30 animals every every uh, every uh, couple of nights. I think there's opportunities in the cultural burning space, but also the elite firefighting space. So we know from talking to volunteers that that it is impossible with lengthening fire seasons to maintain a huge volunteer force given the demands on employers, given the demands on their time, the impacts on their, their mental health and others. And so we do have to have professional firefighting services. You know, our fire seasons are now August until April and other countries have, uh, are looking to us to help them as well. So I think there's big opportunities also around the, the fire detection and suppression technologies all over the world. This is a problem, not just in Australia, as we've seen with the global analysis, there are big opportunities in recovering iconic species like the greater glider that we talked about, but there are many others that are dealing with the same kinds of issues. And I think there's a big opportunity in the infrastructure and tourism and ecotourism space. And these are not pie in the sky things. There are people that actually write books on this stuff. And this is an example of one. I have a copy of this that's marked up and I have many, many others on my bookshelf that are literally a metre from where I sit in the mornings most days. There are opportunities to make these transitions. They have worked in many cases. 
We need to look at the models of what's worked where and why and take the best bits of those and help Victoria to, to take a, a different trajectory than the one that we've had for the last 70 to 80 years. Thanks very much. Perfect, thank you. Um, great, great timekeeping and um, both the positives and the uh, and the concerns. So really covered covered everything. Thanks, David. Uh, our next speaker this morning is Uncle Larry Walsh, and uh, who's a, the inaugural elder in residence at Museums Victoria. We haven't met. I'm sorry. So we've just we'll meet, we're meeting now. That's exactly right. So um, he's inspired by his local Aboriginal community, plus his own Kulin ancestral blood connections to country. Uh, Larry is one of the only senior elders in Melbourne who focuses specifically on storytelling to keep cultural continuity of his people's ancient oral traditions. He sees the story as an important expression and element of Aboriginal culture and wants to display that Aboriginal people engage in the culture of the modern world as intimately as they are connected to their past. And today he's going to give us his perspective um, as a compelling story, I'm, I'm sure, as an elder of the Tomarung people. Uh, please make him very welcome. Thank you. I, sh I should I should warn you too, there's a little bell that goes off five minutes ah. before the end. Don't panic. No worries. <laughs> um, wah, wah. See, most people, they use woman Juka, but woman Juka has two meanings. One that's come, learn our country. You are welcome to share with things as long as you learn our country. So it's, wah-wah just means hello. And I'm not going to go into all the formal. See, I'm a pretty informal fellow. Um, I'm a layman. I got through second form and then left school. School didn't like me. I didn't like it. Um, my journey started as a fruit and veggie picker where I worked with other Aboriginal people who were itinerant workers. So I started learning uh, slowly because I started off in the uh, orphanage foster home system. So I have been Aboriginal all my life, but everyone tried to keep telling me I wasn't while I was getting into fight for being Aboriginal. And um, I was also sick and tired of being labelled a good fighter and a good sports person because I had a brain and I wasn't being recognised in the 50s and 60s. I get A's in some subjects. It's funny, though. It was always geology, history. Um, oh, I didn't do too bad at sports. Um, I'd always pass my exams despite never doing an assignment, despite never doing homework. It says I had a brain, but they were boring me at school by asking me to go back 10 lessons ago that I'd already gone through. So the rest of the class, I'd be in the same as the rest of the class. They used to send me in the headmaster's office, which is why I'd get ahead of everyone. I mean, what else was I supposed to do? But this made me. I had to think my way out of situations. Unlike, see, for four years I got banned from fighting, so that meant every bully wanted to get me, so I had to find different ways of handling it. So I used my brain, the only thing I had. I could intimidate people with a look rather than actually having to get um, banned again from school for fighting. You could hit me and you'd see no marks because I've learnt how to hold my pain. Today I've got two F shoulders, back, I'm having problem with my hip and knee, all from um, my young past. But along the way, fruit and veggie picking and uh, working with other young people, they'd start to talk to me because I had my grandfather's face. And they recognised my grandfather. Um, my grandfather was one of the um, people along the Murray River that um, used to teach 
some of the young Aboriginal carving. And my grandmother used to teach some of the weaving. And um, one of my uncles uh, became a uh, well-known uh, emuid carver. Uh, my family all had a history in it. So when I started turning back up in the Aboriginal world, people wouldn't refer to me as me. The old people go, aren't you uh, Papa Joe's boy? Uh, and me go, uh, I think so, because, you know, you weren't allowed access to your records when I was young. There wasn't no freedom of information when I was young. So you had to find your own way. And I luckily had a face that looked like my grandfather. So, um, and my last name was the same as my grandfather's. So, oh, you're Papa Joe's boy. I don't know, he had 13 kids and him and Nan, and they had heaps of kids too. Um, but gradually, my uncles would start to talk to me and my aunties would start to talk to me about, you know, uh, living along the Murray River, uh, itinerant work and um, how they used to camp. You know, um, Papa Joe and then every time they had a kid, they went in the mesh and then the next moment, back in the um, horse and cart and off. Must have been hard carrying 13 kids in a cart. Um, anyway, I'm giving jokes a, a bit. But the real point of the discussion is that I learned, see, a lot of people, Aboriginal, who grew up in Aboriginal communities, they learn things, but sometimes they forget them because they're always there. I had to learn. I had to rely on my memory. And I had to learn a different way of thinking. See, I'm one of the founders of in-state of Indigenous gardening and landscaping. I ran a project for six years before the boys and girls got to be the first qualified gardeners, Indigenous gardeners in Victoria. I helped also with uh, developing the Victorian Aboriginal Rangering Program. Each step I've done is for a reason. I won't go into the style and gens and all the other stuff I've done. They were personal matters. This was my young wanted to work outside and my young wanted to learn, and I don't mean my kids, although one of my daughters is better at most language things than I am, um, both of them actually. Um, but what I'm getting at is they wanted to work work outside and they want to learn what had been denied them, some of their cultural and some of their um, history. So I worked for uh, six years as a cultural officer for all the Western suburbs, but I was having a statewide meeting with all the other cultural officers so that we, because one there was only one Aboriginal ranger back when him and I met, discussed it, and then the other cultural officers joined in the discussion. So when the government wanted to do a review, we got, yeah, but what we do in culture and heritage should be part of um, mainstream uh, rangering. And so it ended up being that. Um, and I'm not going to take credit for it all because I was just damn good at planning. The other people were like, uh, I would acknowledge uh, people, but unfortunately they're dead, and I don't like mentioning names of dead. But I acknowledge that with the rangering one, there was an Aboriginal ranger, and I was working in a park, and um, a non-Aboriginal fellow spoke to me about, you think about we should revegetate this? And there, oh, with all those kids asking me, can they work outside and wanting to learn about uh, some of their traditions, perfect. Yeah, let's run an Indigenous gardening landscaping project. i got to tell you the truth. I'm a terrible gardener. <laughs> That's why I did become the gardener. Hired a good gardener who studied at Melbourne Uni um, 
uh, botany uh, back in the 70s. And they were hippies. Trust me, they were hippies. I mean, at 30, they talked like old men of 80. So, yeah, I was getting them to um, some of them to teach younger Aboriginal. And um, from that, some of them went into rangering. So my whole thing is now I work in museums, I'm learning paleontology, not via going and reading the books, but by talking to them. Did you know moss was the first oxygen-producing plant? No, this is a true fact. But nobody but specialists examine it, but they don't see the connection between what happens when moss breaks down. You go to any archaeological site in Southeast Asia and South America, and they go, oh, we've discovered a new site. It's a, it's a big, big stone village, and it's covered in forest. Why aren't Earth scientists talking to uh, archaeologists, not to go in after they clear it, but to go in before it's cleared, to see what is making it. And they'll come up with three ingredients. Um, lichen, moss. Where do you think you get all your peat from? Um, oh, the other one. Uh, very important. Fungi. Now, over the COVID period, I listened to so many bloody earth science documentaries and watch so many earth science documentaries because for me it was about time to take the next step. Aboriginal culture has lessons from the last, um, what they call it, climate change. It has lessons that nobody has learnt except Aboriginal people. But if I talk to a geologist about the formation of um the story of the formation of Port Phillip Bay, back when I used to be cultural officer for Melbourne, I could, with their permission, uh, they go, oh, that's what every society, uh, they use the word primitive, society says is when there's an earthquake or when there's a volcano. Yeah. We record the stories. We turn them into creation stories. But the gist of the story is still there. There was a bloody earthquake 15,000 years ago that created Port Phillip Bay. There's volcanoes from when the Aboriginal people lived around them. Well, actually, that's how some of the stories of the Mindy, which is the um, punishing snake, comes about. His Mindy's breath can kill. Volcanoes explode hundreds of miles away, the sulfuric gas killed people for a distance around. All those stories cover up what really happened. But those stories, those songs, those dance, those cave paintings can tell you what happened in climate change. There used to be, they showed me the, this paleontologist that they had this um, – upright kangaroo that walked on sort of goat's paws. I looked at it and said, you know what? I know where there's a cave painting of those. And they're going, what? You mean there's... I said, yeah. We'll just have to get their permission to go see them. These are the things you're not doing. You're not looking and thinking that we're scientists just like you. How do we know what the inside of every animal looked like and what portion belonged to whom? Unless, first of all, and why the dances were invented. First of all, it was observation. Observation that was passed on to the next generation who then observed. And over time, everything developed 
out of the first word of science, observation. Check your results. Talk to other people about your results. Pass it on. The next, this is the unfortunate and fortunate thing about growth. Science, unfortunately, lost its path. Science became too specialised. You know, we talk about when we're growing um, fruit and veggies, about companion planting. The whole bloody bush is a companion planting project, and yet we don't put it in that terms. We, um, When scientists talk, they talk in terms sometimes the lay people don't understand. It's unfortunately I've had to work in history for 40 years that I get to understand some of it. Um, but most lay people, and it's one of the problems I spoke about uh, eight years ago at the forum, was that science has got to learn to not just speak the science, but speak it in my bloody English. Every time the gardeners would talk to me about the native plant, they'd use microscope, all these other words. And I go, no, what's that in English? I go, what do you mean? What's its name in English? Look, I'm trying to teach these kids their Aboriginal name and you're giving them a bloody Latin name. And it's no use to me because if we learn the common name, then it's easier to teach the Aboriginal name rather than this bloody confusing Latin names because you break them into categories. They're still the same bloody thing. By the way, the first flower was also came from moss. The first oxygenation. Everyone talks about the big forest. I used to get greenies coming up to me and going, you know, I want to find the mother tree. I want to find the father tree. And I want to find this. Uh... And I used to say, no, nah, you're looking the wrong way. You should be looking down. I didn't have the language back then, but I knew it wasn't about those tall trees. I used to work with a bloke now and then, and we used to do, uh, he used to drag me onto his radio program. His name was Bob McDonald. And he used to run a show called The Eclectic Parrot. And he used to have um, nude nights at uh, Fitzroy bars. With my skinny legs, I wouldn't go. Um, unfortunately, if I have a, a, a physical defect, it's my bloody legs are more skinnier than my body. So I don't go show them too often. Um, but what I learned is, like, can I tell you the story of how we got a koala? In my language, Kubra. Once there was an orphan boy named Kubra, and my people, Kulin people, we said, Kubra, come live with us for a while, and we teach you our way. So Kubra lived with us for a while, and he got the age of responsibility, which was usually around seven, eight. Kubra, we're going to have a big meeting, so we're going to have to go all day and gather tucker for everyone that's coming. We need you to keep these fires alight. All you have to do is toss on one piece of wood every now and then, and then when we come back, we'll be ready for the big cook-up. Off they went. Now, this day got thirsty. It got thirstier and thirstier. And Kubra, oh, I mean, it got hotter and hotter. What do I do? I'm telling Kubra's story before I actually tell you why he was drinking. It got hotter and hotter. And Kubra, he got thirsty. So he went down to the nearest... Um, Water hole, and he drunk and drunk and drunk until there was no more water. Now, my people were cool, and when they came back, they were hot, tired, and thirsty. Where's all that water? What happened to the water hole? Why is there no water? Cooper said, Ah, uh, I got thirsty and I drunk it. So they punished him. Now, our ways in the old way was send them out into the bush by themselves. Because you've got to remember, we didn't have KFCs and all them, and we didn't have lights to shine through the night, as in the cities. And there were weird sounds, sounds like, <laughs> which, by the way, is a small plastic ale. Um, 
So, when he came in the morning, they brought him back into camp. They gave him something to eat and said, look, sorry we had to punish you, but you had to learn. Water is important and it needs to be shared. So let's start again now that you know. Uh, off they went. Now, this day got hotter than the day before. Oh, and beforehand, they gathered all what we call tarnucks. Anyone got a water bottle I can borrow? Ah, that'll do. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's not doing you. Don't take it. I'm not going to do it. Oh. So... We had two types of tarnucks. The bigger tarnuck, which would be in the camp, but people carried one which was made out of bark, sap, and fire hardened, just the bottom half of this. So it was more like a uh, large mug. Anyway, so they said, you can have a sip of them, but remember, that's all the water we got, so leave some for everyone. Off they went. Well, this day got hotter than the day before. But cooper has gone, hmm, if I drink this water, I'm going to get punished. What shall I do? He was walking around and he noticed the manager, the tallest tree there at the time. So he grabbed the tarnux and climbed up into that manager and stayed there all day sipping. Now, I'm going to cut the story short because when I normally tell it, I'm telling it to young people. And... um. So I do all this uh, behaviour, like try and pretend I'm a kid. Pretty hard to pretend you're an eight-year-old when you're 70. Um, so um, to cut a long story short, they came back, hot, tired, thirsty. Where's our tarmacs? Where's our water? Could recall from up the tree that he was up there and he had all the water. And as cheeky eight-year-old, he'd give him the old – and. Um, Kept uh, sipping. So they climbed up after him. So Kubra tipped a little bit down the bow and they all fall down hurting themselves. So with that, they got angry. And they said, Kubra, if you don't come down now, we're going to use our sticks. Actually, they weren't sticks. They were a form of club. But they were a smaller club for small game. You know, the one where, say, today, a rabbit is very close. That would fix him. Stun him so you can catch him. Okay, I've got two minutes to go. Here's the thing. The story tells me that the koala loves managum leaves. So managums in some areas are used as their travelling path. Secondly, Kubra doesn't drink water because he remembers getting punished. Rarely does he drink water. He only drinks water when all the leaves are dry because when you tell the second story, you give the grounds for how it happened. And uh, so it tells us, because we see the koala avoiding trees that he used to eat. So we know drought's coming or fire's coming. Five, two months before the World Weather Bureau and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology said anything, I was doing an ABC uh, science show. And I said, we are going to have a very bad fire season, this season coming. Three weeks later, Australian Bureau of Meteorology and the World Bureaulogy agrees with me. Why? You notice how much rain there's been? You notice how green it is? And you notice how quickly it's not turning from green to grey? We have used up a lot of the underground water. Our water is soaking back down. So the ground is dry already before summer. That's why I was able to make that prediction. And you know what? My daughter was reading a book, some um, Aboriginal woman in um, New South Wales wrote. Um, and she said, Dad, She's saying the same thing will happen in New South. Go on, go on. They were using old Aboriginal knowledge of what to look at in the ground, what to look at the patterns over time that were recorded. And they, like me, reached the same conclusion. Shit, we're in for a bad summer. 
Now, I'm only saying this for this one reason. We're all looking at all these big buildings, which is the tall trees, which, by the way, was a museum display back in 1989. I was involved in it, uh, Bob McDonald. Um, and Bob McDonald did the best uh, analysis of the monetary value of keeping a forest compared to logging and compared to uh, commercial development. His figures proved at that time that there was more money from people going into these areas than there was from actually development or logging. The point I'm getting at is that we know a little bit now more about um, fungi because it can, can dissolve plastic over time. It can dissolve uh, cigarette over time and um, all these things. Now, the one thing I'm getting at is I need earth science to get in touch with archaeology to look at how these buildings are overgrown before they clear the bloody thing and then go to you. Now, we found it cleared, but why did they move? They're only looking at where they had grown things and the soil was badly used. Here is the proof that something makes soil on top of rock. And we, and I mean the world, is not examining that because we're too busy specialists. So I'm going to stop now and say, yes, we need the specialists, but we need the specialists to talk to each other, to talk about companion planting rather than scientific terms, and to go see any archaeological report that says, we've just discovered a new city. Get there before they dig the bugger up. Because that might give us some clues on how we can regenerate worldwide some of the bush. But I'll leave you with one thing. My people, we know we survived and we know we'll survive this because everyone now, if they wish to survive climate change, has to start learning how to look at the signs of change and has to learn which plants, by the way, survived all climate change. And that includes the wattle tree, by the way. It survived climate change. There are very few species that survive climate change. Fungi. Oh, now I've forgotten the name of Voss and the other one I mentioned. Lichen. Those three have survived climate change. Those three are the foundations, I believe, of recreating healthy soil. And those three are responsible of why archaeologists now go digging through jungles for old stone buildings that have overgrown with forest. And scientists are not aware of that, earth science. That's where it needs to be now shared more. We need to work together, Aboriginal communities, science, archaeology, and see what plants still survive from those eras, plus how in the hell does soil grow on rock? I just told you the three ingredients, and over time, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Uncle Larry. I'm, I'm excited to hear about lichen, uh, mosses, and uh, and fungi being talked about. This is staying to, into my kind of field. This is good. Um, it's also fitting, I think, too, that you've taken us from the tall trees down uh, to something beyond, I guess, the mountain ash, because our next speaker is Associate Professor Lauren or Wren Bennett, an accomplished scholar of forest ecosystem sciences at University of Melbourne School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences. And uh, Wren focuses on carbon and nutrient cycling and forest carbon assessment, soil science, ecophysiology, tree demography and fire ecology. As I said, we, we hear a lot about those big, tall trees. 
We're going to now move to the uh, the health of the mixed species eucalypt forests. So thanks very much. Ben. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks for inviting me to speak about the health of mixed species eucalypt forests. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands of this uh, research, the Jajawarang, uh, Wurundjeri and Gunai Kurnai people, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Much of my uh, research is supported by the Integrated Forest Ecosystem Research Program funded by DECA, so that's a key program supporting ongoing forest research in Victoria. So supported also by other funding sources listed there. And I'd like to um, acknowledge my colleagues at the University of Melbourne, DECA and ARI, and particularly graduate researcher students, research staff and uh, early career researchers for allowing me to talk today about their hard work. So the title of this talk is Looking Out for the Health of Mixed Species Eucalypt Forests. But what do we mean by healthy? Uh, there are many interpretations. This is just one from Western science from the 1990s, that a healthy forest is one that maintains its organisation and autonomy over time and is res resilient to stress. And that health has three main components. Vigour, represented by productivity. Organisation, represented by structure and biodiversity and resilience, which they suggest is the ability to maintain vigour and organisation through quick recovery from stress. And why might we be interested in mixed species eucalypt forests? Well, as a very broad forest type, they are the most extensive in Victoria, occupying over 50% of the um, public land by area. And because of that, they provide many of our forest-based ecosystem services. They include a range of ecological vegetation classes and so support much of our forest-based biodiversity. And they also seem to be quite tolerant. So the dominant trees are renowned for their capacity to re-sprout after even the most severe fires. That lovely green that you see along charred stems in the aftermath of a bushfire, that's re-sprouting. Can we rely on this tolerance to sustain their health in coming years, given Predictions in Victoria of a hotter and drier climate characterised by more intense rain events, more dangerous fire weather, and leading to expectations of more frequent and more severe bushfires. So I wanted to check in on the health of the mixed species eucalypt forest and examine the potential influences of these climate and fire changes on their health, so their vigour, organisation, resilience, through the lens of some of our recent research. Starting with heat and its potential influence on vigour in the form of gross primary productivity. So gross primary productivity is essentially the total carbon that a forest fixes from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And it's a fundamental process because it provides the energy for all the interconnected organisms in a forest. And here's some key statements by work done by Alison Bennett and Anne Griebel in their PhD studies based on data from eddicovariance flux sites, like the one you see there on the left in the Wombat Forest near Dalesford. And so on the top of those towers, we have instruments that measure carbon fluxes above the forest can canopy. And from that, we can estimate gross primary productivity. So Alison, assessed the relationships of gross primary productivity with temperature for uh, 17 wooded ecosystems around Australia as part of the eddy covariance um, network of sites and found that gross primary productivity of eucalypt forests adjusts with the local mean daytime temperature and also that small increases in that mean of at least one degrees would have minimal influence on gross primary productivity of those forests. So some buffer there in the system to at least moderate warm, warming. And also found um, some tolerance of heat in the mixed species eucalypt forest at that wom wombat site in that the forest was um, could maintain its gross primary productivity throughout a five day heat wave in 2014. And it appeared to do that by 
using more water to cool its leaves. So from these studies, we might say, maybe the eucalypt forest will be okay just with hotter conditions alone. But at least in the case of the wombat study, we're not really sure about these combinations of hotter and drier because in Anne's study, the trees appeared to have sufficient water to get through the heat wave. They weren't water stressed. Certainly though, we need stronger understanding of how chronic drying might influence productivity and vigor of these forests. But we also need to keep an eye on um, temperature, heating in particular, because our other work in the Wombat State Forest has shown that temperature is a really important influence on stem growth. So that's the expansion of stems. Uh, and in temperate Australia, our eucalypts don't put down regular growth rings because they grow quite opportunistically in their stems. So we have to look at their growth or monitor their growth using things like band dendrometers. So what you see there up in the top, top photo, a metal band with a spring on it, we come back at regular intervals to, to look at the measure the change, quantify the change in the diameter of the stem. And I'd like to thank Julio Nehera for collecting each of these points that you see here in these graphs. So these points represent a single tree's growth over a month. And the different colours representing different seasons. We have Eucalyptus oblique on the left, Eucalyptus rubida on the right. Tree basal increment is essentially that, that stem expansion, increase in diameter as area. Against maximum mean temperature, what you can clearly see is that growth increases to an optimum and then decreases beyond that optimum. So um, perhaps we'll say if we have more increases in maximum mean temperatures, maybe we'll have periods of lesser stem growth. But uh, there are many things that um, stem growth in eucalypts respond to. And another thing here was autumn rainfall. So with less autumn rainfall, we had less stem growth in both autumn and spring. So again, emphasizing the importance of looking out for these combinations of hotter and drier conditions together. There may be ways to um, relieve any climatic stresses on stem growth by relieving tree-to-tree -tree competition. So this is data analysed by Ella plumens putin during a research project. And again, on the vertical axis, we have that increment in growth, but this is for a whole season. And we have the different seasons uh, um, going from left to right, summer to spring, plotted against the competition index of each of these individual trees. So a dot is a tree's growth over a season and on the horizontal axis, it's competition relative to trees around it. And straight away, you see that the, there's most potential for growth in autumn and in spring. So the highest values on the vertical axis. So these trees grow, like I said before, opportunistically when the conditions are good. In autumn and spring, it's not too hot, not too cold. There's usually sufficient water. You can also see though, with competition from an adjoining trees, growth decreases in autumn and spring. The line is much flatter and less convincing in summer. And that's because things other than competition are limiting growth in summer. Things like lack of water and uh, perhaps higher temperatures. And so what we might say from this is that reducing competition between trees is likely to improve growth during the good times. So the trees get larger, faster if you relieve that in, into tree competition. It's not so much about relieving and improving growth during the lean times, but perhaps getting faster, uh, larger faster will help with persisting during lean times because those larger trees might have deeper roots to access things like water. So at least in these types of forests where the stocking is quite high, there may be some potential to open up the forest to improve vigor in the form of at least stem growth. But there's opening up and there's opening up and sometimes things can go a bit far. As happened in the wombat forest in, the, um, in 2021, when we had two extreme wind throw events. So you see here the town of Barkstead in December 2020, and then again in December 2021. Definitely too much opening up happening there. From using these kinds of images um, and led by Nina Hinka Nehera and Paul Bentley, we've been able to construct a map of wind throw severity based on satellite imagery. 
And you see that there, the most intensively impacted areas in red with very considerable decreases in canopy cover. So we've estimated that about 35,000 hectares or 75% of the Wombat State Forest was impacted by wind throw in some way, 1,000 hectares of that severely, so with greater than 50% reduction in canopy cover. And this is what it looked like on the ground, definitely uh, severe thinning out of standing stems and a lot of fallen wood on the ground. So windstorms are a part of the historical disturbance regimes for these forests, at least out in the west. Um, but we think this might be the most extensive on record. And it's not clear how wind might change with climate, but um, strong winds are often associated with rain bearing systems as these two were, these storms, and more intense rainfall events are forecast for Victoria. And so it's likely that we're gonna to have to anticipate dealing with these kinds of intense shocks to forest health in coming years. And in some ways we're accustomed to seeing quite severe sort of images in mixed species eucalypt forests. So this is after high severity fire in Gippsland, but they're less of an issue because uh, we, we get quick recovery usually. So the trees, most of the trees remain standing for one thing, and many of them resprout, the majority of them resprout successfully. Can we rely on this reliable resprouting into the future? Perhaps not always. So this is work from Yugendra Khanna's PhD, and Yugendra assessed the recovery of mixed species eucalypt forests after Black Saturday and the Kilmore Marindindi fire. Uh, he used aerial lidar data and analyzed it in quite some data and um, quite some detail to look at the individual crowns and also the the forest canopy as it's recovered nine years. Has it recovered nine years after Black Saturday? And you'll see there, he found quite persistent changes in the canopy of these resprouting trees. So much more cylindrical elongated crowns there, nine years after high severity fire, relative to the much more complex and rounded crowns of unburned forest. So we're not sure how this might influence the productivity of these forests, but we did assess the carbon stocks five years after Black Saturday in the same forest type and found um, decreased carbon stocks in these mixed species eucalypt forests after high severity fire. And that was largely associated with tree mortality. So on the vertical axis here, we have the percentage of standing trees that are dead. You go from left to right, the tree size classes. So 10 to 20 centimetres diameter going up to the larger site, the trees that were over 70 centimetres diameter. And the white bars are unburned forest, the light gray, low severity forest uh, fire where the fires did not burn the canopy and the dark gray, high severity where the crowns were pretty much consumed. And what you see straight away indicated by the asterisk is that there is um, significantly higher mortality after high severity fire in all tree size classes. This is five years after the fire. But you can also see in the, the white, particularly for that smaller size class, which had 93% mortality after the high severity fire, about more than 30% mortality in the unburned forest. And we believe so high baseline mortalities for these forest types going into Black Saturday. And we believe that was associated with the millennium drought, which was for eight years before Black Saturday. So what we can say is that high severity fires um, plus straight drought can kill resprouting eucalypts. But there was some good news in that after high severity fire, there was also prolific, prolific seedling regeneration, so from seed. So there was some renewal there of the forest after high severity fire, which is a good thing if those seedlings um, survive long enough or get big enough to survive the next fire. And as similar to David's map earlier on, this is a map that we produced in January 2020 showing the um, initial distribution of the black summer fires. Um, overlaying here with preceding landscape scale fires. So the different colors, for example, orange indicates that they were burnt twice, that area burnt twice within 20 years. 
red twice within just 10 years, and then the pink and the purple burnt three times within 20 years or three times within 10 years. So these are very short intervals um, based on the historical fire regimes for all of these forests. And we know that short interval wildfires are, are not good for obligate cedar forests dominated by ash, for, uh, ash trees, mountain ash, the alpine ash, but we, they're also not that great for um, mixed species eucalypt forests. As Tom Fairman established in his PhD work in um, Gippsland, examining the recovery of mixed species forest, this is shrubby dry forest, in response to short interval fires. So in, short, in response to one high severity fire in 2013, and then to just six years of interval between 2007 and 2013. And there you see quite marked changes in the forest structure. And that's to do with resprouting failure, particularly of middle-sized stems, but also of um, less tree regeneration as fires that came up in the, uh, seedlings that came up in the first fire after the first fire are, are killed by the second. So Tom, this has flow on effects to all sorts of ecosystem services, including carbon storage. Tom assessed the carbon stored in the principal pools. This is the one of the main over uh, above ground pool is live tree carbon on the vertical on the vertical axis again. And the different colors, each dot is a site, different colors representing uh, unburned forest in green, burned once in 2013 and then burned twice, 2007 and 13. And across the uh, horizontal axis, we have the site aridity index. So the site's getting essentially drier and hotter as you go from left to right. And what you can see is for comparable aridity, uh, you get a stepping down in the carbon stocks. This is three years after the last fire. So we can say here that short interval bushfires can markedly reduce carbon stores in mixed species eucalypt forests. And based on these data, but also other indicators, we believe that recovery of those carbon stores will take longer on drier sites. And we're seeing similar sort of transformations in the forest structure and in the tree layer in other forest types. This is um, more of Tom's work from the snow gum forests in Victorian Alps. Uh, and it's not a mixed species eucalypt forest, just dominated by one tree, the snow gums, but it is a re-sprouter. And you see there, Tom examined recovery after one, two, and three short interval fires. So three fires within 10 years, quite marked changes again in the forest structure, tree mortality, uh, decreased basal resprouting success and decreased seedling regeneration contributing to these changes. Alarmingly too, um, changes in the understory vegetation. So the characteristic shrub layer pretty much replaced by grasses after three short interval fires. And that really highlights something that I haven't had time to talk about here, but the importance of looking out for the biodiversity in our mixed species eucalypt forests. And much of that, the plant biodiversity at least, is in the understory. So we need to Keep an eye on not only the trees, but all the other plants. So just to sum up, yes, there are multiple potential threats, I think, to the health of mixed species eucalypt forests. We may have severe single events like those wind throw events in the wombat forest. But what I think we really need to look out for are compounded events where disturbances overlap in time and or space. Things like heat plus drought, severe fire plus drought, Severe fire plus severe fire plus severe fire plus drought. Thanks. You can ignore that message up there. You're not going to get a morning tea break yet. Um, I'd like to invite the three panel uh, three speakers up to uh, answer questions, if you don't mind. And we'll, we've got questions also, hopefully, online as well, which will be fed in. So, yeah, please take take a seat back here that wherever you, wherever it suits you. Really. Now, if Uncle Larry is still here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Well, uh, you can shuffle around, stretch for a couple of minutes. We are aiming to go to morning tea, I think, at 11.10 still, which will give us about 15 minutes. We'll see how things go. If, um, if it starts to get really exciting, I'll extend by another few minutes. It's not to, <laughs> not to say if we keep the time, you're not exciting, but... Okay. Yeah. All right. Look, we'll, we'll get started. We can, I've just been told we can extend another five or 10 minutes if we need. So we'll see, see how things go. Um, so I'm going to open to the floor for any questions relating to the speakers today. Yeah, Rob. David, what might a natural fire raise you? Yeah. Can I keep one, two, three. here we go. David, what might a natural fire regime be now? What might a natural fire regime be now? I think that's that's ecosystem specific. Uh, it, it's pretty clear that that a significant part of fire dynamics is driven by climate, long term climate, and short term weather. Um, I think thinking about a natural fire regime. It is very ecosystem specific relative to, often to the life history attributes. You know, we just saw some really good stuff about some good work about the, the regeneration or resprouting failure of mixed species forests and the obligate cedar things like ash that looks to be about 25 to 30 years. Uh, so a natural fire regime now is we've got to look at what the ecosystems are that we're dealing with. I think one of the key things that needs to be rethought in this space is I don't think we're going to burn our way out of the problems that we're in at the moment. There are many, many ecosystems have already had an enormous amount of fire and adding extra fire into those already heavily disturbed systems could actually be a big own goal. Yeah. That's a really hard question too, Rob, because it's so it's it's so geared to to what systems you're you're dealing with. So if you want grasslands, it's a very different kind of entity relative to tall wet forests. I think it's fair to say that the, the data shows that the prevalence of fire, the frequency of fire, the severity of fire, the uniformity of fire is very different now what it was even just 30 years ago. So we've seen, for example, a big switch between 1980 to 2000 relative to 2000 to 2020. Yeah. Thanks for that. On that question. Yeah, go, Larry, please. Okay. On that question, the other problem is there used to be wet scleral forests. I argued in um, the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, that they weren't wet scleral forests anymore. They were actually dry scleral forests because nobody's done those type of surveys via the government unless it's been private scientists doing it themselves because uh, conservation and them have not in changed the rating of forests since the 80s. And everyone's aware of it, but nobody does anything about it. It's it's they're not telling us the truth so that we can start to look at things properly. I mean, we are talking 40 years nearly since those ratings for wet scleras, dry open forests, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have been updated. 40 years almost that I know of. Because I've argued that, that if you went to um, Flowerdale, nah, that's at risk. If you went to, and I was living, by the way, a Broadbit area, nah, that's at risk. We know this because the locals know it's not the same forest it used to be. But governments are not actually allowing us to know 
that they're not doing the rating systems, or if they've got it, it's in by private reports. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, even in my era, I have to go sometimes in the organisation and say, you can't burn up there. And they go, why? It's because it's been bloody burnt the last 10 years in a row. None of some areas has been allowed to recover because they've gone, oh, let's burn off. They pick the wrong time of the year to burn off because they pick spring. They should be doing it in autumn. Now they are. Let's give them that. But it's not every year you burn off. You've got to give space between. Some areas every seven years, some areas longer, depending on the climate, the soil conditions and the plants in the region. This straightforward policy that they've done up until 90s was, oh, we burn off so that we save uh, ourselves from bushfires. You're right, they've been adding to it, but the thing is nobody, unless you're a local, can go to, say, where they're going to do a burn off and talk to the local and go, hey, um, you know that was burnt for the last four or five years. Or, hey, aunt, you know that was burnt. Yeah, um, they don't know. Because they're in their part of the area, maybe they're looking after that. But if you're looking at the whole tribal area, and my whole tribal area um, covers quite a few hundred kilometres. There's not enough of us to do it all. Plus, we've got to follow government policies not what we like to do. We also have um, too many other complications that native title is a, a lie. I'll get compensation. I won't get land. Or if I get land, it'll still be under government rules. It's, it's the impossibility of you pick up one little trick that Aboriginal will do and you take it too far. You pick up one little trick that another country does, and you go, oh, let's do that to all of Australia. Mate, climate here, there are eight regional climates. And I mean it, eight. Check it. Local weather patterns in some areas is different from local weather patterns. Well, Melbourne's weather patterns. I'm usually just on the other side of the hills. Two degrees warmer every year. Mind you, four degrees colder every year too, winter, um, than Melbourne. This is where the problem lies. We don't judge weather patterns with the plant mix to do these things properly. All of this is someone seeing someone do it and go, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't we all do that? Um, we've got to stop that thing. Thanks. Thanks, Uncle Larry and and David. Um, we're going to come back to fire, of course, later in the day, so I'll be able to return to that. Yeah, question in the middle. Um, uh, or no, wherever the microphone is. Sorry, at the back. Thank you. Um, just to, Mike, okay. do yell out if there's online questions so I don't forget. After um, it. Okay, David thanks. mentioned about salvage logging being the most damaging of all. Could you elaborate on that um, and why you say that and what you mean by salvage logging? Thank you. Okay, so I've, I've written books on this. I could send you a copy if you want to. Want it. Um, so the problem is it's actually building on what Ren was talking about at the end, which is it's a compounded disturbance. So so typically what happens is that you have uh, a prolonged drought period, so your forest is under pressure. Then you have a fire, your forest is under pressure from that. Then you have a logging operation on top of that. So you've got a series of compounded disturbances and so, for example, uh, the fire may trigger lots, a, a mass germination event, and then what happens is is that you have heavy machinery that's that comes in over the top of that, and often there's a lot of logging slash that's left over, so the system is burnt after that. So you've got a series of compounded disturbances, which which really does have a major effect. And when you when you look at it, uh, experimental plots, you can see a big effect on certain plant species, particularly the re-sprouters like um, tree ferns, 
um, must daisy bush and others, but you see the, the, the signal in the soils as well. Uh, so the, the data measurements show there's impacts on soils, on soil carbon, on birds, on plants, and particularly re-sprouting plants. The, all of that stuff is documented. If you want to follow up that, just send me an email and I'll happily attach things and, and send you that. So it's a compound of disturbance to which most ecosystems aren't geared to deal with. So when you when you look at the fundamental biology, there are systems that are broadly geared to deal with frequent, low, low in intensity, low severity events. There are systems that are geared to deal with rare, very high severity events, but there are very, very few systems that are geared to deal with very frequent, very high severity events. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, David. We'll take a question in the middle, then we'll go to the online. Yeah. My question is for, for Ren. I hope that's working. Yep. Yeah, please. Terrific talk, Ren. I really appreciated you introducing the whole topic of how we define health of a forest. I think that's a minefield that would be worthy of another symposium because there's so many values embedded in that. The question I had about the the way you described organisation of a forest, most of the data appeared to me to be vertical structure. Not Did, did the research look at horizontal distributions of st structural diversity across a landscape at a landscape scale in the recovery of the mixed forests? Thank you. That's a really uh, important insight, actually, because, uh, well, yes and no, I suppose... The recovery from Black Saturday in the mixed species eucalypt forest. So Uganda looked at the canopy, which is an over landscapes, and found yeah um, sort of more potential for fragmentation of the canopy and for sort of emergent trees and discontinuity and gaps and things like that, which may or may not be a good thing. It's hard to know because structural heterogeneity at landscape scales is actually being correlated with increased sort of niche opportunities and more biodiversity. So not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Not sure if that might make uh, opening up of the canopy might make um, areas more sort of prone to wind throw as well. So uh, the verdict is out on that. But I think it's a really important point that you brought up that we do need to uh, look at landscape scales to mosaic, structural complexity, structural heterogeneity, generally is a very important principle that we should be we should be looking to. Thanks. Thanks for that. We'll keep us moving along. Um, Mike online. Thank you. Um, look, um, there's, it's a similar question and uh, one for you again, Ren. Um, I'm going to conflate a couple of questions, one from Julia Croato and Jill Redwood, who have joined us online. Um, both of you loved your presentation. Thank you. Um, there's um, Julia's actually asking more about um, uh, the comparison of fire severity with an area's previous exposure to prescribed burning. And, and Jill likewise wants to know if there's been a comparison of um, relative biodiversity after a, um, a prescribed burning regime as well. So they're both concerned, I guess, about uh, the extent to which we're actually tracking the change. Thank you. Yeah, in the um, Black Saturday study, we um, didn't necessarily look at biodiversity in terms of plant biodiversity, but we did look at carbon stocks in terms of plant burns just before Black Saturday, um, Black Saturday and found no real impact of um prescribed burning on carbon stocks um, because most of those prescribed burns were presumably of low severity, not always true, but did seem to be in this case. And so, in fact, um, low severity fires, planned burn and the low severity Black Saturday burns um, improved carbon stored in the soil. So that's a, a one, one win from um, low severity fires is that they can lead to greater storage of carbon in the soil profile. So we did find that uh, in terms of biodiversity, that is a work in progress where we're examining those sorts of relationships between uh, with different fire histories, including plant burning in the mix on plant uh, diversity. But I, I don't have a comprehensive answer on that one at this point. It's, it's very variable and really depends not only on the fire history, but also other disturbances and 
and the tremendous variation that we have in our landscapes here, a lot of it to do with topography, so wetter areas versus dry areas and things like that. So um, watch this space, and I'm sorry that I haven't got more in my head about that one. Thanks. I, I can just add a little yeah, bit yeah, but... to that in a, in a different context in in um, in the Brindamella Mountains outside of Canberra, Phil Gibbons and, and Jeff Carey's group has, has looked at fire histories in that space and found that the long unburnt country was was actually very important for mammal and reptile biodiversity and that the long unburnt country actually had lower levels of, of flammability relative to areas that had a had a um, extensive prescribed burn history and I know that Mike Clark has got some other work that's that's probably similar in some ways perhaps different in others in that space but it's a complex space given again differences between systems. Yeah. I suppose what I can add actually sorry I completely forgot about this the fire effect study areas um, prescribed burning over since 1985 in the wombat forest burned every three or ten years kept mostly up to date and long-term data there on the understory um, has indicated very minimal um, effects on um, the plant composition there. So it really does depend on the um, on the forest itself. I think it's very place-based understanding. Thank you. Uh, question at the back? Yeah, thanks. We'll just send them. Mike, for people who are uh, online, thanks. I'm interested in... Yeah, I'm interested in the distinction between ecological burning and prescribed burning because under the policy regimes, you got both. Uh, and I'm interested when you say you don't know anything about it. I mean, we know a lot about what happens in ecological burning. So what, what's the interconnection between those two forms of burning going on in the state? Who'd like to uh, handle that one? Both, All three of you can give a perspective if you like. Who'd... <laughs> Ren, Ren, you go. Yeah, I'll have a go. Well, I suppose that um, prescribed fire generally covers, um, um, it's prescribed, and it can be prescribed for different reasons, including fuel hazard reduction, uh, ecological um, fire, ecological burning, more to do with taking into account the the needs of the um, organisms in, in that forest and the plant responsive traits, the animal responsive traits. Uh, but yeah, I can't give a synopsis on on the knowledge around every aspect of the forest in relation to prescribed burning. Hmm. Okay. Ecological burning. Yeah, I don't know, Larry. Do you? Is there anything you want to add about just burning regimes, perhaps, from your perspective? Look, as I say, they're making a sort of blanket policy state government, and that's what's wrong. There are some areas that need a longer time before they're burnt. There are some areas that have been uh, overburnt. But the biggest problem is the bloody population is expanding into our areas, so there's new roads being cut through every area, releasing, which is why there's no wet sliver or forest, releasing all the groundwater because it starts to run off where they've done those roads. So sometimes when they're doing those burns, it's in the wrong areas because of what they've done. Some of these prescribed burns are to protect towns and uh, uh, farms because um, I spent nearly 30 years, despite being in Melbourne a lot, living in country areas. And um, I was once living in a forest and the rangers were coming through and they were baiting all these, um, to get rid of all the foxes, London forest. And I go, okay, after you get rid of them, how are you going to handle the rabbits? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, the foxes are eating the bloody rabbits. So if you get rid of the foxes, you get rid of the rabbits. No, it's the government's prescription. You've got to get rid of the foxes. And so a rabbit population explodes. Then the government puts something in place, and then a couple of years later, oh, the fox population explodes. Okay, we're going to start baiting. There's no rational policies to do with 
environmental studies. I mean, you can wipe something out if you do it over time, like blackberries. You can get rid of them, but it takes bloody seven years to do it in the same spot. But the interesting thing is, oh, let's burn them or let's poison them. So you're adding more poison to the areas. You're changing the areas and you're creating through stupidity in government, I hate to say it, actually I love saying stupidity in government, <laughs> um, because they go, oh, yeah, we need to burn this off to protect the people. The problem is then they introduce Aboriginal burns, but they don't tell the Aboriginal people how many times they've burnt that bloody forest. It's only if you live locally that you know that. And that's the big problem. The people who might know how many times they've burnt that forest are the local non-Aboriginal living people because they're the bloody, they're the people doing it to protect their properties and to protect their towns. So this fire reduction, there's all these things that are not worked out. You know the truth? I don't think in three or four year cycles. This has taken me 40 years to get to this point by first starting Indigenous gardening and then first and then working on rangery to get to this point where I'm saying, oh man, will you government keep out of it, let people locally talk to each other? Because we could actually help work out when some area needs to be burned and when some area needs to be alone. As I say, I have to go into the offices where the uh, tribe is and go, I hear you're going to burn there. Yeah, You know there was a burn there two years ago? No. Don't they even tell you that they asked you to come and burn um, forestry or uh, conservation, but they don't tell you their data on how many times they've had people in there to burn the area, how many times they've introduced something into the area, like that's actually changing the area. So we as Aboriginal people yeah. are trying to catch up with the information you've got that we don't have. And it's only if we live lo locally that we know these things. Like I'm all the time going between Broadford and Yay, and then uh, Broadford up to uh, Benalla. But along the way, we're going through the forest and we see the change. I mean, hell, my children are better at the changes than me because my eyesight's getting old. Um, Thank, I bet it. Uncle, that's Uncle, what I mean. We thanks, need Uncle to work together to get everyone on the same page. Fire burning could actually give us more trouble. In the right spot, it can actually improve things. I'll let, work that out. I'll let David, he might disagree with you. David? So just I think in many respects this comes back to Rob's question at the start. I think the fire regimes that are appropriate are relative to, to the country. There's it's it's clear that there is there are some vegetation types that are largely no fire country. And when you talk to some First Nations elders, they'll talk about that. Victor Stefferson talks extensively about no fire country as being part of fire management. Some of the long-term data sets show that the more fires in particular areas, that there's quite significant effects on, on some elements of biodiversity like birds. Buderee National Park for woodlands, forests, and particularly heathlands, you lose about 9.1% of bird species richness for every extra fire that you add into the system over time. So that's fire history going back to 1973. So I think there's a significant um, local effect, as as Uncle Larry says and, and Ren says. To, and so the notion of a broad idea of 5% of the state being burnt in, in any given year will lead to perverse out, outcomes because you end up burning in remote places um, to hit your target. It's Goodhart's law. 
in, in that space. So there needs to be a lot more nuance, a lot more thinking about what you're burning where, and also thinking about your history. So the impacts of wildfires will vary depending on what's being burnt. A fire in an old growth forest gives a very different outcome relative to a fire in a very young forest. Thanks, David. And I, I would just add, I'm going to take one quick question maybe, and thank you for the bell. Um, my, my one connection with uh, National Parks on Advisory Committee and I one, one other person here was on that committee, uh, be, having to reconcile the percentage uh, burning along with the acknowledged ecological burning requirements. And there was some fantastic science out there and the inability to reconcile those two together uh, was very evident from being on that committee for National Parks. And I was suggesting I have the answer to that, but that was one of the problems we had to deal with um, was the percentages to be burned to meet requirements versus what we knew about ecological burning. So make, make that observation, which is probably pretty bloody obvious. Um, Mike, one last question. If there's a Thanks, short one. Tim. I was uh, anxious to get this in here, actually, because it um, relates to, I think, uh, where the conversation's up to. It's, uh, yeah. uh, and again, I'm conflating a couple of questions. These are from Sharon Woodard and James Hackle. Um, now, they're looking for the view on how to best approach active forest management for fire. Um, and shouldn't this best be administered at the local level, yeah, which is pretty much going to what um, La Uncle Larry was talking about, uh, not controlled by some government department in Melbourne. Uh, and James sort of, I guess, can add to that across the diversity of ecosystems that form these cultural landscapes, what are the types of innovative management interventions will need trialling and testing? How do you actually get Western science and traditional owner hyper-local um, management regimes uh, together? And how does that look like that new adaptive? management regime how do you make this a local thing even though we need to actually get global ideas of scientific intervention and cultural knowledge into the mix how wow we okay together? that's a big question <laughs> this is the entire symposium by the way but yeah yeah, yeah. When we make that work a local then influence the um, local always start local yeah. all right let's let's take that as the answer and, yeah, and yeah, uh exactly. it's a it's a it's a topic that we're going to return to many times. So, look, thank you all very much, those of you online and those of you in the room. For those of you here, we're here downstairs to the uh, Berks and Wills room for tea and coffee. Um, also, I want you to be back, I think, here. 11.40 we're still aiming for, if we could. No? No? 11, 11.45, back in the room for the start of the next session. Thanks very much, and thanks to the speakers again. Thank you. Yeah, it's not there. Yeah. No. yeah, thank you. Thanks, soon. Just keep it on. Uh, keep it going. Go get a cup of tea and uh, come back at 11.45. I'll change that slide. See you soon.
All right. Thank you. Are you ready to go? Okay. So well, welcome back after morning tea. And those of you online will be ready and waiting. Those of you uh, in person here will note that there's a bit of delay getting back from the uh, morning tea and the uh, conversations and the eating. So apologies, apologies to those online who are probably sitting there eager and waiting. Uh, but we're just about to get going. Uh, our next session is on... Now, hang on. All right, all right. Wait, wait. Shh, shh, shh. We must keep the time to respect our speakers today. We need to keep the time. So save those conversations. You'll have another chance at lunchtime as well. Uh, as I said, we're about to start the session on fire and restoration. I'm very delighted to be handing over to uh, Mickey Perkins, who's a senior journalist at The Age, uh, writing on climate, environmental issues, and for many years on Victorian forestry. And she's just, just telling me, how pleased she is that she won't need to ride on it ever again. <laughs> so, Mickey, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks for looking after. Thanks, Tim. I was actually saying I'm pleased I will never have to do a Vic Forest's annual report story again, but maybe I will. Who knows? Um, okay, so our first speaker, oh, sorry, I need to remember that I'm going to acknowledge country. We could do that again at the start of this session. Um, we are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, I live on Wurundjeri country up north of Melbourne near the Mary Mary Creek, um, and that's how I, I guess, interact with the country around me, and I'm very grateful to be on that country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the elders in the room, past, present, and leaders that are emerging, any other First Nations people that are here today, I'd like to acknowledge that land was never ceded. Um, this is a sovereign nation. And also to acknowledge myself um, the deep uh, sadness and pain and frustration that is felt by many First Nations people in so-called Australia um, at the moment. Okay, so we're doing a, um, a, a forest science um, and fire session. And the first speaker is Associate Professor Emeritus Michael Feller, who's a forest fire science and management specialist, maintaining a posting with the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Michael has taught university forest fire science and management courses for almost 30 years and conducted research both in eucalyptus forests in Melbourne's Maroondah water supply catchment, as well as forests throughout British Columbia. And if any of you have been lucky enough to go into the Marinda water supply catchment, which is not publicly accessible land, it is an incredible area of forest. Um, the British Columbian research in, con, included studies of forest fuel, forest fire and prescribed burning ecology and many studies of slash burning effects on vegetation, on soils and on water. During the last 10 years, he's participated in citizen science studies here in Victoria, which included fuel assessment in our drier central highlands forests. Today, he'll be talking to us about fire management from, for multiple forest values. Please make him very welcome both in person and to um, the many people watching online. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much. Uh, I should say it gives me great pleasure after many, many years of absence to actually talk a little bit about the science of my spiritual home, which is the Victorian bush. Okay, so are we right? Um, I'm going to talk about multiple forest values and bushfire management, how they interact. And it's given from the perspective probably of an outsider looking in, since I haven't really done any fire research in Australia per se. And what I'll be talking about is firstly a few things about the values of the forests, then what bushfire management is, some of the issues with existing fire management. 
Uh, I should say that bushfire is a term used in Australia only. If you're overseas, you talk about fire management. And because most of my work has been overseas, I will uh, lapse into non-Australian terminology ever so often. I apologise. Um, and also, finally, with, with some recommendations of how this bushfire management can be improved. So firstly, values of forests. There are many ways you can evaluate values. This is one particular method, looking at direct, indirect values, option values, existence values, with a whole list of them uh, being given. If you're an economist, you can also talk about economic values of forests and splitting to use, non-use values. And again, direct use, indirect use, et cetera bequest existence values. There are many, many values of forest, but regardless of how you sort of classify forest values, the point is that if you're managing a forest, you have to somehow take into account these values. So let's go on and look at fire management. The um, We're not working. Um, okay, so the first definition of modern fire management really came from the US Forest Service in the late 1970s. And basically, fire management or bushfire management was an integration of various fire-related bits of information into land management to meet desired land management objectives. Later on, the FAO... Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN came up with a slightly more lengthy definition, but still involving similar things, a whole pile of activities associated with fire and how they're integrated into sort of meeting land management objectives. In Australia, we have a definition um, which is a bit simpler, but basically the activities associated with fire and how they can meet management, land management goals and objectives. In Victoria, we've recently had a, uh, bush, a draft bushfire management strategy released just this year, which defined bushfire management as simply the activities associated with fire. Nothing to do with land management, nothing to do with how they could be integrated with land management, nothing to do with um, the relationship to anything else that goes on in the land. Bushfire management was separate from everything else, which I believe is one of the major problems with fire management in Victoria. Anyway, so talking about some basic principles of fire management, and I just put this image up here to show you that it's, fire management is conducted all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's not just unique to this part of the world. Um, the first important point is that it should be subordinate to land management. Land management dictates what you want from the land. Fire management is one component of that. You must have a fire management plan. You must use the best available science. And you must have or acquire knowledge of and evaluate a number of things. Um, fire behavior, fire effects, effects of all the activities you're doing, what's available, what your values at risk are. And in Australia also, I think it's important to consider and know something about Indigenous fire knowledge. Now, we have in Victoria these bushfire management strategies which come out for different regions of the state, which are essentially something similar to a fire management plan. But what are the current issues? What are the major issues from my perspective, as I, as I said, more or less from as an outsider, because I haven't been working intimately in the field here. Um, firstly, and you've you'll heard about this already, you'll hear more about it again, past forest management, which includes both timber harvesting and fuel reduction burning, has increased <clears throat> forest flammability and the likelihood of more severe bushfires. Current fire management, from my perspective, is focused almost entirely on reducing fuel loads, primarily through prescribed burning. And most other values are ignored, um, human health is ignored, uh, land management objectives are ignored, fire management sits by itself. Um, 
we don't have a good vet knowledge of what's present in the forest that we're supposed to be managing. Current prescribed burning practice is not very good. It needs improvement. And since it's so dominant, it, it's worth commenting on. And also, finally, uh, the tools, well, not quite finally, but the tools that we have to assist fire management um, need improvement. They're not based on the best available science. And finally, there doesn't seem to be any control over bushfire management in Victoria. People who are conducting fire management can do whatever they want, and there seems to be little recourse to do anything about it. So just looking at the first thing, and in front of me are people who know much more about this than me, but I'll just point out that, whoops, sorry. Um, typically, many studies, not just one or two, but quite a few have shown that once you, after a fire, the hazard's low, but then it builds up with time to a peak before it drops down again. And current fire management burning every five, 10 years or whatever keeps us on this high flammability situation. Do you see on the left, other studies have shown similar sorts of things. And forest harvesting, past harvesting, you've already seen this figure this morning. Uh, David Lindenmeyer showed it to you, pointing it out how harvesting here, it's in this case following the 2019-20 fires has increased the likelihood of more severe crown fire type situations. Now, I'll just add to this a study that I've done in Canada a number of years ago in southwestern British Columbia, which found something very similar following forest harvesting. You see, initially there's a low crown fire hazard, it increases with time since harvesting and then drops off again, followed by a slight increase in old growth forests. Point is maximum period for uh, a crown fire likelihood, crown fires being the most serious, intense, severe type of fires we can get, typically occurs 20 to 70 years after harvesting in these coniferous forests in Western Canada. Similar results have been found in the Western US. The point is, I, I mentioned this not to promote this work, but to point out that there's been a lot of criticism of any study in Australia which uh, sort of comes up with results which contradict conventional belief. And but this, the increase in heart in fire severity likelihood after harvesting has been found elsewhere. It's not unique to Australia. So. Uh, one can't really criticise the Australian work as being something that's very special or different. It has occurred elsewhere. So we have these burning plans, and if you look through them, they say all the right things. <clears throat> However, in practice, uh, when you look at what's planned for the state, these are prescribed burns that are planned, fuel reduction burns for the next few years in the near future. The state's just riddled with them. Um, and in Victoria, uh, bushfire management strategies are dominated by the objective of, re of reducing this mythical thing called risk. And they've got these nice graphs which show what residual risk is as a function of time. Basically, if no forests were burnt, if everything was present, long unburned, you'd have 100% risk. And if you start burning things, then you reduce the risk. And according to this line that's appeared over the years, this is what's happened. Um, and of course, the strategy is to keep the risk below this 70% figure by burning or fuel reduction control, usually burning, which is in that green bar. And if you don't do it, then what's going to happen is the risk is going to follow that dashed line up to 100 again. Of course, with bushfires occurring, that'll never happen. But this is what the plan says. Now, the use of the word risk is a bit confusing anyway, because it's, the management plans talk about house loss, risk of house loss, as well as bushfire risk. And the two seem to be interrelated, but they're quite different things in practice. And risk is also determined using a computer model called rapid, a Phoenix Rapid Fire which basically treals, treats fuel quantity as synonymous or equivalent to risk. Now, Phoenix assumes that fuel increases according to what's called the Olsen model. 
In other words, it starts low after a fire and just increases perpetually with time till it flattens out at some high point along unburned state. Whereas more recent work or well, recent work has shown that it doesn't really follow the Olson model, it follows that solid curve. It peaks initially before dropping down afterwards. Okay, so what about um, lack of consideration of other values? This is a tree that was, when they, when they conduct fuel reduction burns, they want to make sure that trees don't fall on people conducting the burns. So they cut things down that they think will fall on them. This particular tree on the left was photographed with clearly visible uh, nest material coming out of a hollow. That tree was felled uh, shortly after the photo was taken. There were still two possums inside that hole. So the tree was felled while it actually had possums in it. Um, I lodged a complaint with the Office of the Conservation Regulator about this thing and it got nowhere. They couldn't do anything. Um, another tree that was felled, another hollow, that hollow also had nesting material inside it. And felling of old growth, hollow bearing trees in a national park is has been occurring as part of the program to uh, tidy up fuel breaks. Um, these trees pictured were not in the fuel break. They were adjacent. They were off 10, 20 metres off one side within the national park. Um, they were living, they had hollows in them. You can see the bottom picture there. The tree was quite solid. There's not much rot in the middle of it. Quite a sound tree. And this area was zoned basically for conservation and water production. This is within the Marooned catchment and uh, which is also part of Yarra Rangers National Park. And the, the management, primary management objective for that, for that area was to sort of maintain water and also to maintain the environmental quality. Um, another issue which was mentioned previously is salvage logging. This is an example of what has been happening in the Wombat State Forest. You saw earlier some photographs of what blowdown looked like, trees were blown down. Well, the solution to the problem, which it was considered that that was a big fire hazard, so they had to get rid of all that big material. And of course, the large logs don't contribute much to rates of spread of fire at all. It's the small materials that contribute to rates of spread. So by pulling off all the logs, you're actually probably enhancing the, the speed with which a fire would travel through the area. So from a fuel reduction perspective, it's... it's uh, it doesn't help the situation at all. Okay, uh, what about smoke? Um, the left top graph there is particulate matter, PM 2.5, particulate matter, small particles, less than 2.5 microns in diameter. These are the ones that cause health problems. You can see a couple of peaky areas. One is around April, May 2018, which was entirely due to prescribed burns, fuel reduction burns. And you can see a satellite image down the bottom taken on the 1st of May. All that smoke you see to the west, uh, to the east of Port Phillip Bay, that's all fuel reduction, prescribed fires. It's not from wildfire at all or bushfire. The second big peaks, obviously, on that top graph from the, were from the um, bushfires, 2019-20 summer fires. Okay, so that's smoke. But what happens elsewhere? In 2001, the US put out a 200 plus page document on what to do about smoke and how to manage it. Apparently those 200 pages haven't yet hit Australia. Uh, in BC, which I'm familiar with, um, I did some work on smoke management there. Uh, there's three different zones, basically close to communities, away from communities and a long way away. And each zone has some sort of rules about when you can't burn and when you should burn, depending on how well the smoke will be dispersed using something called the ventilation index, which is also measured in Australia, actually. Um, and a few days ago, that was what BC looked like in terms of where you could burn, where you could not burn, or if you could burn for more than a day. Uh, aesthetic values, another issue. Um, there's been a few studies looking at 
aesthetic values, what people think about fires in Australia. And basically, the studies are consistent with work done elsewhere, which show that people don't like intensely burnt landscapes. And they prefer unburnt landscapes, but intensely burnt are less preferable to lightly burnt. And studies have looked at scenic quality studies basically showing people images of different fire scenes or unburned scenes and saying, what do you prefer? Uh, in terms of other values, biodiversity, if we look at how many areas are long unburned, uh, in different parts of Victoria, you've already seen image, pictures of sort of frequency of fires earlier. But basically, if you look at tolerable fire intervals, this is the time, the minimum time it would take for a plant to re be able to reproduce itself, to produce seed, etc., is, is the fire in, tolerable fire interval for, for that plant. And a lot of that image there is red. In other words, it's below the minimum tolerable, tolerable fire interval. So another fire in that area uh, within that time would sort of uh, cause many species not to be able to regenerate. Just looking at <clears throat> ecological vegetation classes, different environments in Eastern Victoria, uh, the blue part, this is the percentage of each different EVC that's been burned within a certain time period, the top, but the top graph being for the last 15 years, and the blue is due to bushfire. The orange is due to prescribed burns. So you can see the prescribed burning, particularly in the drier forests, which are the ones on the right, the cluster of forests on the right, the lower elevation ones, uh, has been adding quite substantially to the uh, amount of fire in those forests. And the mineral, the tolerable fire intervals basically come primarily from this publication in 2010 which listed different intervals for different types of vegetation or EVCs. And basically the thing was that for a high severity fire, it couldn't, the minimal, minimum tolerable fire interval was about 15 years plus was greater in the wetter forests, such as the ash forests. And a large chunk of those EVCs were, um, had been burnt within the last 15 years. So another more recent study, whoops, sorry, just want to point out that a more recent study there by Muir looked at one particular species, Banksia, Banksia spinulosa, and found that the um, minimum tolerable fire interval for, for that species was actually greater than had been previously assumed. So when you start delving into individual species, you find that these minimum tolerable fire intervals may actually be greater than the ones we currently accept. Just a few quick comments about water and other value. Um, basically, if you look at what's been happening following a fire, there's this initial increase followed by a decrease. And those crosses in that figure represent um, actual measured values and people have tried to model this by putting lines to it. You can see some lines there, different authors, but basically um, the crosses are all over the place. It's not easy to predict. And the conclusion, one conclusion of a recent study was that it depends on how <clears throat> quickly um, forests thin out, which is not very easily predictable. Now, another study looking at drier mixed species forests found interestingly that a low severity fire increased the amount of evapotranspiration compared to a higher severity fire because the, the minimum, the lower severity fire enhanced plant growth for, to some extent. So there's more transpiration. The net result was that the higher severity fire actually caused <laughs> less. Uh, sorry, the lower severity fire caused less runoff than did the higher severity fire in that particular situation. Um, two? <laughs> okay, um, I'll go quickly on. We have things that are supposed to be done for fire management in Victoria. Basically, it's all focused around one particular thing, fuel reduction. If you look at 
causes of fires, you can see that lightning causes about 25% of fires in Victoria, 75% are caused by people. And of the area burnt, about 45 is lightning, 55% is by people. And of people, um, deliberately lit fires, arson type fires, by 25% of all fires in the state and the second largest chunk of area burned. So that's the sort of thing that people, that fire management should be focusing on. Now, just going on to an area that was supposed to be burnt, I said our knowledge was inadequate. We assessed this area. We came up with these things. The EBCs were incorrectly mapped over 25%. We found a number of endangered species in this area. And there's a great variation in fuel types, forest vegetation, all of which is to be burnt at the same day. So a fire in all those different ecosystems um, presents problems. Okay, so we need to improve burning practices. Fires often escape. Um, prescriptions allow fires to escape because they're very broad. They don't consider smoke. They don't consider ecological impacts of what they're doing. Uh, studies showed that. And looking at Corinderk bushland near Healesville, a fuel reduction or a, well, don't know whether you call it ecological fuel reduction or whatever, but a prescribed burn in December 21 caused a lot of, well, basically the fire scorched all the leaves on the trees. Two years later, the trees are dead totally. Um, we need to use best available science. The Olson model, as I said, used to forecast or predict fuel is incorrect. Various, not a single study has found the Olson model to be the accurate or correct model. Every study that's been done has found the opposite. And also it uses um, Phoenix Rapid Fire uses this fire hazard guide to indicate what the fuel hazard is. I won't go into this in detail, but basically it's very subjective. Okay. Um, there has been a very recent, only last week this came out uh, to try and improve the model, but there's still problems with it. But I guess one of the key problems is how much weight should you give to this dead fuel anyway if you're measuring it when it has little impact on, on fuel, on fuel hazard. Okay, little apparent control over management Victoria. I've mentioned this. Um, recommendations to improve... Uh -huh. This is my last slide. <laughs> we'll go to them all quickly. Basically, um, what I've said, integrating what I've said, if you implement these things, you will improve bushfire management in Victoria. But one of the key things, it should be subservient, subordinate to land management. The land management objectives should determine what you do. And there's a many things that you should be doing to improve it. Um, according to what I've just put up there. Tools need to be improved. Uh, the practice needs to be improved for fuel reduction burning. And if you are going to use fuel reduction burning, then try and emphasize lower intensity severity of patchy type fires, similar to indigenous burns. And um, if you're going to cut down trees, well, firstly, you, you should figure out what you've got before you do anything in, on a site. In, do inventories, which are not done, and you should always monitor the impacts. Okay, and um, I'll finish there. Thank you. That's a fuel reduction burn or ecological burn in the Northern Territory Indigenous burn. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Feller. I'm sorry we don't have more time for everybody. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Chris Taylor, a research fellow with the ANU's Fenner School of Environment and Society. Chris specialises in spatial analysis of forest ecosystems and disturbance, disturbance regimes, remote sensing, environmental modelling, land use and forest certification. He's been involved with a number of research projects ranging from the analysis of fire severity patterns across a for Australian forests through to climate change adaptation in Australian agriculture. Chris is going to talk to us today about past, present and future use, or sorry, about the past, present and future of the mountain ash forests in Victoria. Please make him very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nikki. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, that 
we have worked on Tanarong, Wurundjeri, Gunakano and Boonwurrung, um, Boonwurrung country. And I'd like to acknowledge Uncle Larry Walsh, who has actually informed a lot of my my views and opinions on how I see forests. So, and thank you for sharing your stories today. Um, so I would like to acknowledge you as well. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about what are the future, uh, what are the what's the present state of the mountain ash forest, and what what has kind of led to the present state, so the legacy, and then uh, what what are what are some possible futures. So I'm going to go through uh, relatively quickly because I know this is a this is a, a very in depth area, but we um, I'm going to go through it rather rapidly. But if we look at Mount Nash, it occupies the areas in red. So of the map forest area in Australia, we're only talking about 0.2% of forest area. So we're talking a very small area of the Australian uh, forested landscape. And as you're most aware, Mount Nash are defined by their iconic tall trees, but not just their tall trees, but their understory, the midstory, and so forth. And more importantly, these type of forests, so this is a tree on Gunai Kurnai country on the south face of Mount Borbor, um, these big old large trees are becoming rarer and rarer and rarer uh, due to factors that I'm going to allude into. And then we've got associated uh, ecosystems like the alpine ash, um, and there are other closely related uh, forest ecosystems that have also uh, been in, uh, that have been impacted over recent decades, um, and they all call they all sort of fall under a more generic. Um, uh, wet, wet and damp forest uh, ecological vegetation class. Now, a lot of these forests and in the central highlands have mapped about 24% of the mountain ash forest has been impacted by clear fell logging. And as you're most well, well aware, this involves the removal of all merchantable logs. The remaining logging debris is burnt under a high severity fire and then a new crop of trees is planted on an ash bed. The legacies of this can be long lasting. On the uh, right hand side there, there is um, unlogged forest, but on the right, uh, left hand side, uh, that forest was logged uh, 54 years ago. So the legacies of the logging can be seen decades and decades after the uh, occurrence of them. Then we've got fire. So um, uh, 2009 was a particularly uh, tragic year and because uh, of the fires and uh, a substantial proportion of the mountain ash forest was also impacted uh, across and that's an example of an unlogged forest there, and that's a previously logged forest that was burnt in the Black Saturday fires. So if we look at the extent of disturbance across the landscapes, not just the extent of disturbance, but it's also the proximity of, uh, of forest to disturbed areas that is also of concern here. So what uh, David and, um, and um, colleagues and, and myself have done, have, have done a disturbance mapping exercise where we've looked at the central highlands, um, that's the extent of mountain ash forest. You can see it in relation to Melbourne. So in the year 2000, uh, that's how much forest was disturbed. So severely disturbed areas are in red and yellow is 200 metres from disturbed areas. So as time goes on, we go to 2005, we can see the 2009 fires getting in there. This is high severity disturbance. And we see it generally increase to 2020 where we only see a very small proportion of the forest area uh, you know, that is more than, let's say, a kilometre or so and greater than from a severely disturbed site. So when we look at that as a bar chart, we can see the impacts of logging in the first 10 years, and then you can see the jump of the fires and you can see the continued impact of uh, logging thereafter. So what we mapped is about up nearly 70% of the mountain ash forest is either severely disturbed or, or is within 200 metres of a severely disturbed area. So this has impacts measured impacts on biodiversity. This is a draft set of charts. So I've got to up, um, I've got to update this slide, but you can see the updated slide in our published paper. But what we can see is that for lead bed as possum, greater glider, lead, um, and sugar glider, we can see varying impacts. So the proximity to fire for um for lead bed as possum is that the closer to a disturbed area you are, 
that um, the, the the less likely you're you're able to find those species. However, there was an increase in sugar glider where there was um, a, like that that is potentially a species that could be taking advantage of more disturbance in the landscape. So if we go back in time and we look at what was the landscape like pre um, pre colonization. Um, you know, there's been talk about that the forest was open and grassy, and sure enough, there were examples of that. Aboriginal burning for thousands of years did create a mosaic of different landscape types, and this is a landscape that's south of Ballarat. You can painted by Eugene Bongarad, and you can see it's quite open and grassy. So, uh, a lot of these, um, a lot of inferences were made on the actual forest, the wet forest, the Mount Nash forest. So Howitt, for instance, in, in a, in a um, symposium that he delivered here in 1890, uh, came to the assumption that, um, that the great forests of South Gippsland were open and grassy, and they were a legacy of traditional, burn, uh, traditional Aboriginal burning. Now, in some cases that, that is true, but in other cases we'll see we, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't uniform across the entire landscape. Uh, that sort of idea was picked up by Justice Leonard Stretton in his, uh, um, in the, his report on the 1939 Bushfire Royal Commission. Um, so, uh, but Leonard Stretton failed to acknowledge the uh, contributions of the, uh, to the landscape of uh, First Nations people. But he basically said that colonisers or Europeans were bringing in a new fire regime. And this was changing the whole dynamic of the forest. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, then more recently, Bill Gamage quotes Howard in his biggest estate on earth and commenting on the Gippsland forest, uh, he came up with a conclusion that they're open and grassy. However, there are extensive records to show that not all these forests were open and grassy. In fact, a lot of these forest areas were very, uh, were very thick and quite dense. So if we look at the extent of the mountain ash forest across central Victoria, that's what's in the hashed lines, the dark blue areas of the wet damp forest um, ecological vegetation classes here. So that's what it looks like today. Um, prior to colonization, this is what the extent was. So you can see a lot has been cleared. So this notion that there were more trees, uh, there are more trees now, in, in particularly in South Gippsland than there were in 1788, runs into some significant uh, problems, particularly when you look at the evidence. So if we start with um, some um, uh, you know, accounts from First Nations people, we're, talking, we're, we're looking at, you know, one of the things I've noticed when I've put the registered Aboriginal party boundaries over some of these um, EVCs, you can see a lot of the boundaries of the First Nations align with some of these forest ecosystems. And, and, and a number of elders have actually shared with me, and I don't want to um impinge on their cultural authority that's not my role here but they've actually said that some areas were long unburnt and they acted as kind of natural boundaries they actually contained animals when they went out to hunt like kangaroos so you know we're not talking about wildernesses but we're talking about a strategic way of looking at the land uh to obviously you know enable um the, you know, them to thrive so so when we look at um what's happened when we look at, like, uh, this is from the Gunai Kurnai uh, Joint Management Report for Tarabulga National Park, they basically say that the, the mountain ash forest there is representative of what their ancestors saw. And so that's their, that's their words. And so when you go into the Tarabulga National Park, they're, 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 they're telling us that that is a representation of what their ancestors would have walked through prior to colonisation. So then we go into colonial observations. So this is another painting by Eugene von Gerard. This is of the Akron Valley and Nanadong, which is the Tanarong word for cathedral ranges. And you can see they're open and grassy areas, but to the mountains up onto the left, it's where the Mount Nash and Alpine Ash are, you can see that it's quite thickly forested. So you're seeing, you're seeing, you know, quite a diverse landscape just in this one uh, painting. So um, I'm just going to check my time. Um, yep, yeah, I'm on time. Um, so one of the things that I looked at were some explorer accounts. So two people that, or two expeditions, and I call them expeditions, they weren't exploring, they were scouting for pastoral land on uh, uh, across uh, First Nations countries, but there was the expedition of Human Hovel and the expedition of Streslaki. So if we start with Human Hovel, what interested me is their path going to what 
has been called Mount Disappointment, and then turning back and then going around the plateau. So when you go through the journals, they actually say things like that. Here we find ourselves completely uh, at a stand without a clue as to the direction we should go. They just could not see where to go. Uh, and at one spot, they noticed that the trees, and I actually went into the Wallaby Creek catchment before the Black Saturday fires and you know managed to see some of this magnificent mountain ash there. And they, they talk about these incredible trees, but they were also unable to get through it. And because they couldn't penetrate the forest, they called it Mount Disappointment. So, um, so the name in itself is a clear indication of what that forest was actually uh, potentially like. And this is back in 1824. So these are one of the first encounters, the first European encounters with the forest ecosystem. Then we go to the notes from Streslecki. And so um, uh, he was he was wanting to go from the Australian Alps down to Corner Inlet near Wilson's uh, Prom, but the forest was so thick that he turned and then uh, wanted to go to uh, um, uh, Western Port Bay, what is today called Coronella. And so um, they basically were continually up against the thickness and impenetrability of the forest. And in this particular case, the direct course led us through 22 days of almost complete starvation. So from Merbu North to Western Port Bay, it took them 22 days. And that's something that a person like me could probably walk in two or three. So that's an indication of just how difficult that terrain was. Then we go, there's a really good book called The Land of the Lyrebird. It, it, it re recollects um, early um, colonising um, experiences of the forest. And they talk about the three layers, that tall mountain ash forest overstory, midstory and understory. So if we look at some of the historic sites, uh, just these are some of the areas that were painted, like the Akron Valley Fernshaw. Uh, this is a very famous painting by Eugene Bongarad, Ferntree Gully in the Dandenong Ranges. This is not mountain ash, but it is probably more in the damp forest ecological vegetation class, but you can see it, there's a very thick and very well-established understory there. Uh, he also went to the Otway Ranges. And again, you can see a very thick and uh, dense forest. And it wasn't open that you could ride a horse through because there would be no reason for, for this horse track to be cut through. So, and then there's this beautiful painting by Isaac Whitehead in 1880, uh, uh, which is near near Fernshaw. Sorry, there's my spelling mistake there. Uh, then we go into some scientific observations. And one of the things I want to point out is that the leadbed is possum actually requires a landscape of old hollow bearing trees mixed with a very thick con uh, connecting understory to protect it from predation. And so when we look at um, a map like this, the leadbed is possum was first uh, scientifically cate categorized or documented by McKay in 1867 at the Bass River. And in fact, William Polvel tried to walk up to the source of the Bass River, only got up a few miles, but was forced to turn back because of the impenetrability of the, of the forest back in 1826, I think it was. Anyway, um, and so another sample, was, another um, lead beater's possum was observed at Kui Rup, so, or near Kui Rup. And this is from a paper that a, a very younger version of um, my colleague David did in 1991 modelling the uh, historic extent based on historic observations. So, so we're seeing a, a landscape, um, you know, where it was most likely that there was actually very uh, thick um, and, uh, you know, a, a dense forest cover. So if we go into the history of it, like particularly in South Gippsland, there was extensive clearing. And so this was taken probably a little over 100 years ago near Currumburra. So if you'd ever drive through the green hills of Currumburra, there was once a, a majestic forest there and it's now uh, cow paddocks, but they effectively ring barked the trees. And so these are just some explorer accounts. And they talked about how they were introducing fire. So they would ring bark the trees, try to set fire in the early stages of clearing the fires couldn't take off. But as more and more people came in and cleared the forest, reduced that kind of moist, wet forest. And this is some of the things that you were talking about, Uncle Larry. Um, that actually primed the forest to give us Red, Red Tuesday, the 1898 fires. So today, all we see of this forest is a plaque on the Lock Wonthaggy Road. 
let this remind let this memorial remind us of the sacrifices made by pioneer men and women who cleared the great forest on these hills so now we get into the fire bit um and so and i'm going to get a five minute bell right now um so i'm going to go super fast um so the thing is that there were um thank you um so it was so they talk about where um uh Justice Leonard Stretton says that the 939 fires were lit by the hand of man. And he talked about how these European fires changed the whole structure of the forest. Now, when the fires went through and it burnt 3.2 million odd hectares, uh, give or take, there was an extensive salvage logging uh, program that was instigated. And Minister, the Minister for Forests in 1939 said, we have a responsibility to salvage this timber. And so this had a dramatic impact on the forest. So a lot of forests that would have carried on into the next, a lot of, lot of the past biological legacies were removed. And if we look at the actual logging, it was actually policy in 1928. The majority of mountain stands are virgin forests. This is mountain ash, containing a large proportion of over or over mature timber demanding immediate felling. So that was policy. It was to get rid of these forests. And so applicate, the application of the clear fell burn and so method was widely applied across the forest estate. And, um, and so this has left us a very different forest to the one that let's say, uh, you know, the, you know the, the First Nations people were seeing that the uh, human hovel and stress like you were seeing, we're looking at a landscape dom dominated by young trees. And within that, like this is a, a, a past clear fell logging coup, probably 15, uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, after logging, we're seeing it, um, you know, there's there are a lot of weeds incurring into those forest stands. There are also, and David showed a slide of this, uh, there are extensive areas of failed regeneration. And um, and also, this is what the Streslechis, what, you know, the forest of uh, South Gippsland, look, a lot of it looks like today, cow paddocks with, ero with erosion. So, um, I don't know why my slide stopped there. Something's happened. Something's gone wrong. It just jumped. <laughs> Can I pause myself? Can I? I've, I just pressed forward and it just jumped heaps of no, no, I'm there. I'm there. I've fixed it. I'll put my timer back on. Um, okay. So, what 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 are some of the what's the future? Well, if we look at it, you've seen these slides before. We did a study where we looked at these were the fires and the number of fires that have burnt in the period from 1980 to 2000, and this is after 2000 to 2020. So we're seeing areas burning up to three to four times within only a, uh, a 20 year period. So one of the things that we actually have to look at is self-determination of First Nations people is absolutely paramount. Um, we actually, we as you know, in the academic and scientific community need to form meaningful and respectful partnerships with First Nations people so we can complement them and, and support them in achieving self-determination. Um, this also has to be coupled in with like identifying priority areas. So this is a paper that David and I did where we identified areas outside the formal reserve system that would need to be prioritized for, for a strategy towards a protected area network. Now, there are all these different um, ways of protecting. Uh, the IUCN has six protection categories from categories one to, uh, one to six. And there are a lot of indigenous protected areas that uh, rec um, that uh, incorporate those uh, IUCN protected areas. So the um, the Convention on Biodiversity incorporates the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People into its framework. And so we've got international sort of frameworks to use as a guide here to respectfully and actually, um, uh, you know, to adequately, you know, protect the suite of values. And also looking at areas that are relatively intact. So some of these areas that I've circled here, like, a landscape like that off the view of the top of Mount Borbor is a rare thing today. You don't stand up on a place like that and actually look at an unbroken canopy of mountain ash forest. So 
These are kind of like the arcs that are carrying species into the future, and these must be prioritised, and we need to protect them from incurring bushfires like they did with the Wallamai pine in, in the Gospers Mountain fire. Uh, we actually need to place a lot of value on these remaining areas so as the landscape recovers, we can, um, we can sort of rehabilitate. And I'm on 20 minutes right there. Thanks, Chris. Great timekeeping. Um, our next speaker is Adjunct Associate Professor Philip Zilstra from the Curtin University School of Molecular and Life Sciences. Phil came into bushfire research from a background in fire management and remote area firefighting. Since that time, he has developed the first and only peer-reviewed fire behaviour model for most Australian forests, as well as the first model globally to, cal to calculate the direct effects of fire on flora, fauna and soils. His work focuses on under understanding the ways that our interaction with forests affect fire risk. Using fire history analysis and state-of-the-art modelling, Phil's work reconciles deep knowledge from First Peoples with fire ecology and a complex understanding of fire behaviour to provide critically needed guidance in fire management. His talk today is titled From Colonisation to, to Cooperation with Country. Please make him welcome. Great to be here on Wurundjeri country. Um, yeah, so I I live currently on Darrell country, and um, it, it's not to, it's not where I spent most of my life. And I I didn't have a great interest in moving to Wollongong. There, I could only think of um, smokestacks and industrial areas, and I've got a view down over Mordor, uh, um, Port Kembla, and uh, but the country behind me is um just these little remnants hiding amongst the escarpment these these vestiges of durable country and it's coming back and you still see the birds living there as if as if Wollongong doesn't exist you still see these lives continuing on and that connection with country i find now after, after um about a decade there I'll be grieving leaving that country one day, just as much as I found it hard to leave Ngaragu country where I was before in the snowies. Um, so if it's that hard for me, then I, I, I think for, for people who've lived for, you know, tens of thousands of years of tradition on country, I, I can only imagine. But um, in my area on Darawal country, um, there's a tradition that's shared up and down parts of the coast there where there's um, talk about uh, one of the creator spirits, um, Durham Mullen, and um, and I'll I'll just sort of cover this as a as a as a general idea because I'm no expert in this, but I, I found that this concept, Uncle Rod Mason, uh, who's a, a Ngaragu elder um, who taught me a lot years ago. Um, Uncle Rod impressed on me this concept of something he called Bagal kinship. And Dara Mullen was a was a creator spirit who was so central in um, instilling kinship to people. In in spring, nations would gather from around uh, quite a, a large radius and would gather up at uh, Mount Yango up in uh, Duganyong country, sort of northwest of Sydney, and uh, would would meet there together. And, and the young people who were coming of age would go out into the forest by themselves and meet Durramullen, and Durramullen would give them kinship with a plant or a, an animal, some species in the landscape there, and what kinship meant was that you now spoke on behalf of that species and it, it defined the way you related to other species and other people and across nations. And so you had these, these lines that tied you across country, across cultural boundaries, 
across species. This concept of kinship was like a, a net over the landscape and over the biosphere that tied everything together. And so in spring, one of the traditions of Durramullen was that he lived in the trees. And when you heard wind in the trees, you heard the voice of Durramullen. So as the gales would come through in spring and it was time to go to Yango and meet together, you'd hear these gales roaring up the valley. And it's the voice of Durramullen coming to you and reminding you it's time to come and remember kinship. And kinship was this message that was seen as so central to how you live life and how you live in this landscape. It's, it's the survival tool, the way that Uncle Rod put it across to me. Now, a few years ago now, this happened and we, we had one of the agricultural revolutions that have occurred in the world. And what happened was that people learned that you could do things like um, chain up oxen and get them to do the work for you. And you could, instead of walking out to find other plants, you could get them growing all around you and, and, and structure the landscape so that um, the food was near you and you could, you could prosper in that way. And it was a totally different way of looking at the world. Instead of being part of the landscape, instead of being one of the species, instead of belonging to country, you were now a step above people. You were something separate. And from that, we, we a lot of this, this thinking was encoded in religion, which shaped society and, and spread out into the Western world where we had this focus on our species filling the earth, subduing the other species, having dominion over other species, an entirely opposite thinking to kinship, something fundamentally opposite. How did this influence Australia when these two ways of thinking converged. Uh, and we can look at this from a fire perspective. Uh, the the longest-term perspectives we can get are by looking at charcoal residues. And this is a, um, a, a sort of a combination of charcoal measures made across the country. We've got it going back about 40,000 years, but, um, you know, First Nations were here a long time before that. And what we see is, is fluctuations, um, you know, climatic variation in there. Um, there's probably a lot of stories in there that, um, that we don't know the answers to at this point. Um, but that's, that's nearly 40,000 years worth of history. Now, at the, the right-hand end of this, something happened. And we had people that came from this place. This is a, a British moor. Um, reminds me a little bit of the Monero grasslands where I lived for a long time. The difference is that Monero grasslands were a natural formation. The British moors used to be forest. And the reason they're not forest anymore is because of these people um, who uh, burnt the forest and then they burned the heather. And if you don't burn that anymore trees start coming back the forest starts trying to return this is called a disclimax state you're constantly disturbing it to try and keep it into the state that you want if you burn the heather you attract grouse to the young heather and if you have grouse you attract rich people with guns and so you 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 maintain your open grazing lands in this way you've you've got um, animals that you want that are productive to your way of, of choosing to live your life. And so graziers from this area came to Australia and they brought this way of thinking that this is how you clear forests, this is how you create open country. They were working from this mindset of dominion, of subdue the earth. We, we, we have forests here, but we don't want the forests. We want an open country here so, so that we can have this species of, of animal here to to graze and, and to live with. And, um, and when they came, 
this happened. It's it's the hockey stick of fire. Um, now there's debate as to what happened here, why there was this sudden increase in charcoal. Um, on the surface of things, it looks quite obvious that the people who were doing that burning brought that fire to Australia and now we had this huge increase. But this is there's a different interpretation that has been brought in by people because we we interpret things through a lens that um, that makes sense to us. And our lens, for most of us in this room, not everybody, but for most of us, we are influenced by a lens of subdue the earth. We have the colonizers thinking. We have thinking that uh, that unless we take hold of things and take charge, that they will get out of control. And from a colonizer's perspective, that looks like something that has gotten out of our control. And this was uh, sort of encapsulated in this concept of fuel loads and biomass, that the risk, we're told, is that um, we're getting these huge fires because we have too much biomass. So think about the word biomass, bio life, the weight of life. The weight of all lives. Generally, we don't include ourselves in that. We're talking about the weight of all life that's not us. It's not us, it's them. So the weight of biomass is the weight of all of the other lives that we could have had kinship with, but now we try to have dominion over. So the problem we're told is that there's too much other life Things are out of balance. The forests are not disturbed enough. We need more disturbed forests. So we say that the solution to too much biomass is reduce the mass of other lives. So we burn it away, we log it away, we thin it, and we try to exert our dominion back onto that forested landscape. And that we are told in our culture, in our way of thinking, is the way to, to reduce that charcoal peak, bring that fire back down. Where did this thinking come from? This is in North Carolina. Um, it's, a, it's a plantation of longleaf pine. And the issue in this area, longleaf pine is a timber species, um, if you don't burn this country very, very frequently, succession happens. It's a disclimax community like the heathlands. If you, if you don't burn it, you start getting oak trees and hickory trees and other long-lived trees that, that come in as part of succession. And what they do is they create a moist environment that suppresses fire. And so the story... Um, from the Texas Journal Garden and Gun was that um, this man came into the area and he he bought up an area of, of, of oak forest and he wanted longleaf pine and he tried to burn it and he couldn't burn it because it's almost impossible to burn that country. They, they call it mesification. Um, and so he had to poison the whole lot and plant out the longleaf pine. So... Managing longleaf pine has for a long time been something that has needed fire use. And during the 1950s, George Byram, an American scientist, um, developed a model that, that looked at um, how fire behaves in, in these sorts of environments. And, and he looked at it based on weather conditions, but also based on the weight of leaf litter on the ground, which he called the fuel load. This is where we get the language of fuel coming into our thinking. Um, that idea of fuel load was very quickly brought into Australia. And, um, and so we, we started trying to apply it to this. But as you can see already, we've got a more complex forested landscape. Now, Byram came up with this idea that um, it, 
you can calculate the intensity of a fire because a certain fuel contains a certain number of, um, of kilojoules of energy. And if you burn it at a certain rate, then you're releasing a certain number of kilowatts of energy. And that's that's Byram's intensity model. So effectively, it's just the, the rate that the fire is spreading and the weight of fuel, you multiply those two together. Um, now, this particular site here is in WA. It's an area that I studied because in the, the hollow in the tree up the top, um, this hollow is home to a Western ringtail possum, this guy. And um, and a prescribed burn being conducted in this area was uh, was intended to be very low intensity. So we use the equation rate of spread times fuel load gives you intensity. So if you've got a, a large fuel load like a like a grass tree like um, like this bulga, then the way to get low intensity fire is to burn it burn it very slowly and. In that case, that's what a burning bulga looks like. And because you're only just burning that individual plant, you've got a rate of spread of zero. So zero times fuel load means your intensity is zero. So there's a zero intensity fire burning underneath that hollow. Um, now, I used my fire modeling to look at the temperatures over time up in the hollow there. And you can see the dotted line gives you the air temperature, but each successive line is a is a penetration down through the wood. And the red line there is the temperature inside the hollow. And because that red line crossed the horizontal line there, we crossed into a point where it meant that that um, where the ringtail possum um, got, uh, he asphyxiated due to his airways burning. And, um, and, Sorry, fair warning here, but um, here's the fella tried to escape. 77% um, of the ringtail population were killed in this way, in this very small urban patch by a zero intensity fire. So we have we have some very, very bad fire science that that massively oversimplifies this this world because we've tried to tie things back into a concept of fuel load, that the amount of biomass is the risk to us. Um, another part of this was uh, when MacArthur tied it to rate of spread, and yet we can see that's been tested multiple times over, and we can see that rate of spread is not what it, it isn't driven by fuel load. That it, it's a disproved concept. So how do we maintain this idea if a lot of this has been disproved now over the, over the previous decades? Why do we still hold on to this? And part of it is the way that we do our research on this and the time periods that we look at. And just to give you a, a hypothetical example, imagine there's a, a drug that someone has developed and, um, and what happens is that people who... Uh, have high anxiety and uh, you know and become very agitated. If they take this drug, they become calm. And yet, the longer they go without this drug, the more that anxiety returns. And so, if you did a study just on that, you would say, yes, keep taking the drug and take them from there down to there. But if you were to look at it over a longer time period and saw that trend happening, that people who had never taken the drug or who not had it for a really long time, were actually calm all the time and didn't need to keep taking it, you've changed it from a cure to the cause. And this is what we've seen when we looked at fire risk across a landscape with time since fire, time since logging, time since thinning. We see these curves popping up right across, regardless of the forest types that we're looking at through Victoria and the Alps, we're seeing these trends. These are from the, the Black Summer. Um, uh, during the, the most ex extreme sort of part of the, the, the fire spread that year. Um, you know, again, we've seen this one here with, with post-logging effects. Why does this happen? Why is there this increase in flammability following fire? And it's because 
going back to basic principles, I'm going to use, use my model to sort of explain this here. We know that if you've got some fuel, you'll get some fire. If you have more fuel, like shrubs, you'll get more fire. And again, as those shrubs get larger, you get larger flames. That all seems to make sense. But you'll notice that some of these plants aren't burning. And across the black summer, you only had crown fires for about 11% uh, of the time, I think. The rest of the time, um, those taller plants weren't burning. And while they're not burning, they're slowing the wind speed beneath them. So they're slowing the fire down. Now, there's a, a basic principle that Ray Specht um, developed some decades ago that, that it, it makes a lot of sense. You, you take out taller plants and smaller plants will grow from the ground. You take out these plants that are slowing the wind, the overstory shelter, and they will regrow from the ground as fuel. If you scorch them by burning them, if you cut them down to thin them or log the forest, they will regrow again from the ground and they'll be down here where it can be fuel. If you leave them alone for long enough, then that fuel develops into overstory shelter. You now have the most biomass. Biomass is no longer the threat. The most biomass gives you the lowest fire risk because it's up tallest. Now, this varies between forests. In, in say, mountain ash forests, we still maintain a very mesic understory now that we've got plants there that cope with shade and don't burn well. But this is what we call ecological control theory. It's the way that forests naturally managed fire since Gondwana before we turned up and cut them down to save them. Um, so just to, just to finish, Uncle Rod used to tell me about um, a way they used fire in this landscape here where um, they'd come up in the spring, they'd camp at uh, this site at the base of Yilagumbra Mountain. Yilagumbra was the rainmaker. And as people who had Bagal kinship with the Matrukwaral watched the flowers fall, they'd say, it's time for us to leave this site. Um, time for us to move on. And so the rain men would watch for the morning of the day that Diligumbra got cloud on his head. And as he got the cloud on his head, they'd walk up to the top of the hill and um, and they'd say, Buduri Diligumbra, and throw out a fire stick and thank Diligumbra for his country. And then they'd walk away. And the following autumn, they'd come back with, with fruits from the mountains up in Tidbilliga and come back across the grassland with these fruits and they'd eat these fruits down at the campsite. But these fruits were also growing around the camp and they were maintained through these small focused burns, not landscape burns, but small focused burns where you took your place as one part of that landscape, not as the dominant species that controlled it. And that that depth of language is something that we need to we need to start respecting again and understanding that there this knowledge is complex. So thanks very much. I just wanted to check. I don't think Uncle Dave's here, is he? No. Okay. We, we might go straight to the panel then. Um, I'll invite our three speakers to come up to the chairs. So Phil, Michael <clears throat> and Chris, if you want to come forward. And um, obviously if you're online, you can post a question and we'll mix up between in real life questions and online questions. Thank you. Uh, first question in from in the room, maybe. Behind the microphone, there's someone right there. Th th thanks so much. Really, really interesting talks and, um, yeah, a lot to digest. I guess um, well, one question that obviously pops to mind is, you know, ignitions that would happen throughout time uh, that weren't caused by people. And the fire that that introduces to the landscape and the fire behavior and the type of fire that, that would cause. How does that fit in with the sort of fire management and the fire regime and the sort of ecological outcomes that we're managing for today when our suppression is so efficient compared to what it was in the past? Uh, 
so um it it it's actually very very hard to say how effective our suppression is at reducing fire size and one of the reasons for that is that um when we when we're dealing with fire in remote areas um we we we're, we're good at getting fires when they're very small but once they get large we often tend to fall back to backburning strategies some sort of suppression firing and the purpose of those is not actually to keep the fire small the purpose of suppression firing is to control where it burns to so if you've got a town here and a bushfire there it might stop before it gets to you but you don't know so if you've got a road in between you'll you'll light a backburn from that road and and the idea if it works is that the fire doesn't cross that backburn now it, it, they're not they're not hugely effective but you may have reduced that fire size or you may have increased it there are some very very large backburns and it was really interesting during the black summer in Kosciuszko where i used to work in fire management um uh, there were literally no firefighters left to fight fires in remote country they were all stationed down at um at urban fringes you know to to protect those places and so those fires stopped across the mountains by themselves so so you know it was a it was a concept that we had i think in fire management that um um you know they that these fires will effectively burn if you if you get a bad fire season they will continue to burn until the season's over um but it's not necessarily true and and we had that perception because we hadn't seen that happen very often but we we had this um great opportunity i think during the black summer there's a learning opportunity that um um fires do naturally stop by themselves there are natural containments even in a season like the black summer and and yeah there would have been rain in some instances in other times um there were just natural barriers so particularly um when forests were older and we had more of that biomass there in a, a state of overstory shelter and so fires were spreading slower they were protected from the wind more you would have had a landscape that was dominated by long unburnt forest with smaller patches that were either um lightning fires that had ignited and then gone out again and burnt a, a small little patch across the area or perhaps areas that that different nations were using where they would burn along pathways or around campsites and that sort of thing but the broad landscape was was able to wage Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, has there been a study of um, hardwood? See, half of my area, one side is a mountain range, in between there's a grass plain, but there's a certain amount of box iron bark, stringy bark. And um, some people used to tell me that after the bushfire, their concern was more, um, well, we used to use iron bark just a little bit to keep ourselves warm in our huts because it takes hours to burn through. So I'm wondering if there's been a study on um, the box iron bark areas after fires or before fires because sometimes the local people would say to me, especially uh, some of the Aboriginal, uh, yeah, the fire's out, but we're not sure it's out yet. So they'd be looking at the root system because sometimes that's – if a wind flared up and the root system was exposed, um, the fire could stay there and then the wind flare up will start again. Has there been any studies on those type of fires? I don't have those forest lines. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I haven't studied them from um, from a, a detailed scientific perspective. I've got that one of the the graphs I showed there includes those forests there, and we do see that trend that when they're left without fire for longer, that that, that the bushfires are smaller in them. But I I 
I'm, I'm very familiar with what you're describing. I know when we had a fire in, in box gum country, we would spend weeks afterwards walking and, and feeling the ground with the backs of our hands for roots burning under the ground and, and you know, literally for weeks after we'd seen smoke. Yeah, it just seems to me that some areas, they're not aware that their fire can flare up again yep. because of um, the type of wood that yep. grows in those areas. Yep. And as I say, part of my country is in that. And um, I don't see any reports in those yep. places. That's why I was asking the question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for answering. Hey, Chris, um, just some observations on the really rapid uh, um, whirlwind view through colonial accounts of our wet forest community's condition. It seems to be not, in my observation, the full picture. There's lots and lots of examples of... Um, you know, undisturbed wet forest communities being open and grassy, particularly into the alpine ash communities, you know, like on the Blue Range behind Alexander, for example, where they they didn't have these luxuriant understories that would prohibit or weren't part of traditional owner management systems. And it just seems like we've brushed over this concept, which I think is possibly a little bit more complex than you presented in the your presentation. There's lot, I think there's lots of complexity around these tall forest systems and it's not just a simple blanket. We TOs didn't use them um, or maintain them with fire. There's lots of evidence that they possibly did. Pathways, travel routes, the, the landscape you gave of the um, little ranges, not at all. Now, that area around it has lots of evidence that it was quite um, well utilised by TOs and the pathways up to the tall, like Mount Tallbreak or Mount Bullfight, where there's both the moth sites, were really, really heavily open and maintained. I think I just think there's a little bit of, you know, further discussion and in, in, in unpacking of those kind of concepts we should kind of consider. So, more statements. Well, I'll just respond to that statement. Um, I wasn't inferring that those forests were not used by Aboriginal people. Um, uh, I had a, an afternoon with a late elder who lived at the foot of Nanadong Cathedral Range, and we spoke at length about uh, burning, and he said that uh, his ancestors and, you know, he spoke of his great-grandmother, who was one of the last elders to live, you know, there before uh, she was moved to Corrindirk, um, uh, that they burnt in the valleys, uh, but they went up Nunadong and they went up Mount Torbrek every summer to collect bogong moths. Uh, he said to me that they didn't go up there and burn it like they did in the valleys. So these are, and again, there is, I agree with you, there's more complexity and I was only given 20 minutes to cover a very complex issue. Um, but I think one of the one of the points, and if I'm given the opportunity to clarify that now, is to say that this sort of notion that you know these wet forests were similar or alike to other forest ecosystems is not the case from our research and the conversations I've had. And uh, but that doesn't mean for a second that um, that there weren't those travel routes. That you know, yes, indeed, there were. Um, every summer they did go up to uh, Mount, um, Mount Torbrick and, uh, you know, th those forests were used, but they were used differently. If I could just add to that, um, it's not only fire which controls sort of the openness of forest. There are soil conditions, there's topography, there's a whole variety of factors. I was once at a place in Gippsland and there was a, we were walking through this forest and there was just a profound change in the vegetation at one point. And I sort of said, a question, why was this happening? And then I, I dug a few soil pits and there were two totally different soils. One had a totally very sandy soil. The next was a very clay soil. And the vegetation was profoundly different. So I, I, I can't speak for certain about the areas you're talking about, but all I'm saying is that there are factors other than fire that control openness of vegetation. 
Okay, yes, yeah, so let's take an online question. Um, okay, so uh, this one's from Kerry McDonald, uh, and she's responding to the concept of kinship that um, that Philip and others this morning have talk, spoken about. Uh, how do we instill the, that concept or precept of kinship into the concept of environmental stewardship, which is, you know, I guess, more of a, a, um, a Western concept? Um, even stewardship is uh, something that comes from, um, you know, from medieval um, Europe. Uh uh, she's saying the idea of general environmental duty uh, is really what we're talking about and and have can we have all this inform and underpin legislation and policies societal values how do we basically make that transition as I guess a very young society in terms of being a colonial Australia into um, embracing a kinship model more like our indigenous brothers and sisters yeah um it's it's a huge question I think because um, the the concept of, of, of stewardship is is still a, a top-down concept of, of us managing things responsibly um, and and it's got some level of tie-in still to that idea of fill the earth that that we we still have growth built into our thinking there's still got to be something that profits our species above it above other species and kinship kinship is in stark contrast to that um kinship is about saying we should not be dominating we don't go and and drink the water hole dry we um because others need the water hole so so we need to recognize our place in that role of things so there's there's some very very fundamental rethinking that that goes beyond just um environmental um, legislation and, and management, it, it's got to come back to, um, you know, huge economic rethinking in many ways. We, 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 we are, are fundamentally structured in a different way. We, we're geared towards growth and, and kinship uh, is geared towards sustainability. We are disturbance specialists. And it's a it's a case strategy model, the, the kinship one. It's it's there for long term survival, not not rapid growth and destruction. Cool. Uh, it seems that there is a lot of funding and resourcing towards fuel reduction, and there is not uh, anywhere near as much on the mitigation aspects in terms of preparing forests in a way that is like protecting the species as well as people living close by and their values and um, doing things like actually stopping the burns when they're happening and just wondering what you folks think like is the reason behind that like why are we not trying to put out the fires and invest into increasing firefighting capacity and instead just focusing so heavily on um, increasing the capacity of forest fire management in Victoria. Uh, I'll say a few words on that. As I said, I, I haven't been living here for the last 30 odd years, so I'm not intimately familiar with everything that's been going on, but from my perspective, it, it's a sort of, it's an ideological thing. People think a certain way and their belief system says you focus on people, you ignore other things. And if, if there's a threat to people, then that's the thing you should focus on. And as a result, um, there's been this emphasis on trying to protect people from fire. In terms of the amount of money you spend on doing different aspects of that, uh, again, this is, um, it's hard to say, but ideologically, I've seen this elsewhere in Canada, um, the people in charge of, of firefighting regarded as, as a war. There's the enemy is fire and you're out to fight the enemy. So you throw what you can at it. So you don't necessarily think about things well in advance. You prepare yourself for the war that's going to happen. As I said, it's an ideological thing. Um, and... David Lindenmeyer mentioned about various other things that should be done, use of new technology. Um, 
this is something that's talked about in these bushfire management plans, but really it hasn't really happened in practice. The emphasis is still on trying to fight the fire and burn the fuel, get rid of fuel. Mm -hmm. And you've heard from Phil and others why fuel is has had that sort of uh, is considered that way. It's the big thing, but perhaps you can add yeah, to that. If, if, if I could add to that, just... Um, there, there are a lot of people. Um, I'm more familiar with the New South Wales situation, but I know we 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 mix a lot with um, a lot of Victorian remote area firefighters, and there are uh, huge levels of expertise in catching those ignitions while they're small, both in New South Wales and in Victoria. Both states have pioneered techniques in this way, which are extremely effective. But the problem is they're hugely under resourced. And so in, in New South Wales, for example, the Gospers Mountain Fire, the, the biggest single ignition forest fire in Australian history, um, there were four remote area firefighters free to go out and put it out on the day that it was discovered. And that's, you know, we had an exceptional fire season, but we also had decades of warnings that there was this thing called climate change. You know, we needed to gear up. We're still focused on depending on people volunteering their time to do it for us for free. You know, we we have not yet bit the bullet and said, how do we need to scale up our remote firefighting capacity so that we have people who can afford to give as much time as it takes and they don't have to do it for free and take time off their jobs. They can they can stay for weeks if they need to. And instead of four people to put out on that fire, we can send out 40 people or whatever it takes to do that. And, and so it, it is very much an ideological thing because there's this concept that if we burn the forests, we're preventing fire. And it and it's it's a it's a concept that has been proven wrong so many times over now. And and we saw during the Black Summer that those fires just did nothing to stop that and 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 um and prevent that effect. But if we did have those resources in remote area firefighting, if we were able to upscale that, we would change things dramatically. And that is, I think, one of the big challenges challenges for us now as we as we're dealing with these, uh, you know, working out the future for these forests, we need to change our priorities away from burning it and towards uh, getting those skilled people out who've got that time. We might take a couple more questions um, and then it's time for lunch. Just here. My, my question's for Chris and compliment you on your talk and your stunning slides. One of the most shocking to me was your picture of regrowth littered with weeds. Um, just thinking about the legacy of timber harvesting and who picks up that responsibility. And I'm, are there any lessons from the mining industry when they leave a place? Um, what are the expectations for restoring and making good when an industry moves out of a, an area? That's a really good point. Um, one of my main criticisms about forestry policy is that the logging took place and the cost has been borne by the community at large. Um, they return very little back to the public interest for that. A lot of money was given to sustain this industry. Um, so I think it's impractical to sort of say, look, you know, they have to come back and clean up the mess because, you know, a lot of them are exiting now. The industry's collapsing. Um, if I could swear, I'll call it a particular word, but I won't. Um, but it, it is a mess. Um, so the legacy of like we're like one of the most gut wrenching things is going up the Snobs Creek Valley and seeing the alpine ash under a carpet of blackberry. And the only places where I don't see the blackberry are in sort of areas that are remote from disturbance. Like if you go into the middle of the Bauble Plateau, you won't see the blackberry there. If you go into the uh, alpine ash forests up on uh, in the headwaters of the Thompson, you don't see the blackberry there. It's, it's where the disturbance has occurred. And so we're talking about thousands of hectares and not just the actual logged areas, but we're talking about the um, surrounding areas. This is why I was doing the, um, this is why I was, focusing on the areas in proximity to that disturbance. And um, 
I don't really have the solution right now to, to give you. It's a, it's a very complex problem, but we actually need to, this is really the next tranche of our work. How do we actually design a solution to this, to address this? and to address it effectively. So David, my colleague, talked about Sampadir um, and others um, have mentioned about similar things. And these are, these, are, these are areas where we actually need funding in not only just research, but actually with research with pragmatic outcomes uh, so that we have monitoring out there. So when, when a, 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 a weed strategy is enacted, and we're cleaning up some of this. Um, then there is um, then there is monitoring to in, to ensure that health is being returned. So this is an area that we need to urgently address. And that's, that'll be my response. And um, one last question, I think. Yeah. Yep. It's just me, I think. Thank you. Um, I guess for Chris mainly, but um, the panel of the Alpine ash and and mountain ash forests are clearly ecosystems at risk from frequent fire and hopefully now past logging. Um, as we start restoring the, these eastern forests, and, and we heard earlier uh, the, the panel discussion around getting into restore these areas, particularly where they were logged, are these ecosystems sustainable in, in the longer term? And as we enter restoration phases, should we be looking at shift changes, perhaps in what those ecosystems are going to look like in the future? Um, and perhaps looking at you know mixed species forest or montane forests that are not obligate cedars um, being more sustainable forests in the future? Well, if I'm to look at like, and you know, David's probably more um, qualified to talk about this than me, but I'll I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, what you're touching on is the potential for a landscape trap. Um, so that's where we have disturbances in close succession, and so with alpine ash and mountain ash, uh, it's only a couple of decades before they uh, mature enough to produce seeds. So if you have fires in close succession you basically see the local extinction of those trees on that site. And how we deal with that, well, um, again, like uh, I don't necessarily have the answers to that right now because um, uh, one of the things, and this is just, this is where our research is at, is that we've made observations that we're seeing a significant, a statistically significant shift in fire regimes. So like up around Mount Feathertop, for instance, there are some areas that have burnt three, even possibly four times in where there's alpine ash. And so those alpine ash previously have never gone through that disturbance. We're in new territory. And the other thing that's important is um, the fires of last century, like the 1939 fires, as Justice Leonard Stretton said, they were lit by the hand of man um, today. They're being driven by changing climate patterns. So we're seeing more dry lightning occur in the elevated alpine regions. And, um, and we're starting to see different drivers um, behind this. So um, yeah, it, it's it's something that we're currently working on and we'll 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 have answers to provide in 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 the course of our research as we push that forward. If I could just quickly add a Small comment, uh, ash, ash forests can move uphill. As things get drier and warmer, they can move uphill to where it's a bit cooler and wetter. So what we should be perhaps even more concerned about are the snow gum forests because they've got nowhere to go. They can't go up. Okay, um, if you could join me in thanking our speakers today. Um, it's now lunchtime, and if you could be back by 10 past two, please, for the next session. Didn't want to discuss all the other people's work, but... <laughs>
other possibilities might be important. So you're doing timekeeping at the same time as Welcome back, uh, everyone. Oh, that's Dave Kendall. Hello, Dave. So, <laughs> yes, I know you're there too. <laughs> so I'm just doing my hellos from the stage. Um, the online audience is presumably with us as well. So, yes, you've all uh, come back from your break, as is the people who are here. So thank you for coming back more or less on time. Uh, we've got our third session about to start. We're going to have a couple more people come in. I can, I can hear that. And this will be on the theme of forest stewardship for multiple values. And to help us through this session, we have Elena Mountain, who has been our timekeeper and doing a fantastic job at that. She's passed that over to Kim, who's going to take on that role. So thank you. Hit the bell. And you've all been really good at listening, so thank you. Um, Elena is the Forest Campaign Coordinator with Friends of the Earth. Elena, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be sessioning um, some fantastic speakers on this topic um, for forest stewardship um, and multiple values. So this refers to the practice of managing forests in a way that balances and optimises a range of ecological, economic, social and cultural values. And this approach recognises that forests have various critical functions and can provide numerous benefits for biodiversity conservation, water resource protection, carbon sequestration, recreation and so on, to name a few. Um, so I'd love to introduce our first speaker today. How do I press this thing? Oh, there we go. Um, Melissa Wood, who is the chair of the Victorian Environmental Assessment Council. Um, she has an incredible resume, which I have summarised in a few sentences. Um, she's been working for 30 years, um, leading and providing scientific and strategic advice on food, land and water systems, sustainable development, resource and environmental management, agency and board governance, as well as public policy. And she has held executive positions with the Australian government and internationally. Um, this talk is about a new chapter for public land forests. So given this uh, announcement, now the values surrounding why we manage forests is going to shift, uh, hopefully for the better. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome you up, Lissa. Um, 
Uh, thanks, Elena. Uh, this is my clicker. Okay. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, and kudos to the Royal Society and the Alluvian Foundation for convening this gathering, hopefully the first of many to come. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the lessons that VIAC has learned over five decades or so looking at the conservation of public land in Victoria and um, forests um, with the view that we can take some of these lessons and apply it to the, the, this new situation that we find ourselves in very fortunately. Okay. So VIAC and its predecessors, the Land Conservation Council and the Environment Conservation Council, have played a really major role in our understanding and shaping the forest management across Victoria for the last 50 years. Um, VIAC is an independent body that provides strategic advice grounded in science with a 50-year history, as I said. It has significant convening power and has very strong and well networked with stakeholders. For decades, we've been providing independent advice um, on the use and the protection of the environment uh, to the minister. Oh, it's not working. Sorry. Why, why don't I just try that? Yeah, I'll put that away. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, and because, and you can see uh, a sentence from the VIAC Act there that really provides an, a nutshell explanation of what we do. And because we look to the future um, and because we can provide arm length um, independent advice from government, we can take on the really controversial issues. And we have definitely played a part in working on some of the most controversial decisions on public land that's happened in Victoria. Um, an example of that is the Grampians National Park. Um, lobbying began early last century. Uh, the LCC did some recommendations in the early 90s and lobbying, um, it ceased, logging was ceased in 1994. That's about an 80 year time period. Similarly with the Alpine Parks region, um, lobbying to make that a national park started in about 1949. VIAC investigated it in the early 70s. There were 14,000 public submissions to this particular investigation. I think, as Paul here, I think it's probably the most that VIAC's ever received. Um, and it became a single national park in 1989. And... Um, just to emphasise the long-term nature of our work, when the LCC was established in 1971, the then Minister for Lands, uh, William or Bill Borthwick, famously advised the council to make recommendations on the public lands as if for a thousand years. And then he sort of left us to it. So public land use has inherent conflict. And one of the core values of VIAC is to seek out diverse voices and to listen respectfully. The LCC grew out of an environmental conflict for the Little Desert National Park in the early 1960s. The government wanted to clear that area for wheat farms, 48, I think, um, and there was a lot of pushback to that. So rather than deal with that hot potato themselves, they decided to form a council of experts um, and get them to deal with it and provide recommendations for the government to act on. I think this is a really powerful slide because it illustrates the role and the impact of those recommendations that the LCC, ECC and VIAC have made in conserving our native ecosystems on public land. So on the left, you can see 1971, there was just over... 1% of native vegetation in national parks and wildlife reserves. I think there was only two categories back then. Um, and then on the right, you can see 2021, where there's more than 16% is being protected and in a much broader range of uh, protection land categories. 
That's about 36,000 kilometres squared, which is about the size of a small uh, country in Europe. So VIEC operates, um, it's not a black box, but there's there's a lot behind that, the, the veneer, but we apply multidisciplinary approaches and collaborative government uh, engagement. So it's really about integrating really strong science, the best science that we can get with community values um, and traditional owner biocultural assessments, and then putting that together and analysing it to provide advice and recommendations to the minister. And this integration of hard Western science, social science, economic science is, is really critical um, for doing complex analysis on complex problems. And we have multiple feedback loops that feed back into the decision-making process. Um, our work has really evolved over time to meet the changing needs of Victoria. And we're certainly not doing the things that we were doing back in 1971. Um, and this has even been evident in my time as chair of VIAC where we're working, we've really deepened our work with traditional owners um, and we've been focusing more on specific areas or themes rather than sort of big regional investigations. And we've also introduced a lens to our work and you can see that I've listed some of those here. These are things that we see are priorities for our work and are adding pressures on the things that we're investigating. Climate change, the biodiversity crisis, uh, traditional owner self-determination and recreation and the increasing pressures that recreation is putting on our public land. In terms of our approach, um, we not only look at the biological values you know, biodiversity threat status, status um, endangered veget ecological communities, but also we look at cultural heritage, we look at social and economic values, and we look at the threats to them. And then we look at what are the best land categories, land use categories that are commensurate with um, protecting those values and reducing those threats. Often we'll do an economic assessment to look at the economic implications of that as well. Our community engagement is fairly robust. We have formal advisory committees that are established. I'm sure many of you have been on those over time. There are public formal submissions, um, as I said, 14,000 for the Alpine area, 9,000 for the River Red Gum investigation that we did. And we also do a lot of direct consultations with community groups, industry groups, governments, local governments, environmental groups uh, as well. We've done at least 20 investigations that have included forest types. And I've just put some of the covers up there. The, all these reports are now available on our archives, which was completed last year during our 50th anniversary celebration. So all the reports and the, and the maps are there. These are some of the, a sample of the, some of the forest works that we've done. And you can see starting from the uh, mid seventies through to now. So what have we learned from all of that work in terms of forests and what, what can we pass on to this new process that's underway? Um, so a few of the issues I'm going to go through now are things that are pretty consistent across most of those um, investigations, and they are that um, they are varied. Um, it's very place specific. We heard that a lot during the morning session. Um, that the most controversial issue in, in all of them was where nature conservation vied with commercial timber harvesting um, around what the dominant land use was. And, and now we're in a very different situation. And I think it's really useful just to pause for a second and acknowledge that as we go forward. Um, the other thing we've learned is that recreation is now the dominant public land use. And, um, We've, we, we know that we've got 
just about zero data on on what is happening and and the trends in recreation land use and it's the only major public land use without statewide spatial data in which to base our decision making on so it's a real gap when it comes to making significant decisions around public land use when recreation is a big part of the picture and we have just very low levels of information. VIAC released a report earlier this year looking at the limitations of recreation land use and made some really good recommendations on how we can work to ameliorate that going forward. We also know that recreation uses are growing and changing. Um, COVID had a bit of an impact on that, but I think that it would have been happening anyway. And it's really likely that it's going to change even further with logging being removed um, and road maintenance probably less, amenity and safety might be increasing. There are a whole lot of things that we need to consider what those implications are. I also want to highlight a few examples of where things were um, quite specific. So in the River Red Gum area uh, investigation, protecting those forests was more than just recommending a high, high conservation land use category. There were significant management issues that also needed to be included in those recommendations. For example, in this case, ensuring um, available environmental water was there at levels um, that would be considered quite modest today. Um, phasing out grazing along um, some of those public land areas in the Barma forests and along river frontages. Back then, even introducing processes of co-management with traditional owners and recognising some of their practices to be used. And addressing recreational issues uh, like dispersed camping along river banks, um, duck hunting on significant wetlands, those sorts of things. Uh, the Melbourne district, we had, um, it's a closed water catchment, as you know, so the quality of the water is a really big issue and that had huge implications on logging and recreational use. The box ironbark central west forest, they were highly depleted forest systems and they had um, mining and recreational mineral extraction issues to deal with there and specific recommendations controlling the depth where those sorts of things could happen. And then in our recent forest assessments, we're finding that dealing with um, threatened species conservation is a much larger issue than previously, the Leadbetter's possum, greater glider, um, some of the species we heard about earlier today. So our First Nations people have had a really long time building an understanding of and caring for Australian landscapes and ecology. And they've embedded that specialist knowledge into their cultural practices. And we've heard a heap about that this morning, which was great. We have much to learn from them. Whoops, I've just done something. Keep my hands away. Um, there are a number of emerging efforts uh, around Victoria and around Australia, um, CSIRO, where I have a place as doing a lot of work in this as well, trying to meaningfully connect the Western science knowledge system with traditional owner First Nations biocultural knowledge with the aim to build more robust and more fit for purpose knowledge systems. And VIAC ourselves are... Um, exploring this in practice with the Tangarung Land and Water Corporation using the Central Highlands as a case study. It's very early days um, and we're using the VIAC assessments and the biocultural assessments and cultural land management assessments of the Tangarung to identify areas where there are issues and obstacles, but also look at areas where we have alignment um, and where we can develop appropriate language to take this forward. We're, we're looking for bridging opportunities. We're looking for where there's sort of like-for-like like things in both systems as, a, as an entry point. Um, a few are coming up, which is great. There's also a lot of complexity in this, and I'm finding it quite disruptive because it's really in a positive way, um, moving my thinking on from where from where my original training was. Um, 
But one example of this is Western science has acknowledged that our single disciplinary empirical based um, work for problem solving just isn't cutting it and we need to do much more multidisciplinary system analysis work to deal with our problems. And that aligns really nicely with the socio-ecological adaptive systems of traditional owners. So that's one area where we've sort of identified that we're in agreement or we've got, not in agreement, we're, we've got a common understanding that this is a really powerful way to approach our problems. So I think we're in a really exciting place. Goodness, that's gone quick. Um, these are some of the challenges I think we need to look at as we go forward. Uh, there are many, but I've just put a few up here. We've got outdated public land categories for our forests, instruments of government obligations that really need to shift. I think that's pretty well understood, but it's going to be tough and it's going to take time. But they no longer reflect our values and what, what we want to use these forests for. There's a lack of understanding and agreement among experts, scientists, plenty of us in the room, but also communities as well about how, what forest management is, should look like in the future. Um, I think the fact that we're even talking about it today is a really positive step and we need to do much more of this coming together, putting our issues and concerns on the table and discussing them before we could move on. And then, of course, there's the backdrop of climate change impacts and building um, forest resilience capabilities uh, uh, to deal with those. Whoops. Oh, no. And then we have the opportunities. Um, we have an opportunity to design new land categories that better fit um, what we want across the forest estate, including traditional owner planning, management through the cultural reserves and, and, and other land tenures possibly. The current public land reform which is underway at the moment was the result of a recommendation in the 2017 statewide assessment that the VIAC did and we're really looking forward to that being developed because I think that's going to be really critical for this next chapter. We also have an opportunity to be informed by some of the transition work that's happening already because it includes community engagement work around what the desired futures for these regions and forests are, and we can really leverage off that. There's an opportunity to also build community understanding and participation in forest management. I think the traditional owners can really show us the way here, and we've heard a lot this morning about what it, gonna, what it could look like to have people in the forest, actively managing them. We have an opportunity to support traditional owner self-determination um, by realising the cultural landscape strategies and fire strategies and game strategies um, and also traditional owner country plans. And we have an opportunity to co-design this new future together based on a shared understanding about biodiversity conservation, but also what are the other values, tourism, recreation, those sorts of things. So this is my last slide. Um, I think we need to put all of these issues, as I said, on the table. Um, we've got some good perspectives in the room, not everybody. Maybe next time we can get more people here and have a, even more robust conversations. But I wanted to end with a few big questions we collectively need to answer together. What a healthy forest look like? And it so happens we had some presentations this morning that helped us with that question. It's something that we've been thinking about, not only in VIAC, but also in the eminent panel. What are our multiple values and what do we aspire to for our future, for our forests in the future? Acknowledging this is going to be very place-based and forest type dependent. What knowledge systems do we need? Um, in some other work that I do, we use a lot of foresight and scenario analysis to help us understand some of these questions. And in VIAC, we've just started to talk about whether we could imagine a few scenarios where various things take place, fire management, different uses, see what that future could look like, um, explore that. And if we don't like it, we can 
put obstacles in place, look at a different trajectory. If we do like it, we can see what is it we need to do to get there. The other question is how can Victoria support this and what processes do we need to answer these questions and to go forward? How can we support self-determination and the traditional owners to accept their rights, privileges and practice cultural values. No one's really mentioned this, but how can we fund the real management costs and implement the categories and the tenures and the management and, and the uses that we desire? Um, options for sustainable level of funding are going to be really critical to ensure that the, that level of management that we need is going to take place. Yeah, and finally, um, I guess it's a challenge to all of us, you know, can we go forward and together create and care for a healthy forest that will be there in a thousand years? Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to acknowledge that our next speaker was unable to attend today, uh, Marjorie Thorpe or Margie, and I just want to um, take a moment to acknowledge her longstanding work and contributions to uh, protecting country um, for forests and fire. And, yeah, it's a shame that she couldn't be here today, but unfortunately she's unwell. So um, our next speaker um, is Rod Keenan. Um, I'll just introduce you. Um, yeah, Rod is a forest ecologist um, with a PhD, of course, and his research interests are in forest and climate change, forest ecosystem services, and forest and environmental policy. Rod has worked as a research scientist and science advisor in a number of Australian states and with the Australian government as an advisor on forest and climate change, and he currently works at the University of Melbourne. Um, today, his talk is about how it's time to work together to care for Victoria's forests. So welcome, Rod. Thanks, Alana, and, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, a few uh, consistent themes, I guess, uh, with Melissa, but uh, in acknowledging the traditional owners, yeah, I'd really like to um, thank them for the the um, wisdom and the ge generosity that they've shown me in uh, in sharing their knowledge, and uh, I um, sympathise with a lot of their um, pain and disappointment. The outcome of the recent referendum. So, uh, as Alana said, I was associated with the university, but I'm a little um, kind of uncomfortable about being here. I retired uh, about six months ago, and. Um, I envisaged that I'd be, you know, kind of uh, boating down the river with the Maribyrnong River with Ian, or uh, maybe spending a lot of time, more time walking in the forest rather than being in rooms talking about them. Um, but uh, I'm also a little uncomfortable because there are voices that have been excluded from this discussion, and uh, I think if we're going to have a genuine discussion and dialogue about the future of Victorian forests, then we need to include all those voices. So one of those voices, uh, I'm here today representing um, Forestry Australia, and uh, let's just see where we are. Forestry Australia is a professional organisation. It's uh, 1,200 members from across Australia, uh, professionals and forest growers who work in all different types of forests, native production forests, conservation forests, plantations, farm forests, and um, also a lot of other aspects of natural resource management. So our president is uh, Michelle Freeman, and um, I think she would have been an eminently worthy presenter at, at this event. Um, I also noticed that a lot of the speakers are mostly old white blokes like me, and uh, I think we could have a lot more diverse voices in this discussion. So where are the young, female, ethnically diverse, researchers who have worked studying Victorian forests? Um, where are the early career scientists? Where are the social scientists? Where are all the people who work in the bush who are in there every day and have that local understanding that La Uncle Larry talked about? Where are the industry whose livelihoods are actually dependent on these decisions? So um, I've talked a little bit about Forestry Australia. I'm not here to defend or... Uh, uh, 
defend past uh, practices. Many of those practices have changed in response to both new knowledge and also public pressure. And there's been many constraints to change, changing practices, and I'll talk a bit about those things. Forestry Australia doesn't support the government's decision. We don't believe it was based on sound evidence or good process. It was done without consultation with many of the affected parties and without consultation with the traditional owners. It's their interests that are central to this and it's their land, their forests. So we've had a number of, um, a, a recent conference of Forestry Australia, 500 members gathered uh, in Queensland. Uh, we had a very diverse program. It's fantastic to see uh, a number of in, um, the leadership and involvement of many Indigenous people in those discussions, people from across uh, many different aspects of forest management, plantations, farm forestry, and many others. So, um, yeah, we're meeting here at the Royal Society, and I think uh, sort of ironic or perhaps uh, symbolic that uh, it was the takeoff point for the Burke and Wills exploration of Central Australia. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I guess, analogous. We're embarking on a journey, if you like, about what we do with the future of, uh, of Victoria's forest. So we all know how this journey ended up, uh, but really they were carrying too much baggage. Uh, they had limited experience. Their goals weren't really very clear. Vague goal of reaching somewhere up north, uh, northern Australia. And uh, to a large part, they ignored Indigenous knowledge. So they ended up starving, a bunch of them, uh, in a landscape where people had been living and thriving for thousands of years. So maybe there are some lessons in our journey um, as we go through this talk. So Ian asked me to give a few definitions, and I'll, I'll talk briefly through these. Uh, firstly, forests. What are they? Well, the word actually didn't have anything to do with trees initially. Um, it really meant outside or the land outside the settled areas. Uh, and uh, it was a place where, where, which was off limits or excluded. And, uh, you know, in Spanish, uh, and forestero isn't um, a forester, it's actually a stranger. So it's someone from outside the local area. Uh, in Latin, attractive land um, covered with trees is called a silva, and that's the origin of our term silver culture. So these outside areas gradually got taken over by the medieval royal families where they ex enjoyed exclusive hunting rights. But many of those areas actually, like our um, traditional owners here, um, contained traditional users of those lands that they were often cultivated, had very few trees. And the early foresters were actually gamekeepers who um, excluded a lot of those traditional uses. So in more recent times, we're defining forests according to more structural characteristics, uh, an ecosystem that's uh, dominated by trees, but in consists of many other um, plants and animals. Uh, but these are the FAO definitions. It uh, includes natural and planted forests, intensively managed forest plantations and uh, in the FAO definition, it, it excludes land that's under agricultural or urban uses. Um, so the Australian definition is slightly different to that. It won't go into it. But I also want to recognise that trees outside forests are, are very important for many different values. So there's lots of farmland with trees in them, and those trees are very important for conservation and on-farm benefits. Forestry is a... Um, uh, is defined in a broad sense. It's not just cutting down trees. It's the science and craft of creating and managing, conserving forests and using and caring for our forests. So silviculture is a practice within forestry which applies ecological principles um, to a stand of trees to help meet specified objectives. So there are objectives that can include income, wildlife, habitat, water quality, recreation, or any other values. So we've had some uh, presentation on different values. There's a whole range of um, things that we care about and want from our forests, uh, starting with social and cultural values, particularly those of traditional owners, biodiversity, livelihoods, economic um, timber and non-timber uses, and many other environmental benefits and services. 
So we haven't really had an overview of Victorian forests so far, but there's 8.2 million across Victoria. About 45% of those are now in uh, national parks or conservation reserves, uh, and about uh, 3.16 million are in multiple-use state forests, about 4% of which was actually potentially available and suitable for harvesting. Uh, one Just over a million hectares is privately owned, um, and we've got Australia's largest plantation area, uh, just over 400,000 hectares. So when we're talking about the future of Victorian forests, what forests we're actually talking about? Are we talking about the whole 8 million? Are we talking about the areas in state forest, as, um, as Ian mentioned? Are we talking about the relatively small area that's been subject to timber harvesting? Uh, over the last 30 years, it's probably been about 150,000 hectares. Are we talking about the area that may have been harvested in the next 10 years, perhaps 30,000 hectares? So that's um, that area that has been harvested or, or that would be is about 4% of the state forest area or 2% of the total area. So for over 95% of the area of forest, not much is going to change unless we decide to do things differently. Uh, just a bit on wood supply. Uh, we extract about 8 million um, cubic metres of wood from Victorian forests. Uh, about half of that comes from softwood plantations, half from uh, hard, about 2.7 million from hardwood plantations and a smaller amount from our native forests, which has been declining over the last 20 years. So um, you can see there that the area that's coming from hardwood plantations is declining. Uh, it reached a peak in about 2016, 2017. And a lot of that hardwood plantation estate is actually uh, now being converted from plantation back to agriculture. So people who talk about plantations as a solution to our wood supply problems uh, need to recognise that there are some real challenges there. Current estate is going backwards, and we haven't really figured out a way to drive investment into new plantations. So what are our policy goals? We've got the National Forest Policy Statement, which was... Um, agreed to by all states and territories, 1992. Relatively straightforward goal to integrate commercial and non-commercial values so that both the material and non-material welfare of the society is improved. While we ensure that the values of forests, both as a resource for commercial use and for conservation are not lost or degraded. The, uh, we skip ahead 10 years, the Victorian Our Forest, Our Future statement laid it out this way to achieve in state forests open to commercial timber harvesting, sustainable forests, community confidence in forest management, sustainable timber industry and sustainable re regional communities. So what kind of structure did we end up to try and achieve that? Well, this is our forest management system you know, as of uh, last year. So if you can make sense of all of this, good luck. Um, but sitting within all of this is uh, an organisation called Vic Forest, who seem to have been associated with much, many of the problems that people have identified. Uh, some would regard them as driving this process, but I regard it more like um, they're a spider, or, sorry, a, uh, a bug that's been caught in a spider's web where they're, they're just kind of tangled up with all of this legislation. There's 12 different acts or regulatory instruments that covered um, what happens in our forests. We've got um, a highly siloed and um, divided functions for different organisations. Uh, parks uh, manage the conservation estate. We've got a, a different fire management organisation, Vix Forest Managing Timber Production. Um, and we have um, uh, a range of other organisations that, that are responsible for different purposes like water. So Vic Forest was really developed in a period where we had this kind of overarching, bigger uh, ideology or policy agenda, a very powerful policy agenda, informed not by sustainability, but by neoliberal political ideology and belief that uh, really forced the organisation into making a profit, even though many have pointed to the fact that profit, the profit motive is the problem that we're actually confronting here. 
So as part of that system, we've had a range of different indicators reported through the State of the Forest Report on sustainability. So we've seen a number of areas improving. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, we've got uh, a number of indicators that are declining. And we have a whole lot of areas, as Melissa pointed out, that we've got very little information on. So we're not really sure what's happening. But I'll just point to a couple of those different things. Uh, we've got increased areas of forest in protected areas, and we've got declining forest dependent species uh, and increasing threats of climate change, fire, feral animals and weeds. So a lot of those challenges or issues extend right across the different 10 years that forest exists on, and we've got to try and address those things, uh, you know, th those declining indicators in those different circumstances. So for all of that, forests have ended up being places of conflict. We've got um, conflict between individuals and their challenges. We've got conflict between different levels of government and, and, and the governance challenges we have. And we've got conflict between institutions over how things should be done. So um, where do we go? One of the uh, kind of benefits, I guess, of having um, lived so long or worked so long in this area is that you end up with an extensive library. So I started pulling out a few of my old books off the bookshelf and I came across this one that um, David, who spoke earlier, and his colleague, Jerry Franklin, co-authored about 20 years ago. And uh, I think this quote from Jerry in one of his chapters in the book was very episode. Stakeholders and politicians, all of us here, and from what I've heard today, um, many of the speakers are continuing to fight the battles of the past, pres preservation versus exploitation. By continuing on these old issues, we fail to recognise the changes that are occurring in our forests and the fundamental relationships we have with native forests, including the hu human stewardship necessary to ensure the con con continued health functioning of these forests. But Jerry um, had a view that he didn't believe that division of temperate forests into fibre farms and reserve was likely to achieve the goals we wanted as a society. And the passive approaches to management for many of our native forests um, and depending on nature to do the job, as many might argue, uh, will lead to unacceptable outcomes. So Jerry was actively promoting um, active forest management. Uh, so the things he mentioned in that paper were reducing fuels, fire and mechanical treatments, protecting resilient older trees, um, responding to environmental change. And you know, I've added assisted migration there through my um, experience in climate change adaptation, managing in insect pests and diseases and treating young forest stands to accelerate growth towards later successional stages. So Jerry's not been the only voice arguing for this kind of thing. If you read uh, the recent book by Bill Gamage and, and Bruce Pascoe, Bill, uh, sorry, Bruce is arguing that, um, and I went out to look at uh, what he was doing on his property near Wallagrau, and uh, he was arguing that if we burnt judiciously and created a more open forest, fewer, bigger trees we could get sunlight to the forest for and bring back those old Aboriginal crops. So thinning is his own forest is aiming to provide him with an income, reduce the forest down to you know, about um, 30 trees per hectare that would be those larger, older trees that would dominate the forest system into the future. And I guess uh, Bruce was speculating what we might do if we applied this more widely across the landscape. Similarly, um, David Holmgren, um, in his uh, recent paper on bushfire resilient fire care was arguing for similar approaches, extending indigenous cultural burning, more animals, more in the forest, more native pastures, silver pastoral systems, uh, treating fuels mechanically, rehydrating the landscape through a range of different processes, and using ecologically sensitive thinning and use of wood products for energy, biochar, and local building products. So a more recent Indigenous initiative in, in this area is uh, the development of the forest gardening strategy by the Jajarung people, um, the Jara organisation. So they've tried to present this concept of forest gardening to represent their philosophy and practice of managing their landscapes. 
So much of that country in the, um, the region around Ballarat, Bendigo, um, and down to the Murray River is in an overstocked condition from many of the practices that have been deployed in the past, including uh, intensive timber harvesting. Uh, and they're arguing that that can be restored through a process of thinning, reintroducing cultural fire. So they're starting to test that and uh, apply it in the landscape with the aim of reproducing for them what are culturally recognisable forests with abundant plants and animals, um, country that's suited for the habitat. Some of the air icon species, kangaroo, ding dingo, emus and, 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 and their plant species. So this is not something that's just been cooked up in Australia. In the US, the systems are, these systems have been introduced at a much larger scale through a process called forest landscape restoration. So we talked about suppression earlier today. The US has been very good at suppressing fires over the last 100 years or so. The problem was that the 1% of fires that got away were starting to burn bigger and bigger areas. So they realised that about 15 years ago that they had to change what they were doing. So they've reintroduced this process. Um, people coming together, they've been able to build constructive dialogues between previously warring parties to identify problems, degradation causes in their area and finding solutions that can bring back a balanced mix of goods and services. So um, the US Forest Service and others are investing billions of dollars in treating very large areas through these kinds of processes. And they're seeing that uh, the results giving a structure that leads to greater plant diversity. So Jerry, in, in more recent um, statements, has, uh, hasn't really changed his mind about this. In fact, he's um, doubled down to some extent, and he says sometimes we need open areas in forest if we're going to maximise diversity in our forested landscapes. Sometimes bushes are better than trees, and sometimes logging is the best route to a species-rich landscape. So we've got opportunities to extend thinning more widely. The key challenges are how we decide where it's going to happen, testing it at a scale, investing in monitoring, adapting and improving the practice, and then how we actually fund it because it's not going to be fully commercial. And I don't think the public really wants it to be a fully commercial practice. We need to build public support and address concerns that this is going to be about commercial drivers rather than forest health. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this bit but about carbon, but really my argument is that uh, we, we've seen a substantial reduction in timber production in native forest, with the red line showing relatively little impact in a very highly fluctuating uh, natural forest situation. So if we're going to invest in uh, carbon outcomes in our forests, we're much better to invest in establishing new forest areas in, uh, in currently unforested landscapes where we can actually improve timber outcomes, biodiversity and farm trees. So who decides and how? We've got, uh, yeah, and, and these are some of the discussions we've had, holistic policy goals, um, and this has come out of our work on adaptation, but the key is to get all those different views and voices in the room because everyone sees this problem quite differently. And it's by bringing together that set of different views able to get the emergent solutions out of um, that we might have to many of our problems. As Neil Byron said in a lecture a while ago, um, that uh, many of our these challenges aren't conducive to black letter law, and we need to be focusing more on the indigenous concept of law, of knowledge and learning by doing. We need new partnerships uh, between those previously warring and arguing bodies, new tenure arrangements, um, more local control so that we're devolving the decisions down to the people who are most directly affected by those decisions. We want more people on country doing things on country and getting to know the landscape in their communities. So one of the opportunities to do this is through um, developing new types of industries, but we're only going to do that if we actually develop a positive vision for forests in Victoria. 
all we've got at the moment is a negative view of, of our policy arrangements. There's no incentive for anyone who wants to come and invest in forests in Victoria to actually do so because they can probably consider that they're going to walk into a snake pit where um, if they put up a proposal, someone's going to oppose it. So we can have more high value, innovative structural and, and appearance products being generated from things like native forest thinning, plantation forests and, and farm forests. But the investors will need a clear policy framework, public and policy political support. Um, they'll need clear markets and a cash flow associated with that investment. And they need a sufficient return that's going to match the risks. So we're, in that process, we're going to need the capacity of the forestry professionals, all of those people who worked in Vic Forest, people who worked in other organisations, to support these new industries and protect and enhance the value of Victorian forests. So future prospects, we need to decide where we're going. We need to understand the landscape that we're going into. We need to embrace the uncertainty associated with that landscape and that the environment's going to present to us. Uh, we can enhance the diversity of thinking, species, investors, and keep our management options open, except that we can't save everything and the species and populations are going to fluctuate and change. We want new governance models embracing First Nations and local communities. And we want a comprehensive monitoring, inclusive landscape level experiments and assessments at multiple scales. We want more forward looking projections that can be used to help decision making. But ultimately, we want to be living in learning landscapes where people are working together to overcome the challenges through integrated land management. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rod. Um, uh, our final speaker for the session today is adjunct Professor William Jack Jackson. Yep, uh, there you are. Um, Jack William has a career spanning over four decades. Uh, he's directly managed forests, including as a field forester and director of national parks for Victoria has worked on global conservation and forest policy as head of forest conservation and deputy director general for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, as well as providing advice to the Victorian government agencies on forest management. This talk will reflect on how the management of Victoria's forests can contribute to international targets and policies on forests and vice versa. So welcome, Dr. William, take it away. Thank you. I've set myself the challenge to see how many devices I can use in one go as an old white guy. So uh, we'll see if I mess it up. Um, a big thank you to the organisers. It's really great to be here and see some of uh, old prints and make some new ones. Um, during my time as uh, Chief Executive of Parks Victoria, I had the privilege of working with quite a few traditional owner groups right across Victoria on a, a range of years issues in an exciting era when government was very keen on handing over responsibility. We did have an informal target of, um, by now, 80% of Victoria's national parks would be under co-management. We haven't quite, quite got there. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners in forested areas in Victoria and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, Melissa, asked the question, and I think some earlier speakers did, about what is forest health, a very contested area. Uh, but I recall many years ago, uh, I was visiting a forest on the border between the United States and Canada uh, in the east with a, a group of um, foresters and uh, traditional owners, the Mohawk people, and the foresters said they had 109 indicators of forest health. And I, I asked the chief uh, what did he consider was a good forest health and his response was the number of people that come out smiling. Um, so th maybe there's something for, there for us, us to uh, learn. I Ian asked me to sp speak about an international perspective. Uh, very difficult to do that in uh, in 20 mi minutes. Um, particularly, um, is um, that there's just so much that's happening internationally and has been happening for the last 
20, 30 years on international forest policy and international institutions that are relevant to forests in general, uh, and parts of that are very relevant to forests in Victoria. Uh, you might be surprised at the sheer number of, uh, of in, in institutional arrangements, institutions and processes. Um, these include, and I'm just not very good at making PowerPoint slides, but they um, at the big level, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and I'll talk about both of those, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, there's, uh, there's two scientific bodies that go with that, the Inter Intergovernmental um, Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a big mouthful, uh, known as IPBES. And there's also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, in addition to that, there's many, many processes such as the UN Decade on Restoration. Um, there's the United Nations Forum on Forests and there's a number of other conventions that are relevant to what Victoria does. There's also work uh, on forests by UN uh, intergovernmental and non-governmental organisations. And I know some of you uh, represent non-government organisations here. Uh, they often have uh, international counterparts. And forest processes, Rod mentioned one, forest landscape restoration, um, but there's also a thing called Global Forest Watch, uh, the Montreal Protocol, and a, a range of certification processes. Some of them are primarily about forest industry, but there's also things like the IUCN Green List on Protected Areas. Um, so I don't have time to cover all of those. I just wanted to, you to get a flavour that there's many, many of them. So I've chosen just a few that I think are probably most relevant uh, that you can consider when you're thinking about the future of that 1.8 million hectares of Victoria's forest, or perhaps uh, the entire uh, set of Victoria's forest, because uh, in my view, we shouldn't be compartmentalising forests. We should look uh, holistically all forest, all forest type, all forest area. Uh, there's no point dividing it up under tenures. Um, so according to the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it best, um, and the IPCC, that two of the most pressing challenges are climate change and biodiversity. No surprise, perhaps, to all of you in this room. But an important finding of those two international science groups is that these two things need to be dealt with in an interconnected manner. Um, and that's, and we've heard from speakers, scientists this morning, not an easy thing to do because it's very complex. Uh, forests are very complex, not just biophysically, but also sociologically. Um, and the, the um, IPES and IPCC note that the nature of complex systems is that they have unexpected outcomes. And they also have things called thresholds. If you go beyond the threshold, uh, the situation will change sometimes permanently. Um, but also the individual parts of a complex system can't be managed in isolation from the other parts. That to me is a critical thing for you to be thinking about for the future of Victoria's forests. So we can't just manage on a species by species basis. As important as managing threatened species is, there's many other things that we have to consider as we go through. So the, the problem with those two, the intertwined challenges, is they reduce the capacity of, uh, of nature, uh, including forests, to generate um, ecosystem services. So from an a, a economic and social point of view, those services are critical to our future and they provide for human well-being. And so first message that I really want to get across is whatever you do going forward, you need to do it in an interconnected manner. Um, I, I think currently in Victoria, that's not the case. It's being dealt with separately in ter terms of jurisdictions and in terms of issues, um, in terms of engagements. Yep. So the first big, big uh, area really brought on the international agenda is a thing called the uh, United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, that has a 
focus on climate change. It has a focus on biodiversity loss, and it also has a focus on human well-being. The three key issues, um, and the, within that uh, framework, they have a uh, seventeen sustainable development goals or SDGs, as they're generally referred to. And there's two that I think are worth mentioning in this arena. First is uh, goal number 13, which calls for urgent action on climate change. And the second is goal 15, to protect, restore and promote sustainable, sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, uh, sustainable managers forests, to combat desertification and halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss. So the extent that forest management in Victoria can contribute to those two goals depends on how effective actions are towards mitigating climate change in relation to forest and in terms of how well you can protect biodiversity. And within that, whether you can manage trade-offs and avoid um, those negative trade-offs um, with those management decisions. So the, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate change includes three elements, the convention itself, a thing called the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol. And the objective of those three agreements is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, that to um, avoid dangerous human interference with the climate system. And within a time frame that allows ecosystems to adapt naturally and ensures sustainable development. Key words there, adapt naturally. Um, the UNFCC is relevant to the three big challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, human well-being. Um, and that, that the Paris Agreement includes a, a number of key things, some more relevant than others to you, a long-term long temperature goal to limit global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius increase. Um, currently, Victoria has experienced 1.2 degrees since the Industrial Revolution. So we're well on the way to two degrees and probably globally well on the way past two degrees. Um, they have a thing called global peaking for greenhouse gases, um, work on mitigation, a uh, thing called sinks and reservoirs, which they also include specifically forests in that, and uh, adaptation to strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability. So as we've heard this morning, Victoria's forests have a critical role to play uh, in climate mitigation uh, and in um, it, the management of those will determine how well those forests can adapt to climate change. Um, one of the key things that needs to be considered in that is the interaction between climate change and the fire regime. So climate change is probably exacerbate, exacerbating uh, large-scale uh, catastrophic, catastrophic landscape fires. Catastrophic landscape fires are contributing to climate change. So we, we get a self-reinforcing cycle. The, the IPCC notes that in the long term, a sustainable forest management strategy um, aims some, at maintaining increased forest carbon stocks while producing an, an annual sustained yield of timber, fiber or energy from the forest will generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit. Probably a very contested statement. It's not my statement, it's the IPCC statement, uh, but it is something worth looking at. And I think Rod mentioned that is you know, what do you need to do with forest if you want to um, generate the largest mitigation effort and how do you do that without causing uh, loss of biodiversity is, is a very difficult uh, area that needs to be looked at. And I'm probably coming to that in a second. So what's clear is um, the role of Victoria's forests in climate change and adaptation, adaptation needs to be guided by evidence and particularly in the climate arena, uh, misinformation, selective use of data, inappropriate extrapolation of evidence from local scale to landscape and beyond um, is confusing policymakers and the public. And confused politicians results in confused policy. 
or absence of policy. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that at the end of my talk, but I think it is a big challenge to make sure that the evidence that you're using is, is uh, contestable, but it's also the best available. So moving from climate change to the biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity um, also is relevant to the three issues, climate change, biodiversity, human well-being. Um, and they uh, last year they approved um, a thing called the Kunming Montreal Global Biode Biodiversity Framework. Uh, this framework probably provides you with a, quite a useful guidance on the sort of things you need to consider in future forest management in Victoria. It's got uh, four long-term goals. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention two of them and uh, that I think are the, of the greatest relevance. The, the first one, oop, where did I get to? Goal A, we better go back to A. Goal A is about the integrity and connecti connectivity. Uh, it's also, um, uh, it's about uh, threatened species and about genetic diversity. And all three of these sub goals are relevant to forest management. We've heard quite a bit today about uh, a little bit about connectivity and resilience. We've heard quite a lot about species. We haven't heard so much about genetics, but it is of critical importance, particularly as forests become more and more fragmented or more and more exposed to climate change. Uh, we, we need and particular species declining. Uh, there are challenges with genetic diversity. Goal B is about uh, biodiversity being sustainably used and managed, um, and again, including its contribution to human well-being. And they talk about ecosystem functions and ecosystem services in that goal. Um, the and the role that those functions and services play in uh, sustainable development. And I think that goal B in particular raises some interesting questions for you. Which ecosystem functions and services are you seeking to maintain and enhance? Not clear to me. How are those functions and services valued? Not clear. Who will benefit or lose and to what extent from the changes in these functions? Somebody will lose, somebody will benefit. Who are those people? Where, where do they live? Do urban populations benefit at the cost of regional Victoria? Do regional people benefit at the cost of urban? These things in a political process all need to be thought through. Um, within that, um, those big goals of the CBD, um, there's a number of targets, and I'll just mention a couple of them quickly. Target two is 30% uh, of areas degraded uh, terrestrial, inland, water and marine are under effective restoration. And... Um, Victoria can contribute to that target, I think, um, restoration along with silviculture and prescribed fire, invasive species management are, are key tools. And um, there's an international process on what's called forest landscape restoration. I think that can also perhaps, uh, some of the things in there might be useful for you and your considerations. Um, one of the interesting things about I find about forest landscape re restoration, it talks about balancing um, ecosystem, ecological functioning and human well-being. Um, and whoop, there's one interpretation, not my interpretation, I borrowed it, but about those interrelationships between those things. And I think um, here that understanding that ecological functionality, which includes biodiversity, but also processes, uh, influences what sort and how much the flow of ecosystem services are. And in turn, that has benefits or not for people. Uh, and then people in the bottom have responses. And here today, we've been talking about responses. So if you want to optimize the flow of certain ecosystem services, you need to understand how different forest management re regimes will affect that. Um, in the um, in the case of Victoria, I think you're witnessing major shifts in uh, a natural disaster regime, in particular fire. And it, uh, recently, I heard that over 4.9 million hectares of Victoria's forest have burnt in the last 20 years. You've only got 8 million hectares of forest, so it, you know that that sort of 
learning regime can, cannot be sustained. I think it's a, it's a call for a major rethink about how those forests are managed, and we heard that from several speakers already today. I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, the so some of the I think we've heard people talk about management in for interventions, but some uh, may be necessary to have adaptive and active forest management more thought through. We need to address historical legacies. There's uh, land clearing, uh, the impact of, of forest operations. Uh, reduction in hollow bearing trees, for example, uh, in disruption of indigenous fire regimes. Um, need to deal with invasive species across the landscape and improve connectivity and identify a critical refugia area for things like mountain ash, alpine ash that might get squeezed uh, into uh, tighter and tighter areas because of climate change. Um, there's also opportunities for re-establishing degraded forest, reintroducing species, um, and perhaps uh, applying silver cultural options that create uh, hollows for trees uh, earlier than they would naturally. Um, work of Patrick Baker comes to mind there. And um, recognising that some interventions undoubtedly are going to be controversial. Not sure where I got to. I'm going to come back, keep going on that. I'd jump over it because I heard the bell. Um, they, one thing I will say, the third target is about 30% of terrestrial areas should be under protection. Um, Victoria is, uh, is not there yet. Um, the, uh, you, I think if you, depends on where your measurement is, pre-1750, you're about 18% of forest is protected. It looks pretty good if it's post-1750, it's about 45 or something percent of Victoria, but it's... Um, but I do want to say that simply, that's a minimum target the CBD has, simply pay, placing forest into the protected area system is not a guarantee of effective management. And I say that as a previous director of National Parks for Victoria. <laughs> it, unless, unless those agencies that manage got the authority, the resources, the social licence, they they are unable to manage forest effectively, and th at the moment I think, as Rod has said, also there's there's a lack of shared vision. There's there's not a strong social license for a lot of things. Uh, even if you manage parks, uh, dealing with invasive species is often extremely controversial, uh, very difficult to do, and uh, it means we have sub suboptimal management approaches. Uh, because you spend a lot of time getting approvals and dealing with the public rather than dealing with the issues. Um, uh, there's um, there's uh, certainly opportunities, I think, that um, to improve the system. You know, we've heard these already today, recognising all forest values, not just focusing on one or two, but everything a forest can, can uh, provide and uh, having... Um, agreement on what you're trying to do with them. I think there's an important opportunity to promote uh, traditional owner responsibility and worldviews to manage those forests. Um, obviously, you need to um, to address uh, 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 climate change. Um, just going to go ahead a little bit. Yeah, I wasn't bothered. <laughs> They, um, I, I do want to just say something. Michael Sean Fletcher and his team have done some interesting work recently and published on fire regimes. Um, so we heard from two people this morning about fire regimes. Uh, you know, I think what Michael has uh, and his team have put out really quite interesting and challenging uh, that Aboriginal communities did used to burn quite a lot. Uh, but I don't think Michael had in or his team said they burnt wet forests. Uh, so I think Chris is quite right that uh, these things are complex and there were different things in different places. And uh, it's that's why I think it's very important not to not to extrapolate uh, one bit of research to across the whole estate. Uh, we need to understand what that research findings relates to. Um, and um, I, I do know um, 
in, in terms of traditional owners, the Victorian traditional owner corporations recently called for traditional owners to be enabled, empowered and resourced to apply cultural knowledge to the management of forested country, a, a view that I would strongly, um, strongly support. I thought my speech was only going to be 18 minutes, but obviously I talk too much. Um, I, I think that, you know, there is opportunity for ad adaptive and active uh, forest management. Um, some of that might be contested, but there's also an opportunity that, um, as we've heard, matching Western science with Indigenous knowledge, I think that's a critical issue, uh, to inform policy and to help broader society understand uh, what are you trading off when you're making these decisions about um, forest management. Lastly, um, in my experience, I think reliance on people's opinions and listening to views that generate mistrust in scientific evidence can lead to policy and management decisions that are suboptimal and generally deliver perverse outcomes for the state and for Australia. Um, they also can undermine efforts to conserve biodiversity, address climate change and, and meet uh, social needs. So I encourage you in this for and when you go forward is to apply critical thinking, challenge the evidence for sure, uh, but also actively listen to what people have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, William, for that fantastic talk. Um, we're going to open up now to questions from the audience to the panel. So if I can get uh, Melissa and Rod and William to come up to the front, feel free to grab a glass of water as well after all that chit chat. Thank you. Yeah, great. No worries. I think that's a clean one. Thank you. Yeah. Is there water in the bottle? Like managing UN meeting. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, this is more a comment than a question. Just in relation to last appeal to apply critical thought. Oh, it's hiding behind <laughs> I'm I'm feeling intimidated by questioning after that comment, Bill. And um, I don't think that's your intention. But you are advocating certain research that has been questioned, legitimately on the evidence. And I think. It's really tricky in this space to have that conversation when we have a, a blanket, apply critical thought, but it's unhelpful if we're critical because that confuses the politicians. Yeah, I don't think I, I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, by critical thinking, I meant that you, you sh uh, science is based on being able to challenge evidence. That's what I meant by critical thinking. I didn't mean to be critical of people uh, or of individual scientific research. But, you know, um, science benefits from that challenging, particularly from peer review. Uh, but it also benefits from the public challenging uh, those things. And yeah, that, that's what I meant, uh, listening to what people have to say, but also understanding that, um, that the you know, evidence, as we've probably seen recently with the COVID epidemic, the evidence shifts as knowledge is generated. And as the evidence shifts, then you need to adapt. Um, and science wouldn't be science if we couldn't put up with being critiqued. That's the whole point of it. Um, and and I'm sure the scientists here, that, that's how they work. That's how they they get the, the, the confirmation of their information. So that, that's what I was suggesting, being, being critical in reflection, not just simply accepting uh, what, what you hear or what you read as being fact. Can I just say something on that too? Yeah, because there is a lot of contested evidence, you know, evidence or contested um, information being put forward uh, today. You know, I could have taken you know a different view on on many of the, the statements that we heard, uh, but I think I've been in, involved in a number of processes where we have had to provide a scientific view on a contested issue to policymakers and the, the role that I worked in in. Uh, uh, in the federal government, and um, you know, I think the best thing we can do in that sort of process is to 
get all of you together, the scientists together in the room, to go through and indicate what we can agree on, what we know, that, that we all understand and we can agree on, where the, the dispute is and, uh, and, and what you might do about that. And I think that's the best way to inform uh, the political process rather than saying this this view is right or that view is that view is wrong. So um, because there's elements of truth in most of what's being put forward. Thanks um, for the suite of really interesting talks. Um, I was really excited to kind of hear um, a conversation around defining what healthy ecosystems looks like in, I guess, all three of your talks and thinking about actually getting back to, okay, what do we want from this? And I think um, there's been, you know, that should come even before we start having conversations around the tools that we might use or the management or the kind of discourse around evidence or whatever. Really um, what's important is understanding what, what we want these ecosystems to look like. What do you think uh, the first steps in doing that look like? Melissa, do you want to go first? Look, is this working? Yeah. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and it's I think that's really what we that's our role here, starting here and then and following on. Um we need to 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 listen to various stakeholders about what they want, what their values are out of these forest estate. One of the things that um we're working, VX working in the Central Highlands at the moment, and um, of course we're um, and and with the eminent panel, we're going to talk to the community about who live in in these forests about what their values are. But we also need to recognise that these are forests of national significance, so there are broader interests at foot. Um, so I think it really depends on what forest. I almost think we need to look at them forest by forest because I think they've all got specific communities, um, specific um, ecological types um, that, that make them unique. But I think the first thing are conversations. And as Rod said, um, putting that down, I mean, we both worked together on the original RFAs when we were with federal government and they were, well, they started off being very combative, but we sort of got there in the end because we were working pretty closely with people who had different views and I think that's what we need to start with, putting our values on the on the table, looking at, um, as I said earlier, what the threats are. Um, and also I think the traditional owners play, and we've heard this over and over again today, but they play a really major role in helping us navigate that and to provide a perspective that we probably wouldn't be bringing otherwise. So do you want to add? Just add a little bit. Um... So the society's views often go much faster than a political process can go. That, that, that's a good thing. Otherwise, we would have policy shifting uh, fairly regularly and perhaps not always in the best way. Um, but you're at one of those points now, I think, is that uh, in Victoria or well, in Australia, we're one of the most urbanised countries on earth. So urban electorates have a very strong say. But that also means many, many urban people are quite disconnected from the reality of, of what the field is. And, and I think helping people to understand that making choices or not making choices um, has consequences. And uh, if you know, not not managing forests for biodiversity will have negative biodiversity consequences, um, and that's um, so. To, so to me, you know, getting that discourse out there is is the first step. Listening, uh, as Melissa said, and I said earlier, is is critical. But but also, you know, having processes uh, that support government in decision making that are open and transparent, and they're not always the case. Yeah, I think uh, having that diversity of viewpoints expressed uh, in any sort of definition, I mean, we've got a Forest Act at the moment written in 1958, the last version, and I think perhaps what we need in this whole process is a healthy Forest Act, a new piece of legislation that does try and you know, go through a process to define what we mean by healthy forest. Um, but it's not going to be what the ecologists might think of, you know, 
forest with all the structural components intact and the various species composition complement of species that might represent that particular forest type. Uh, Bill gave a pretty good example of from an indigenous perspective. Indigenous people that I've talked to, local uh, First Nations people, are healthy forests. So forests with people in them doing things, and uh, or they're places that um, people care about and want to be in. So I think they're, they're some of the different perspectives we need to bring to that. Um, I have a question, uh, probably for both Bill and Rod, but um, happy for it to be expanded. It's pleased to see a very complex uh, regulatory framework diagram being borrowed from some past work of mine. But um, thanks, thanks, Jeremy. Gave me some nightmares. Um, and you also mentioned the connection to what is a thirty-year-old national forest policy statement. Um, and recently, the Labor government um, federally is committed to reviewing that. I'm just wondering what your perspectives are on how Victoria best influences that at that level given that we don't have a state vision or strategy for forests. Yeah. Talk about national policy? No. Um, yeah, I think it's a real a real challenge. You know, it's an opportunity um, has been opened up by the federal government. Uh, many of us have been lamenting that the policy is now 30 years old. It's not fit for, fit for purpose uh, to the current environment barely mentions climate change, uh, doesn't uh, really deal with uh, First Nations of traditional owner, Indigenous management in any substantive way. It, um, it's deficient in a number of other areas that are, are important to Australians now. I think if we can set up the right process, that include the inclusive national dialogues, local dialogues, we've seen a sort of similar thing happen with the, the voice among um, the Australian Indigenous communities. Um, <laughs> hopefully, we can get a better outcome. So, uh, but it's an opportunity. So, perhaps just a little bit. Ed, um, a couple of years ago, I, I did do a little bit of work for Victorian government on looking at regional forest agreements as they were and making suggestions. I think my my first suggestion was there's a lack of vision or a lack of clear policy. Mm -hmm. Um, for where do you want to go? Um, and I've and in 2016, I was the chief author of Australia's State of Environment report. We, as a team, we made the same conclusion about environment in Australia. So at the moment, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is being reviewed at federal level, um, and it's probably a very opportune time to to review forest issues so that, as Rod said, they can. Uh, dovetail better into biodiversity uh, regulation, but also into climate change objectives that, that the federal government has. Um, you know, I think of Victoria as often over the past 30, 40 years has been quite a leader in uh, both technical development and policy issues and uh, really encourage you to uh, do so again. Hi, um, I've just got a more broad question. Uh, with the end of native forest logging in Victoria, is um, does that kind of make it seem as though forestry has been a failed experiment in this state? I mean, it's lot, it's cost the taxpayers tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. We've got degraded forests, water catchments at risk, you know, endangered species and more flammable forests. So just a more general comment from the three of you. Uh, do you want to answer? No, you start. <laughs> uh, it's not a failed uh, experiment. It's a failure of governance. I think we set up a governance structure in 2002, really. I mean, some of it was in place beforehand, but uh, the Brex government uh, you know, really set in train a whole set of processes in 2002 with the Our Forest, Our Future statement, and that that ended up creating that whole web of uh, legislative framework, uh, various sort of oversight arrangements and um, other, um, other arrangements that um, I think, and, and putting in, in place Vic Forests and the constraints that it was operating under um, in terms of having to um, operate as a commercial business, 
while only being given responsibility for a very small component of the overall forest management arrangement. It was responsible for the um, marketing, harvesting and, and regeneration of the uh, of the area. So it uh, wasn't given a long-term management responsibility. No one was looking at uh, the forest in a holistic way for all of its different values. So those big forests was operating to deliver certain things for government, various other parts of government were responsible for delivering other things. And uh, the collective um, set of responsibilities hasn't ended up providing the kind of uh, policy goals that, that I spelled out at the beginning. So um, I think that that governance arrangement has failed and it's now time to explore a new one. because, And that's what the big challenge in front of us all is really what that new governance arrangement is going to look like to facilitate all the things that people want to see happening in the forest, whether it's recreation, conservation, water, water benefits, managing pests and, and uh, feral animals, weeds, et cetera. So if, if I looked at back, stood back and looked at the really big challenges um, that Victoria's forests and nature in general faces, um, I think there's a risk there that we get misled in a discussion of focusing on big forests and forestry. Um, yes, they they part of the background, the history, the legacy, uh, the problems that are there. But but you know from and this is an opinion, not a scientific fact. But but my observation is, um, and particularly from my time as director of national parks, the three really big challenges were, were fire regimes, um, invasive species and climate change, and then compounding that is a lot of historical legacy. Uh, we've very heard some very clear the, this morning about the history of repeated fires, history of repeated fires followed up by salvage logging, which removed a lot of the hollow bearing trees. Uh, a, a history of we've lost most of our meso predators. Um, so we don't see quoll anymore. Where, where have they gone? Uh, They've been replaced to some extent by invasive predators, fox, cats, other things. Um, and there is that legacy of, of harvesting um, as well. But And the forests are all being fragmented, uh, carved up for agriculture, stuck roads through them, big power lines through them, water pipes through them. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of issues that you should focus on. Um, yes, you know, for, forestry is one of those, but also... I agree with Rod. My, my observation is that um, things like Vic Forest, and this has happened in most other states in Australia, they were set up, you know, partly through economic rationalisation in the 70s, thinking government started to divest itself of, uh, of utilities um, and saying we can make these things commercial enterprises with a primacy on making a profit. And by the way, because you're managing state lands, you also have to look after a couple of other things. And then over 20 or 30 years, that the importance of those other things was more and more realised, but still pressure to make money. Um, so I agree with Rod. Well, meet, meet contractual the, commitments. Was, yeah. Yeah. So the, the governance system around it was, was what fails. And... You know, if we want to target people, we should target the politicians rather than uh, the, the people that implemented it, in my view. Can I just invite Melissa to add her perspective on that question? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Um, I've only just arrived back in Victoria, so I haven't been around during the Vic Forest days, but I am aware that the plantation forestry sector is also um, been a failure for various reasons, the management investment fund, not just in Victoria, but nationally. Um, and I, I support what you were saying about governance failures, that that it was really the whole governance structure for this has been set up inappropriately. And we've heard some really deep thinking around that earlier today about where we place ourselves in this and where we, Again, back to the values of forest um, and then looking at the science and the evidence and run running trials and experiments and, you know, we're sort of in a bit of a new space, um, even though some of us have been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and some of us have been doing it for much less. 
Um, we need to take the time, I think, um, going back to your first question, we need to take the time to really think this through because we've already seen the impacts and you've laid them out really nicely of 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 going down a path without thinking about it too, too appropriately and not having it well regulated, et cetera. So we really do need to add time to this and put as much grunt from as many knowledge systems that we've got into it. Perhaps if I can ask the last question before yeah, after we might take. Go to the internet. Oh, have you got something? Yeah. Um, so, so um, Rod and Bill, you described a lot of opportunities and obligations, and I just want to think about where that where we're going to be in relation to those in in the future. And Melissa, you talked about the the problem of outdated land categories. Now, VIAC is really a it's I'm a geographer, so you're really a geographical entity. You map. And in to some extent, uh, and other things as well. But so, so I'm just wondering how we get to in the future. All of this state forest is going to be mapped into all sorts of different categories to achieve those obligations and opportunities. There'll be you know traditional owner land. There'll be all sorts of different types. I imagine in that. And I'm just wondering, Melissa, how you see us getting to that process? Because you said that some of these decisions took 40 years from inception to the park. We can't wait that long. So perhaps could you describe how we're going to map out all of this land for all of these opportunities and obligations? Um, I think it's really significant that we've taken commercial timber harvest, native timber harvesting off the table because that's been a, a significant driver and it's been the defining force behind what a state forest is. That's a, If you put all the land category tenures and permissible uses down, there's a lot of agreement except for commercial timber harvesting. That sets that aside. So you've got state forest at one end of the public land estate and you've got the highest level of conservation in a national park at the other, right? So we're, we're sort of focusing on what that state forest could be in the future, but it's a continuum. And I almost think we need to look at the whole estate and, and look at it as a whole instead of just fiddling with a piece at this end, which is a significant chunk, but it's not the whole picture. So I'm not actually answering your question, um, but I don't know that you can just fiddle with the permissible uses. I think we need to have a, a much more holistic look at this. Um, yeah, apologies to geographers who, you know, some of my best friends. But, um, yeah, I think spatial planning is what has got us into this problem as part of being part of that governance failure, um, that there was a belief, you know, and Melissa mentioned the RFAs, that we, that we could actually model habitat values and identify where they are in the landscape and then put lines around those areas and and set exclusion zones and you know every do that everything will be fine you know operate on the rest and then Vic Forest was set up and said okay well, we've got to make a profit we'll operate on the rest and that didn't work so this is a much more complicated and fuzzy logic type of system that we're dealing with here that's not conducive to partitioning the landscape into nice packages we've got to have a a more flexible and particularly moving ahead with climate change. You know, things are going to move around a lot quicker than probably most of us expect, um, or they're just going to disappear and we're, we're not quite going to know why. So we've got to have different ways of thinking about the landscape and it probably, you know, it's a, an old way of thinking about the landscape as an, an integrated whole and be ready to um, adapt and move as we see conditions change. So it's it's a very different kind of philosophy, I guess, that we're thinking about here in relation to the, um, the way we design our legislation, our land tenure arrangements and our, our kind of uh, land use practices to reflect that, that very complex, variable and, and dynamic system. Um, if I look back, if I look back 20 years, and you asked me then 
what you want to do in 20 years from now, I think I'd, I probably would have got mostly wrong um, because so much has changed in those 20 years. So, so society's expectations have changed. Um, our technologies have all changed. Uh, the available evidence and science, uh, we heard a lot of that this morning. There's a huge body of evidence and research that wasn't there before, um, even if some of it might be a bit contested, but it's still there and that that drives uh, thinking. Um, traditional owners have got lots more voice and should have even more still um, so, than they did 20 years ago. So, you know, I think putting all that into the mix uh, and just reinforcing um, uh, what, what you just heard was... Uh, apart from use the evidence is look across the whole estate. I think you can't deal with just the 1.8 million hectares. I think you have to look, but you have that opportunity now because one uh, conflictual area has been taken off the table. So seize that opportunity, look at it, all values and the whole estate. Can I just say one more thing before I... Um, one minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really want, at the beginning of my talk, when I was talking about a conference last week, uh, I wanted to acknowledge two people who were uh, awarded the Forestry Australia's NW Jolly Medal, which is our highest award for um, forestry professionals in Australia. Uh, one is Rowan Reed, um, who is a good friend, and um, you know he's helped me a lot with my thinking about you know, the complexity of, of rural landscapes and how we engage with people there. Um, but the other was Kevin Tolhurst, who was posthumously awarded the NW jo Jolly Medal. Uh, and uh, you know, Kevin's obviously influenced many of our thinking, much of our thinking around fire. And um, you know, I really want to pay tribute to his contribution. Uh, he he died three weeks ago, for people who didn't know, uh, presenting at a, at a, a public meeting in Malakuta uh, on these very topics of what how they manage their forests. So... Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Kevin's contribution. I might just might pass it to a few online questions before we, we've got a little bit of time. No, sorry. We're yeah. going to four, are we? We'll be back at four. <laughs> oh, back at four. Okay, so Yeah, I think we'd be, get, we'd, we'd better get our yeah. cup of tea, I think. Sorry, I'm <laughs> one. Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll be back, I believe. Given how long it takes to get everyone out of the room and back in again, I'd say we'll be reconvening at about 10 past four. Uh, and we are going to be hearing from um, the Department of Environment and Climate Action uh, on uh, some of the, uh, the plans ahead. So, Stay tuned when you're only there. Thanks.
Same band, but that's okay. They're coming still. I've almost got a quorum here. <laughs> I, I feel there's a group downstairs that are just uh, not quite making it up. Yeah, thank you, Rob. I bet our online people are sitting there waiting patiently. What's that? What's the? It's the downstairs. It's a problem. <laughs> no, I'm okay. Right, okay, we're getting there. Still, still more down there. Right. <laughs> We have our speaker eager and ready to go, don't we, Simon? He's at his peak. Okay, we might get going. And uh, look, I, I know it's, it's it's a long day, and there's a lot of great conversations going on over a lot of food, so um, it's hard to draw you away. This is our final session today. We've got uh, Dr. Simon Watson, who's going to present to us. Uh, Simon's a principal scientist for forestry and fire ecology with the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Change, DECA. Simon joined the department in 2018 after 12 years as a researcher at universities. And over those cumulative 17 years, he's contributed to uh, extensive body of research investigating the effects of fire on biodiversity and conservation of species. Today, Simon's going to present the day's final keynote, the current state in the next five years of fire ecology for better bushfire management in Victoria. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much. We'll see how we go with this thing. Going, I guess. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. No, just, I guess go on to the keyboard. Go on the keyboard. Yeah, put, yeah. It is showing. It's it's moving on this. It's just not moving up there. <laughs> it's probably it's the most gigantic PowerPoint file in the world. So it's probably going. Oh, Help me. Yeah. All right. Let's just try plugging that in again. And oh, I see what the problem is. We're on the wrong screen. You want to be there. And da, da, Look at da, that. Da, more da. effective. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Uh, I know quite a few people in the room, but those that don't me, yes, I'm Simon Watson. I'm principal scientist, forest fire ecology at uh, Department of Energy, Environment, Climate Action. Um, the role that I'm in is essentially the similar role to, to what Gordon Friend was in uh, about a decade ago for anyone who knew Gordon. Um, I'll begin off, begin just uh, acknowledging traditional owners of the land we're on, we're under people. It's great to be here, um, a privilege and recognise the elders past and present. 
I'd also like to recognise the work I live and work on Jarrah country in central Victoria. Um, the work that this relates to relates to traditional owner lands across the state of Victoria. So today I'm going to run through three different parts. I'm going to start with the changing shape of bushfires in Victoria. And I think there's been a fair bit on this, so I shouldn't have to spend too much time on it. Um, people can try and stay awake. Uh, so uh, we've got fire ecology science after that. So the the technical capabilities and programs that we've got going on and, and what this sort of looks like for the current state of Victorian ecosystems. And then thinking about future advancements in fire ecology science for bushfire management. So beginning with the changing shape of bushfires in Victoria, I think this figure on the left might have been shown earlier. Um, this is looking at the, the number of days, uh, uh, high fire danger days above the 90th percentile from the CSIRO report in 2022. Um, and you just see this significant increase in the number of high fire, high fire danger events. Um, we look at Jason Sharple's work from quite a few years back, but looking at pyro CB events, the types of fire events we're getting for pyro CB events. Um, so we're getting this change in, in fire weather, we're getting change in fire, beha fire behaviour. Um, something that's really interesting to do, we, in Victoria, um, one of the things we like to criticise is our fire history data set. It's the envy of every other state in, in Australia. Um, we've got a pretty good fire history data set. Um, in saying that, the 1903 to 1960 patch is still pretty sparse. Um, and when we look at the 1939 fires, which were undoubtedly large fires, um, the mapping's pretty coarse. So we see these big areas that we, we think um, burn. But it's interesting to think about that. So we then move in past 1903 to 1969, um, and we start to look at how things change, 1960s to 1980s. This encompasses the advent of uh, satellite imagery, and we start to get much better mapping. We have better record keeping. But I think what's interesting here is still some significant fires in the landscape, big areas, but we're looking at the spatial patterns of fires through Victoria, which is interesting, um, quite different to what we'll see as we move ahead. When we look at 1980 to 2000, or the 1980s through the 2000s, lots of fires, the areas burned is still, the extent of the of the fire um, is still a lot smaller than what we see in the following 20 years. And I just want to run through. So when we get to the, the age of megafires, this is the last 20 years, um, we see a big desert, we had Alpine fires, Great Divide Complex, Gary Word, and ongoing. So when we take the last 100 years of known data, there's not much public land in Victoria that hasn't experienced fire. Um, it's been very prevalent across the landscape, but the shape of that fire, the extent of that fire in the landscape is changing really significantly, particularly over the last 20 years. So when we start looking at that, we start looking at things like the extent. This is what I was talking about. And I mentioned there's a bunch of fires that are actually missing. We know of fires that are missing in the earlier years. And we we also know that 1939 is a massive overestimate um, of, of area because there's no patches missing in that. It's just one big block. And we know that, that wasn't the case, um, but we don't have the, the satellite imagery in the, for the 1939 was pretty poor. Um, so this day, first... Uh, 40 years of the, that we're looking at, the first 20 years, what have I got over here? 20 years. Um, one major fire that's above the long-term average. So when we take the long-term average of extent of area in, in Victoria that's burned, and then we take the next 20 years, we get a couple of fires that are above the average, a couple of fires that are above the average. 1980 to 2000, we had three fires that are above the long-term average. In the last 20 years, we've had eight that get above the long-term average. It's this huge step change in extent of area that's being affected by fire. Um, next, I want to talk, talk about frequency. And I had a, a figure, but then um, I stole David's because it was better. Um, so this is some work that that was recent, that's just recently been published. Um, but what we're looking at essentially is the, the number of the total number of fires and then the number of points in the landscape that were affected by um, multiple fires and looking at those two periods again of 1980 to 2000 and, and 2000 to, to 2020. And so what we're seeing is that shift of areas being affected by one or two fires or no fires into these 
multiple fires in the 20-year period. And I stole Jason Sharple's um, image here as well. The interval between those major fires is decreasing. That was in 2016. There's some nice shorter ones now. And Luke Collins's piece here looking at um, changing severity of fire as well. So these are looking at these different elements of the, the fire regime. So the annual area burnt, we see this um, increasing, um, but the proportion of high severity fire. So, and this is this is largely a relationship as well with that annual area burn. So even if fires aren't burning more severely, we're having that greater extent. So we're getting larger areas of the landscape um, being burnt by fire. So massive changes to the fire regimes that we're experiencing um, and across different elements of the regime, that extent. I did mention, actually, I was going to run back. Uh, uh, no, I won't. But the, the size of those individual fires, um, I know I will, I'll do it, because I'd like to point something out. Um, when we think about tragic fires that have occurred, I'll try and use this pointer. I've gone too far now. There we go. The Upper Beaconsfield fires, this little this fire here. Massive impacts, huge losses of life, absolutely devastating. Not a big fire. All right. Where am I up to? Look at the right screen. Okay. Um, fire ecology, science, technical capabilities. I'm going to look at three different things um, and really looking at the how we measure the effects of fire regimes, characteristics on plants and animals. Um, so I want to talk about the fire analysis module for ecological values. This is something we built a few years back. I want to talk about the measures that we use for looking at ecosystems relationships with fire and, and then talk about the ecosystem resilient monitoring work that we're doing. So the fire analysis module for ecological values, the strategic bushfire management plans that uh, somebody put up earlier, um, when they were being developed, there was a, a real recognition of saying, well, we've got this goal of ecosystem resilience in our, in our um, an objective in the code of practice for bushfire management on public land, how are we actually able to measure it and how can planners measure this at, at the sites? And we realised that we needed the tools that allowed people to do this. It didn't have to be somebody who could script with R, who could had all the data sets, but we need somebody to be able to, get some information so you can fill a consequence table of what you think your strategy is going to deliver. So we built this. Basically, it's it's a front end. It's an R wrapper front end. We input our landscape data, our vegetation fire history data. We're inputting our species and our ecosystem data. And it gives you a wrapper. We've got a front end wrapper, um, which is a, just a, a shiny app um, that can then deliver the metrics and spatial outputs that you're wanting to use for your planning. Um, this was developed by Arthur Roller Institute, Neville Amos and, and Josephine McCunter as part of a larger project that was also with the University of Melbourne looking at structured decision-making in bushfire management strategies um, and inputting those ecological metrics. Um, I'm going to talk about three different measures that we look at for uh, ecosystem resilience. We'll talk about tolerable fire intervals, growth stage structure, um, coming out of, of David Shields' report. This is where they are proposed. As we go on, I'll also talk about the work we're doing to, to update some of these. Um, the other piece here is the fire interval. Uh, it's the species habitat availability work. So looking at fire interval here, but you're looking at how much habitat is available for a species. And I'll run through what each of these metrics is and how we measure them. I like to start with tolerable fire intervals. I, I've never come across an environmental metric that seems to make people so angry. Um, like, you know, like this is like a really divisive one in fire management. And I actually like it because people get really upset about something that's probably not that upsetting um, when they when they actually get down to it. Um, there's a couple of things in this though. And it's about how you're using this tool. This is a, this is a metric we can use as a tool. Now, tolerable fire intervals are the minimum and maximum recommended time intervals. So this is that time to maturity of obligate cedars primarily within, a, within an ecosystem. So if you have repeated fires under the minimum TFI, you're at risk of, of the state change. If you're having no fires beyond the maximum tolerable fire interval where, where obligate cedars have, have died out, 
bearing in mind we have very little understanding of long-term seed bank stories, you know, a lot of these species, um, we we see we expect to see uh, functional changes in these ecosystems. Um, the statement at the bottom there, this is this is what Gordon Friend put in the the original 2015. Uh, policy position for tolerable fire intervals. TFIs provide a broad indicator of landscape risk as a surrogate for ecosystem resilience in the context of bushfire management. Um, when you use it like that, it's actually a really useful measure and it gives you some pretty interesting information. And if we look at the data here, just this is percentage of immature vegetation, vegetation below tolerable fire intervals. And we look at the pattern over time um, from 1980 to 2020, this is just the, the general, um, measurement time that we use because from 1980s when we're fairly confident of our fire history, um, we see this massive increase in the area of immature vegetation. So this is the area of vegetation that we say, if another fire goes through in this area, the, the risk of significant change is, is higher. And it doesn't mean that there will always will be because there is all of the other elements of the fire regime, the severity of that fire that goes through, the patchiness of the fire, the fire weather conditions. So there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, but if fire affects it, it can change things. In noting that, things like the wombat, it depends on what your starting point is as well. Um, we can also look at area below minimum TFI. So this is the area that's burned below minimum TFI. And we see a very similar pattern to those bushfire years. Essentially, when you have those large bushfire years, we're seeing those large areas of, of burn below TFI. The next piece I want to talk a little bit about is growth stage structure. So this is thinking about when you've got your time since fire and you've got your change in successional patterns, What's the how much of the landscape is within different stages within different growth stages so we're thinking about across the entire landscape what are we seeing how much is in that juvenile stage adolescent stage mature old these don't necessarily align directly to the tolerable fire intervals there's a fair bit of alignment but there's not but what this does give us from a fire management perspective is you start to get some spatialization of your patterns you could start to think about how much their extent there is and we can start to think about fire mosaics as well in terms of uh, species that use multiple different fire ages. When we start looking at growth stage structure, we see a similar pattern to tolerable fire intervals. You notice this one, This we can start to forecast out what our expectations into the future are. And this is when we start looking at later on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about desirable states and endpoints. You can start to think about, well, how long is it going to take to get some of these things into a, a state that we want to see? But again, if we look over time from 1980, um, Significant increases generally in that juvenile and adolescent stage, bearing in mind we're losing a lot of unknown fire history, but that unknown is probably older generally, but this is in terms of fire history. Um, so we're not, not entirely sure what we're losing, but with some of those older vegetation types. But what we're seeing is that in, certainly a big increase in the juvenile and adolescent areas, age and classes can start to get a bit more information when we start thinking about these in terms of what ecosystems, when you break this down into eco, different ecosystems, um, and we can start to say, well, okay, what are we what are we seeing in a different place? Um, where are the areas where we've got significant uh, juvenile or adolescent? So we're looking at, you know, some of the um, alpine treeless vegetation, huge areas of juvenile, probably under undesirable states. Species habitat suitability. So this is one that we really did develop through those bushfire management strategies. We had this process for quite a while um, and, and it builds on a, on a lot of work around, you know, builds on the work that sort of Barry Fox and Marilyn Fox did in the 1980s around habitat accommodation models and how we're looking at succession patterns of, of faunal species particularly. Um, but we can calculate habitat suitability across the landscape. So relative to fire. This is not saying, this is not the same as a species distribution model that says this is where the species is and we're taking every variable. We're looking at the species and saying, well, how how's the, the habitat seen for a species um, relative to its relationship with fire? So we take a species, oh, we're going to take Red Lord Whistler, we're going to take a habitat distribution map of where that species can occur in the landscape. We're going to, wow, that's... Uh, oh, just, what's that? 
it's going to be a real quick, it's going to be a real quick second, second half of the presentation. <laughs> so, so, okay. Uh, all right. Beautiful. Halfway is good. Uh, we're taking a distribution map to say, how's that? Where, where can the species occur? We're taking the vegetation type map to say, what are the different vegetation types within where it occurs? We fit species response curves for each species with time since fire in this case. So this is a species response curve with time since fire. So along the x-axis, you have how many years since fire. On the y-axis, you've got either a probability of occurrence or an abundance estimate of a species. And we're looking at that. Now, if you do that for every single vegetation type that the species can occur in, so you, I've showed the same uh, response curve here, but we have a different response curve across each vegetation type. And then you add your fire history, then you can calculate what is essentially a species habitat suitability map relative to fire. So how good is the, the habitat relative to the fire age that that species likes? And then you can add it up across the landscape and say, well, how's that population going? <laughs> so, um, and then, yes, that's right. And then, and then you rinse and repeat thousands of times for every species and every vegetation type, and you start to get a build a an idea of how species habitat is changing. Um, and to give an idea of that, this is, again, some I've stolen this from Nev, um, but this is you know, what you can do when you start thinking about something in the Yellow Valley Glider, for instance, and we can look at the central highlands and we can map the species response curve and we can change, follow that through time. We don't actually use this for Yellow Valley Glider because we have better, better information, but I stole an old slide off Nev here. Um, but you can then say, where does it where does it occur in the landscape and how is that changing through time as well? So this is interesting talking about those, um, you know, fuzzy patterns because the, the best bit of habitat is not the same spot through time um, and where it is in the landscape. But we can forecast. So if you look at the, the years there, you can then start to put in fire scenarios. Um, and I see some of the flare groups sitting up here who do this. Um, you know, you can start putting future fire scenarios in and saying, well, okay, what's the, the habitat for these species in the future? And then we can start saying, well, what's the strategy that gives us the fire scenario that we want? And we can start pop looking at that population change through time. So this is when we start doing this. We do this for lots of different species, and I've just shown an example here. And it's interesting to think about averages when you start looking at this, because we can look at populations through time. Um, this is actually not the correct data. This is a figure on data that we did a little while back. But um, if you're looking through time and you're saying, okay, well, how are species going? Um, if you look at the average of winners and losers and they cancel each other out. So you're getting some species that are going up and doing really well and other species that are going down. Now, if you're using a geometric mean and there's lots of other things that you can look at to, to look at um, indicators here, but generally we can now start to look at these, these individual species patterns through time and think about how they're going. Um, I'm going to move on to the Ecosystem Resilience Monitoring Program now. So this is a program that we set up. Um, it was a, a piece of work that we did after the uh, framework for monitoring, evaluation and reporting. Um, I was actually at La Trobe University when this was being developed. Steve Leonard and Andy Haslam led it with Mike and, and others um on this how do you measure and look at the ecosystem resilience type metrics you're looking at and how do you test them and, and put the underpinning data in um standardized surveys at two and a half, bit over two thousand sites across the state cameras bird surveys call recorders and floristics and vegetation structure um, this is looking at 11 broad vegetation groups which are about 70 percent of the state and the aim here is to be able to build those, evaluate and expand our understanding of those species response curve data. The, the, the uh, sites are stratified by time since fire and fire intervals. Um, so previous fire interval. Uh, so we can start to look at TFI thresholds. We can update growth stage threshold, thresholds. We can start to improve those metrics and methods. So we're trying to instill that adaptive management. Here's our approach. Here's our measures. How do they hold up? Um, and then I'll get to the next piece now. So the next few years, this is where we're heading. Defining desirable states, updating our modeling and, and standardized monitoring. This is critical pieces of work that, that are ongoing. Coming out of uh, the inquiries post 2019 and, and 20 fires, there was a, a recommendation to look at what are outcomes targets for ecosystem resilience. So bushfire management, 
ecosystem resilience is a, an objective of the code of practice. And we want to look at that. And we want to say, well, how do we define a desirable state? So there's a bunch of work that we're doing to look at this. But the first step that we did, we said, well, the measures we've got, are they any good? So we we got um, University of Melbourne, Kate Lowen and uh, and Luke Kelly, and I've just got Kate's surname wrong, but um, pronounced wrong, but um, they, they reviewed the resilience metrics and these are not the only findings, but the some of the main findings were that, you know, things like geometric mean of abundance, which we tended to use, but managers find really difficult to think about how you actually implement a change in geometric mean of abundance that's that's valuable. Um, tolerable fire intervals, growth stage structure, they're all pretty good metrics. They're all pretty good ways of measuring how the ecosystem's going. They don't cover everything. Um, the critical piece is the underpinning data. And so that's where things like the Ecosystem Resilience Monitoring Program come in, is building that underpinning data. Um, we've had another review here thinking about how do you use these metrics for outcomes targets, La Trobe University, Mike's in the, in the audience today, Angie Haslam, Jim Radford, Andrew Bennett all on this project. Current metrics are useful. There's a need to expand the number of metrics. Those three metrics by, that we had initially are, are probably not enough. Individual species are important. Again, underpinning data. Is a, is a key piece. So updated modeling. This is this is our pieces. This is this is the piece I'm most comfortable with because this is where I come from. But I'm going to and then I see Tom Fairman laughing up there because we we're talking earlier. Can I get a Malliemia in into this? Um, this is not a forest species unless you think of Mallee as quite small forests, but it still gives an indication of the type of work that we need to do. On the left is a piece that Jemima Connell, a PhD student at the Trobe University, did um, where we're using presence-only modelling to look at these response curves and look at populations across the, the, the landscape, the, the species distribution modelling that we had. Um, we were working with the, the department and, and Parks Vic at the time to say, you know, where are the important areas? Where should we set up our strategies for bushfire management? Where do we need to be looking at, at fire prevention and, and protection? Um, and we built that map. Simon Verdon um, and I were working on this and we knew there were areas where the species didn't drop out in these old age classes. Had a Colcon National Park, great spots for Malliem Urens. They're 100 years old. They've never had fire in them as far as we're aware, um, some of these spots. And, and there's emu Urens everywhere. The, the, the spinifex didn't drop out, other parts in Western Sunset. So what Simon did is he went and looked at different parts of the landscape and said, well, what's happening with the species response curves in different parts of the landscape? The pat from, from zero, directly after fire, this species lives in spinifex. It lives in spinifex grass that burns in fire. From directly after a fire up to sort of 20 or 30 years after fire, you get a single, similar positive trajectory. The population grows. The occurrence, likelihood of occurrence increases. When you look at different parts in the landscape relative to this, the depth of sand, um, so whether this is up on a high sand dune or whether it's down on a sandy area, the trade only really grows in the sandy areas, you get different response curves. So you start building this understanding of different parts of the landscape are having a different pattern. And it's really interesting to think about this when people say time since fire is not important. Time since fire can be easily over, overlooked if you're not looking at the other variables that are driving that pattern. So starting to build these models beyond that. I thought I'd throw this in because Fred Rainsford just had this published, I think, two weeks ago. Um, Again, looking at other regime variables is really important. What we're looking at on the left here, don't need to look at a lot of the details. This is looking at across two different ecosystems, across Mallee and across Foothills Forest. Um, on the on the x-axis, it's just showing the variables that you're using to try and estimate where that population of the species is. And if you just use time since fire, when you add spatial context, if you add the context of the fire around the site, how much the extent of fire, the diversity of patterns around the site, you get a much better model of where the species occurs. When you start looking at this in terms of things like time since fire, you start seeing these patterns that you're getting, but then you're looking at how much late successional vegetation or early successional vegetation or spatial diversity is around a species, um, the site that you looked at, and you get a response for that. So these are the types of updated modelling. Now, we're only at the, the, the time since fire modelling generally, the simple modelling at the moment to do at the scale that we want across the state, but this is, now that we've developed FAME, we've developed model-based approaches. This is the types of approaches we can keep, keep moving to, on to. Um, this is another piece of work we're doing. Cindy Hauser, um, 
our weekly VPN reports up, which is good as well. So um, Cindy Hauser is leading this at Arthur Island Institute, a piece of work we're doing. So traditionally, when we started using FAME, the, we used the data that was available, which was an expert elicited data set. Um, and we've done a, a significant amount of um, work to, to build that data set. But one of the things is there are a lot of species, a lot of vegetation types in the state, and even with huge data collection, to still understand what do we expect the fire response to be, we start running out of, of time and space. Um, expert elicited data is one way to get the data, presence only data. We've, in fact, some of the data I showed earlier, we use Victorian Biodiversity Atlas to build these response curves or species distribution modeling approaches. You can use empirical survey data where you've got it. What Cindy's doing and, and some other work that we're doing with Arthur Rola is we're looking at two things. One is, how do you choose the value of information? Because we often say empirical data is better, but emp empirical data could be one site from one place and you know one person. Whereas we might have expert data that's across 20 experts that really know their species. So you actually, it's not as easy as saying one type of data is better than another. So building a, a, an analysis of how you define what the type of data is you use, and then building modeling techniques like these Bayesian, Bayesian hierarchical models that, that Cindy's working on and Jenny and our team's worked on, um, allows you to start to mash these different things together. And this becomes really important as you move forward into other species from birds as well. Birds are really great because most of us survey in a really similar way, except call recorders obviously are changing that. Um, but when you're looking at mammals, you've got pitfall traps and cage traps and cameras and every else. And you're trying to mash together four or five different techniques to figure out how a species responds over time and then understand what that um, approach is and what the abundance estimates are. The other piece, the other key piece that we need to be thinking about is how does fire interact with all of these other processes? So we've got, you know, pest, plant and animals. Um, this is a statement that I, I really liked, but basically where we're, the, the, the point is, if we're not considering all these other interactions, we're probably not going to get an outcome that we're after. It doesn't take away from anything in terms of fire management. You've still got to do the right fire management to get the right outcome, and you've still got to have the good data behind that, but we need to start thinking about integrating that. But the scale of these things becomes quite big. Standardised monitoring programs become really important in this stage. And Ella, this is your shout-out to Ella Plumen Paton. Is we're getting that right? So this is her work. So the stat, that ecosystem resilience monitoring projects that we set up. Um, so these have all been delivered as research partnerships. Um, this is Ella's paper that came out of that, have I got it there? Yep, from Fire Ecology earlier this year. Um, and what we're looking at here is this is the, the time since fire for different species um, and looking at the proportion of immature plants or mature plants. And this is really interesting, this piece of work. I really like this, Ella, because it starts to make you think about things like our tolerable fire intervals in a fuzzy way because it starts to say, I can I can start looking at this and saying, well, actually, what what, what percentage of what what percentage of silver bags here do I really want in a site? If I if I burn a little earlier, I'm actually going to knock out more of these. If I burn a little, if I leave it a little longer, we're going to get more of them because they're they're already mature. But the maturity rates are, are variable across these. So how many mature individuals do you have? Um, this was Leanne Greenwood. I put this in because I didn't even know anything about this. And I thought this is the value of these monitoring programs that are done in research partnerships. This was a piece of work that was done on fungi. It used the same sites of our surveys, but didn't wasn't actually part of our service. We weren't looking at fungi. We weren't looking at fire. But by setting up a major monitoring program, we're getting these extra benefits, which are you know the extra pieces to start looking at. The other critical piece about getting some standardised monitoring programs, going back to these sites, is starting to look at those. Where are the demonstrated success stories? Where are we actually getting the outcomes we want? Um, and where aren't we? And this is where I talk about we can build great models and we can we could do great fire management and get great outcomes and say, you develop the right perfect habitat for longfooted potteroos. But if they're all being eaten by foxes, we're not investing well from a, an ecosystem outcomes point of view. And then I wanted to finish on something. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's it, it, it's it's somewhat hopeful. So um, 
I don't like to use the word hope. A colleague of mine says hope is not a strategy. Um, so, you know, this is, but but I, but I, I do think that this is uh, talking about the complexity of fire management and where you can be successful. And this is where I was going to have another shout out to the Flare Group. We've got another piece of work we're doing really looking at what are the multiple different levers that you can pull in a fire management context to get an ecological outcome. So starting to really look at those ecosystems. We've got some good data on those metrics, pulling all these things together. And this is an example from the 2019-20 fires. People might have known it was the Radar Hill burn. Um, there's so much black and white discussion around things like fuel management does work, fuel management doesn't work. Phil's talking about, you know, where you get caught into traps potentially, or you're you're driving um, a situation where um, you know you, you're in a more flammable system. This is an example of showing in these large landscape weather-driven events generally. So um, where we saw fire management effective, and it wasn't one thing at all. There's no silver bullet. This was an area where we saw the fire pull up, but we know it came through and it hit the area. As, as the fire was moderating because it was getting later at night. So it wasn't coming through as hard. So um, we had, there was a strategic fuel break in this area, not one of the proposed strategic fuel breaks, but this was a, there's a fuel break along this road. We had suppression resources that worked in there. All of these things were needed to get a positive outcome in this case. Um, so it's really important for us to be thinking about fire management. Um, but this one, this is one of those examples where you go, it's, it's a cherry picked case study where everything sort of went right. I'm no denying that. Um, but it does mean that even in really significant fire events, there's influence. And I think you know, Owen Price's work has shown there's some cases where things work, getting it in the right place, in the right part of the landscape where you've got the best evidence that it's going to be and have an impact, we can get some, some decent outcomes. So I think I've packed a fair bit into that um, and everyone's now across everywhere we are. Um, I can open up and I'm not sure how questions or whatever. Let's take just a, a quick question or two, given the, the time of day. So is there, is there any online, Mike, just before I? No, okay. But um, the effects of fire on the forest and the fact that doing back burning, et cetera, um, is not necessarily going to be beneficial to stop the fire. What plans are in place for bushfire mitigation? In terms of... So, I so guess non to not make it as severe, like is there something that can be done to help protect the forest? Yeah, well, so, so I think this example here shows that you know, depending where you are. So so I think there's a, a number of things. Um, thinking about what ecosystem you're in. So, so I wouldn't say that it, it, it just, and I'm not sure, you know, Phil and others jump in. Um, it depends what ecosystem you're in. So, and, and what part of the landscape you're in. So even within our single vegetation groups from the, you know, different parts of the hill slope have quite different structure, quite different response and the fire behaves differently in those different parts of the landscape and i think fuel management can play a really significant role in some of those areas and we actually saw that post 2009 the importance of some of those areas that did have recent fuel management for refuge um, that they generated um, in saying that it's not a silver bullet and and you know the 2019-20 we completely understand that that's a, a significant um, event but when you bring things like, you know, if you've got suppression activity, you've got fuel breaks, you've got um, fuel reduction in the right spots, and this is this is the piece about, you know, where's the strategy for where you need it to be, and what are the events that, you, where are the areas you need to protect, um, then I think they can be effective. Yeah, yeah. But it's about bringing all of those different pieces together, and and thinking about that in a regime sense of saying. Where are we going to be in 20 years or 100 years of instilling particular fire regime attributes in the landscape so that that's where we can start to think, okay, if we can get to a, a less flammable state, then we can get to a less flammable state. But we've got to figure out how we actually get there. Does that answer the question or did I just skirt around it with bureaucratic talk? <laughs> Another. 
Thank, thanks for that. That's a, a great, great overview of, of what you guys are doing in, in the sort of the ecological monitoring and modeling space. And um, I guess one of the key inputs there is sort of the fire regime parameters and severity and burnt, yes or no. Like how much of a data constraints you bump up against when you're rolling out large scale sort of plant burning uh, operations across the landscape and actually measuring the actual fire outcome versus your nominated fire outcome and the implications of that for your what goes into fame? Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of how good's our severity data? Basically, yeah. Um, for the plant getting burn. better. So, so, um, so for so for instance, the fire severity data is really important um, for our major bushfires in forested systems. Uh, well, so I talked about Luke Collins's work there using that tool that we we work with Luke in development of. Um, we're quite good at understanding our fire severity. Um, in those forested systems, we're quite good at mapping the fire severity of, of recent burns. Um, as we go back further, it, it gets worse and worse. So, um, like I say, there's there's definitely room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. Um, there's there's probably two things that I'd say. Those, yeah, like I say, <laughs> every other state in, in in the in the country says, "Gee, we wish you had, we had your data," um, and we sit there and say our data's not good enough. And the the other piece that that, that I didn't mention here is value of information and increasingly looking at what's the value of new information. Would you make a different management decision with that extra piece of information? And we're particularly looking at this in the modeling sense because you start, you can you can chase better models forever um, until you're, you know, at that full mechanistic model of the universe and everything. Um, your decision probably didn't change from quite far back. So trying to understand it in terms of the severity information pretty good in terms of patchiness um we're reasonable for high severity information and, and ecosystems where it's reason, easy to measure um but it's yeah variable ecosystem specific i've got one online Mike. Thank you. Like, there's been a little sort of uh, rush of really interesting questions, actually, but I think we can only really take one of them. Um, so apologies to those who've asked a question that we can't respond to online. Uh, I think it's appropriate that we uh, have a focus on traditional owners just because we're getting towards the end of the day and we've started started with that acknowledgement and I think we need to end with it. Um, so this is from James Hackle. Uh, Simon, noting the traditional owner cultural fire strategy, are there examples of fire ecology work and partnering with Victorian traditional owners regarding applied research in cultural burning and traditional line of fire management in Victoria? Uh, not enough. No. So that's that's the, the simple answer is absolutely not enough. Okay. We might, I might draw to a close there. Thank you, Simon. I'm going to try to finish up in five or so minutes. Just to, I've been asked to say a few concluding remarks, which... <laughs> Um, I started to take notes all day and I was going to give you a summary of it all, but I won't do that because you've been here. You don't you don't need to have that. But I was going to mention um, Jonathan Green, who I talk to on radio occasionally on ABC RN, is actually writing an article for the monthly. It's going to be in the November issue on this very topic. And he sent me a copy of what he'd written. And I know he spoke to Chris Taylor, actually, so I think maybe others in this room about the articles. I hope it was a positive experience. Um, the article begins with a bit of history and he says one of the first acts the Australian Colonial Project was an attack on the trees. By 1908, the Royal Commission to Forestry concluded the protection of forests has nearly always been subordinated to the policy of settlement. Today, 40% of the continent's forests have been cleared, with that figure 70% in Victoria. Timber harvesting ending on January 2024, what happens next? And he go, I'll let you read the article to get the full detail. But he does hear, in the interviews he has, uh, the effects of fires have been more intense and more frequent than in the past, coupled with even aged younger forests due to forestry. These are some of those ideas that come out today. There are places in need of serious and active restoration, is the word he uses. Some want to keep logging as a form of restoration, but he found that view was not shared by everyone he spoke to. Uh, more importantly, though, and where he gets to at the end of the article, is that there's a, a risk government will want to talk solutions before the nature of the problem is properly understood. And he says, this is a multi-generational matter where massive change has occurred in little more than a century. And he concludes, and his final line is, 
the time may have come to hasten slowly. So his kind of key message is pretty much what we're doing today. Talk, listen. This is a really big decision we're going to make, and I think as it's come through today, it's a complex one. And a few of the sort of summary points I made um, along the way or just sort of pulling together a few threads, and I'll have missed many, uh, fire is complex and nuanced. You don't need to need to say that's come through all day. Fire management is complex and nuanced. And fire interacts with other environmental variables. That's been a, a key kind of message throughout. There is bad science and there is bad policy. There's, all, there's also very good science. I can't recall, though, did anyone say there was good policy? That's, I, I was trying to think. There might, okay, not yet. There, there, may, there may be. I don't want to policymakers do a good job. They work hard. Um, we overextend data and results. I think that's something to watch. That, and that's come through in a few of these. We get data for a particular area, a particular ecosystem. We have to be very, very careful with that. We all have different or perhaps a little idea of what a healthy forest looks like. And that's something which I think we need to sort of untangle a bit. There might, it's not going to be an answer to that. That's a crazy question to give a, a sentence answer to. But what is a healthy forest? I think it's a great thing to, to work on. The past approach to forest management has created problems and outcomes that don't meet many of the values that we've talked about today. The most important thing, though, and I think speakers have made this point through the day, is to now work from where we are now. From this starting point, this opportunity, uh, a new paradigm, perhaps a new approach, co-design among many partners, including First Nations people, and working together from day one when that starts in January. Not getting too fussed, if you like, about what's happened, except using the evidence to help us make good decisions. And also, as someone mentioned too, finding ways to work through areas of disagreement. And I think that's uh, really important. You might have mentioned that yourself, um, Simon, uh, Simon, yes, oh, okay. Rod, <laughs> going blank at this stage of the night today. Um, the you know working out how we are going to deal with those areas of disagreement, I think, is going to be critical to us. So, taking us right back to the start of the day, Mandy um, began with a, a, a sort of a note of hope, and she said, "This is a really positive opportunity." I think we need to keep that in mind after listening to what we've listened to today. That right at the very start, we had that that that, that hope that we started with. So, perhaps haste, hasten slowly, listen, and keep talking. And as Melissa said, uh, take time to think. So I think, look, it's it's been a fantastic day and uh, it's, it's obviously start of a discussion. We shouldn't panic about that. This is the beginning of what could be a really important time for Victoria. And I want to thank the organisers of today. There have been four hosts, the Royal Society of Victoria, the Alluvium Foundation, the Friends of the Earth, Melbourne and Victorian National Parks Association. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you, Mike, um, Fatley and your staff here for all the work you've done today, the speakers, the session uh, chairs, and you, the uh, thoughtful and respectful audience. Thank you. You do, you do have another day to, tomorrow. Unfortunately, I, I can't be. I've got to be somewhere else, but it'll be just as exciting. So look forward to <laughs> have a great day. Thank okay. you. See you tomorrow, everybody. And Zoom, we'll see you tomorrow also. You can finally get off the screens. Um, have a look at the um, – check your inboxes for details of the Zoom link for tomorrow, um, and, uh, and may, perhaps we can uh, see if a few of those empty seats might get filled with people who've registered for the Zoom. So – see if we can work something out. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you tomorrow.